What's up, YouTube? This is Dennis Panyuta for tutorials.eu. I have some amazing news for you. We're done with our Android Jetpack Masterclass, and this is part of the course, and you can learn Android Jetpack from me now. I'm super excited to teach it to you. And yeah, we've been working on this for a couple of months. People have been asking for this topic for quite a while, so I decided to create a course on it. And yeah, if you have some ideas for future courses, also let us know in the comments, of course. Don't forget to like this video because, well, we invested a lot of time to teach you something amazing and learn from it, please. If you don't leave a like, at least learn something. That's what this course is about. That's what this channel is about. And I'm super happy to teach you something useful for your programming career. And of course, hit that subscribe button as well as this notification bell if you don't want to miss out these amazing videos in the future. There is more about Android coming up in the future potentially a flutter course at one point in q3 this year or maybe q4 and of course other topics as well such as unity as well as different c sharp topics in general okay so let's get started with the video okay before we get started with the actual course content let's look at what we're going to achieve and what you are going to learn throughout the next seven hours so i was planning on making this a four hour course at least the part that I would upload on YouTube. So I was really planning on just uploading 25, 30% of the course, but then it just didn't feel right because an interesting part really comes only at, well, six, seven hours, an interesting part from a app development perspective. So finishing this particular app was really mainly interesting at this part where we're going to look at the room database as well as live data. Before that, you wouldn't see much in the application. Of course, we're going to build a lot of stuff under the hood and you're going to see some things and you're going to learn a lot along the way and understand a lot more about what's going on in the background and how things are connected and all of that. But that's why I, this course ended up being seven hours. Okay, so these are the first seven hours of my complete Android Jetpack Masterclass, which is a 16, 17 hour long course. And you can get that. You can follow the link in the description to get the full course. But first of all, let's look at what we're going to build in this part of the course. So in the seven hours that you get for free on YouTube and uh, what you're going to learn. So we're going to start in section three because section one is, well, the overview, which we do right now. And then the installation, which is going to be something that I expect that you have done already. So I'm expecting you to have Android Studio installed as well as have some experience using Android Kotlin, well, Kotlin programming language and building Android apps. So you should have some experience, at least three months of experience, or at least have worked through my Android Masterclass YouTube video that you can find on my channel as well. So we're going to start with the Jetpack overview. So what is Android Jetpack? What is Android X and uh, Kotlin X tensions, which is also something that we need to see and understand because we're going to use the, this plugin quite a bit. Then the navigation, as well as the life cycles of the activity and later on also our fragments. Then we're going to check out how we can pass data from one activity to another. We're going to use view binding throughout the application, which is very important for you to understand because that's the approach that is highly recommended ever since Android 4.1, and it is part of the Jetpack ecosystem. So Jetpack is basically an add-on to Kotlin or Android app development that was there before. It's a collection of a lot of libraries that were there before, but now were brought together into a clean package that you can use in order to write cleaner applications, write the best practices, and really make sure that they are going to work perfectly with different Android versions, working with older versions and newer versions and so forth. Okay, we're going to see how to create a splash screen, which is going to be this part right here. So once you add, add or well, open the app, you can see this part here. This is the splash screen, including a little animation where the text is animating down. We're going to check out how MVVM works, so what MVVM is, what it stands for, model view, view model, we're going to restructure our application to follow the MVVM pattern. Then we're going to see how the different layouts work, constraint layouts, relative layouts, linear layouts, frame layouts, all of the different types of layouts that we're going to require in most of our applications. Then we're going to design a couple of pages. We're going to look at permissions, how to use permissions in your application. And we're going to do that for the camera as well as the gallery. And then 
also, of course, to store data because we're going to store data on the device using the room database, which is part of section eight. We're going to look at Glide, which is a very useful tool. It's also a library, which is not part of the Jetpack suite of libraries, but it's still a third party library that I would recommend to use in every application where you have images. And you're going to see how to use that, how to then store images on your device and display them as well as we're going to look at the room database. So we're going to set up the whole room database architecture, which is quite a task, but it's really amazing. Once you have set it up, it's like magic how you can work with data in your application. We're going to set up DAO, then the repository entity, see how view models work with all of that and how everything is connected. Then we're going to insert data and store data on the device using the room database. And at the end of this video, you're going to be able to build this application. So we're going to build this part of the application. So as I said, this is just the first part of the complete course. And this is the end result that you are going to build in this YouTube video. So this is a list of dishes and we can add those dishes manually to our application by selecting an image. So you can see here, you can then select either from the camera or from the gallery. So you will see how to create this little pop-up where the user can select two options. And then in the background, the permissions will be checked if the user has permission or the application has the permission to use the camera from the phone as well as the library with the images. And then the user can select a photo, for example. This photo will then be populated here. You can add a title, a type, a category, ingredients, and so forth. This will also, by the way, be a little pop-up where you can then select an option, it will be then populated here. So here lunch, well, chicken or lamb, for example, I don't know if we have all of these options. This is something that you can adjust to your liking, this list. Add the ingredients that you want to have here, write a little list, as well as select the cooking time, directions to cook and then add the dish. Now you need to enter all the data in order for you to be able to add this dish and then it will end up here in your list, okay? and. This will be basically it. It's not, um, well, super hype at this point. Of course, the app is not done at that point, but along the way, you're going to learn so much. So you're going to really learn a lot about Jetpack and to become basically a better Android developer. So you can use these techniques for your own applications and in general, in your job as an Android developer, if you have a job as an Android developer or even to find a new job as an Android developer. So knowing Jetpack is really something that you should at this point, if you want to get a senior Android developer job. Okay, so we're going to build it up, a lot of presentations, demos, but also building this application. And I'm really excited to teach you all of that. And later on, I'm going to show you what this favorite is going to be about, what this random dish is all about. So first, let's get started with the course. Let's look at the first couple of lectures. And then I'm going to show you what the end result of the application will be if you get the full course. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching the course. I'm really hyped to teach you all of that. And let's get started. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction to Jetpack and an overview of what Jetpack even is. And you can see here, there is an extra website here on the developer.android.com slash Jetpack, which gives you a lot more details on what Jetpack really is about and what is new and the Jetpack libraries. And basically it's just a suite of libraries. So a combination of libraries and then allows the developers to be more efficient when developing Android applications. So basically it's a suite of libraries. It helps developers to follow best practices by reducing boilerplate code and by making sure that the application runs consistently across Android versions and devices so that we as developers can really focus on the code rather than really having to look into how things are done in a more complex way. So basically it really saves us a lot of time and makes sure that everyone is developing the same way more or less, right? So that it's also easier to work together because if everyone works the same way, it's a lot easier to read the code and understand it and also make updates to the code and so forth. And it also provides backward compatibility, which is pretty cool. So it also runs on older versions of Android. And you can just go ahead and build your code without thinking too much about 
how it's going to work across the different versions, so to speak. Really powerful tool, a lot of different libraries, and we're going to cover many of those, the most popular ones that are going to be important for your life as a developer throughout the course. So in order to use Jetpack components, you will need to go ahead and go to your build.gradle file, and in your project, you need to add under all projects repositories Google. Okay, so you need to make sure that you have that there and then you will be able to use Jetpack. And usually if you start a new project, it will be there by default, so you don't even have to add it there manually, but just make sure that it's there when you create a new project. And then in order to use specific components of that Jetpack library suite, you need to add a dependency or multiple dependencies, really depending on what kind of components you're gonna use. So if you want to use live data and view model, you need to enter the version as well as at the implementation, Android X lifecycle, lifecycle minus live data minus KTX and then the version in this particular case. And then the same goes to here for the view model. So you can see here, the only difference is this view model keyword, but I would really recommend to just check out what the explicit implementation code is that you will need for the component that you want to use throughout your application. So what are the advantages of Jetpack? Well, we saw in the overview that there are some advantages and they were already pretty powerful and strong advantages, but there are some more advantages that I wanted to talk about real quick. And one thing is it may be used alone or in combination to address different needs. So you can either use Jetpack or you can use the default Android implementations or even other libraries and it works flawlessly together. Then you have, for example, the work manager library, which allows you to take care of notifications or in general services that you want to run after a certain period of time or regularly. And the work manager is just going to help you to do it in a clean and safe manner. Then you have the room library, which allows you to work with your SQL light database in a very clean and efficient way. And this then of course allows you to build applications which store a lot of data and you can access it very easily without thinking too much about it. You can really just work with objects pretty much using the view models and basically an architecture that you need to set up first, but we're going to look into that throughout the course to build a room database in our application. Then navigation is an important part. So if you want to move from one activity, for example, to another, you need to take care of some things. And also when passing data from one screen to another, that is something that can be quite tedious work, but with the navigation component of Jetpack, it's becoming a lot easier. So you can move between different fragments as well as activities flawlessly, also passing data with safe arcs, so safe arguments. So very, very powerful tool, really helpful. I'm going to see how to do that as well. And then camera X, so using different camera features directly without having to develop too much yourself, camera X is going to really help you out there. And of course, there are a bunch more libraries. As you can see on the website, there are, I don't know exactly how many, but at least 50 different libraries that are part of Android Jetpack. And many of them are there even without Jetpack or have been part of the Android suite even without Jetpack. So you might have already seen how to use that before in the past, but now you're going to see how to use it in Jetpack and how it extends the functionality. And then the libraries are published in the namespace of Android X, as you have seen earlier when we looked at the dependencies that we implemented. So for example, the live data dependency that we added. And here is just a little overview of some of the different libraries that are part of the Android Jetpack suite. So you can see there is a whole bunch of architecture libraries as well as for UI, behavior and foundation. Okay, so architecture are things such as data binding or even view binding, which is the latest version of data binding that we're going to cover. Then life cycles, they've been there before, but it's part of the architecture of Jetpack, live data, which is also used when working with the room navigation, paging, and so forth. So you can see a lot going on here and we're going to cover roughly 80% of the keywords that you see here throughout the application so that you get a feeling for what they can do for you and how you can use them for your future applications when building any kind of app in the future.
All right, so that's it for this video. Now you have a little bit of an overview what is about to come. So I'd say let's dive into the different components step by step and see you in the next video. All right, so now you had a little bit of an introduction. Let's look at what you are going to learn if you get the full course, which you can get using the link in the description below, you will get a huge discount. So on top of what you're learning in this YouTube video, you're also going to learn about the navigation component, how to use fragments in depth, how to pass data using the navigation component from one fragment to another, how to use save arcs for that. So using the best practices approach that there is right now, then basically not just build code that works, but really build code that is maintainable, that is up to date, that is great and correct and really the best practices. So then you're going to see how to use the palette feature as well as the crude operations. So create, read, update, delete, because here we're just creating something in this YouTube video, but in the paid course, you will learn how to edit the data, how to share the data, how to um, yeah use APIs and how to read, update, delete. So all of that, you're going to learn the whole crude operations. And then you are going to use a retrofit and Rx Java and learn how to use that in order to use an API to get data. So let's look at the actual application that you're going to, to build. Okay, so this will be the fav dish application that you're going to build. So it is what you learned in this YouTube video, but on top of that, you're going to move on and build this part where you have the favorite screen so you can share data as favorited or not. Once you click on it, you will see the details of that meal. You can unfavorize it and then it will end up only in all dishes. So here you have all your dishes. Here you have your favorite dishes. You can click on one of those dishes and make it a favorite. You will learn how to use notifications. So you can see there is a notification popping up and you can see it here. And once you click on it, you will be moved to the random dish fragment. And here, this is basically data from an API call. So you're getting it from the internet. It's not something that you will need to set up yourself. So there is an API that we're going to use that has a lot of data and we're going to reduce that data to only the one that we need. And which is basically what type of meal it is, then the ingredients and as well as the direction to cook and of course the image itself and the title of the meal. So you can just drag down and then it will refresh and get you a new dish. Okay, and you are going to see how to implement all of that in a clean and more best practice way. So then once you click on this icon here, it will be added to your all dishes and to your favorites as well. Okay, so now it will be there. You can find it here and you can see here we're using Palette, which is a feature of Android Jetpack, which allows you to take the main color of that image and use it, for example, as a background for your UI. Okay, and then you will also see how to edit such a meal. So here there are these three dots. Once you click on them, this little pop-up appears, this menu where you can an edit a dish and you will get to the details screen where you can then make changes. For example, change the image if you wanted to. So you see we're going to need permissions here as well. Using the dinner here, for example, of course, it's not going to be the same meal. And then you can update that. Okay, I'm not gonna update it for now. You will also see how to use filters. So here, for example, now I have no lunch, uh, lunch meals in the list here. I think it's mainly desserts. Let's see. Yeah, all of them are desserts. So now I filtered for desserts and, and these are my items. Let me change that real quick. So for this one here, let me change this to be a snack, just as an example. So this will be snacks. Let me update the dish. And now let me filter for snacks and you'll see only this dish will appear as well as let me update for dessert and you see all the other three will appear. And of course, if we select all, then all of them will appear. Okay, so this is what you're going to build. Basically this application being able to use the crude operations, download data, use the work manager to run tasks in the background using best practices way, Work manager is quite a complex topic, but it's really powerful and strong. So you can really use it for, uh, well, basically adding a lot of constraints. So for example, only run this code if the user is charging only, or only run this code if the battery is not empty or if he has an internet connection or whatever. Okay, so really cool stuff. And we're going to look into notifications, as I said, in depth.
So really good stuff. I am very happy with the result that we have here. A really good course, great application that will teach you everything else that you need to know about Jetpack. And yeah, of course you are also going to get a lot of other benefits. So first of all, you're gonna get a certificate of completion once you're done with the course, which you can then, for example, upload to your LinkedIn account and use that as proof that you have learned Android Jetpack. Then you are going to have access to the Q&A section in which you can ask questions and you will be helped. So there is support coming from our side, as well as you are going to have a tracked system, which basically means that once you come back to the course, it will always know where you end, well, where you stopped learning before, so you don't have to scroll through the YouTube video and find the right spot. So if you at all consider getting the course, I would recommend to get the course straight away and not even bother watching the complete YouTube video and get the course and just follow along in the course. You will also get access to all of the code. You can download every single lecture's code because for every lecture we have the code separately available with individual step-by-step -step instructions. So you can really follow along. This is the final one. Let me see. So here we have individual steps. So you can just go to the to-do and then really just follow along. Okay, rename this, then change this code, add this code and so forth. Really simple instructions, also explaining what's going on with the code and all of that. So if you want to follow along in the code specifically, amazing to get the course as well. And it's really highly discounted. So check out the link in the description. Okay, so this is enough of a sales pitch. Um, this was really just for you to get an idea of what you're going to get. And I'm really hope, I really hope that you like this YouTube video. You don't have to buy the course. I'm very happy if you watch the YouTube video and I'm grateful for that as well. And please do so if you don't want to buy the course and don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss out because we're going to upload more amazing YouTube videos for Android as well as other programming languages. So Android Kotlin development, then at one point, hopefully also a Flutter course and so forth. A lot of good stuff, okay? So now let's get back to the content of the course. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to talk a little bit about Android X because, well, basically we're going to use Android X even though we're using Jetpack, but Jetpack is part of Android X. So let's look into it a little bit. So what is Android X? Well, it's artifacts within the Android X namespace comprise the Android Jetpack libraries. So basically there is a bigger update of Android X that came out and Jetpack is just one part of Android X. So basically it's just a huge namespace. And Android X is a major improvement to the original Android support library, which is no longer maintained. Android X packages fully replace the support library by providing future parity and new libraries. What's also important is that Android X provides backward compatibility across Android releases. So you can develop in Android X, but still run this application on older Android devices. And then all packages in Android X live in a consistent namespace, starting with the string Android X. So it will be something like Android X dot, and then whatever part of the namespace that you want to use. The older Android support library packages have been mapped to corresponding Android X packages. So in the past, support library was the library that you would have to use in order to make sure that your application is gonna run on older devices, but now everything is mapped into the corresponding Android X packages. Unlike the support library, Android X packages are separately maintained and updated. And version 28.0.0 is the last release of the support library. So even at the point of the recording, it's at least two years old, I think even almost three years old. And there will be no more Android support library releases in the future. So it really makes sense to look more into Android X and fully understand how that works. And your feature development will be in the Android X namespace only and not in the support library anymore. So if you want to use Android X, you just need to make sure that your compile SDK is set to at least Android 9, which means API level 28 or higher. Set both of the following Android Gradle plugin flags true in your Gradle properties file, 
One is Android use Android X and the other one is Android enable Jetifier. So what is Android use Android X? Well, when it's true, the Android plugin uses the appropriate Android X library instead of a support library. And the flag is set to false by default if it's not specified. And Android enable Jetifier, when that is true, then the Android plugin automatically migrates existing third-party libraries to use Android X dependencies by rewriting their binaries. The flag is false by default if it's not specified. Okay, so that is a quick overview of Android X. Of course, we're going to really cover Android Jetpack in depth, which is just a small part of Android X. But mainly, this is really not something that you need to actively think of. You just need to go ahead and develop your application. And while you're doing that, just use the latest and greatest features. So make sure that you use Android X libraries instead of support libraries. But the thing is, even if you would use any support library features, the IDE, so Android Studio would probably inform you that the code that you're using is outdated and it will either offer you a solution, so an alternative, or it will just tell you that the code is deprecated. So you should please use some newer code. So whenever you're building with the target API of the latest features, then the, you will be good to go. Okay, so that's it for Android X for a little overview. See you in the next video. Throughout the course, we are going to use Android KTX. And in order to understand what it is, let's have a look at what it stands for. So Android KTX stands for Android Kotlin Extensions. And it is a set of Kotlin extensions that are included with Android Jetpack and other Android libraries. It is concise, idiomatic, Kotlin to Jetpack, Android platform, and other APIs. And the features that are included are extension functions, extension properties, Lambda, so if you want to use Lambda expressions, that is part of Android KTX, named parameters, parameter default values, coroutines, and that is basically going to be the most important part, so to speak. So the coroutines are something that we're going to use throughout the course and Lambdas as well. So basically it's really just an extension for Kotlin, meaning Kotlin as a programming language has some extra features using KTX. And that's what we are going to require throughout the application. So in order to use Android KTX in your application, you need to make sure that you have the dependency in your build.cradle. So inside of repositories, make sure that you have Google in there, which you should have by default if you create a project using Android Studio. And working with shared preferences, you can write to the disks asynchronously, for example, using shared preferences.edit with put boolean with a key value pair and apply it. Using Android KTX, however, you commit a new value asynchronously. So you just use shared preferences, edit and put boolean with a key and value. And if you want to commit a value synchronously, then you would use shared preferences.edit commit to true and put the boolean and string or whatever values you want to put in there inside of the curly brackets. So this is just one small example of what Android KTX can do for you. We're going to see a bunch more throughout the application and it wouldn't really make sense to go too much into the different aspects of KTX. I think it really makes more sense to see how it is done in practice to really understand how things are rolling and how everything is connected. So see you in the next video. All right, so now we're going to set up this activity. As you can see here, this is a bottom navigation activity. And this is something that you can get by default, basically. And in this video, we are really just going to change the color theme a little bit. We're going to look at material.io, which is a page which will really help us to select the right color theme. And then as you can see, we have three different fragments here. And we're going to change them throughout the course, of course, because we don't need home dashboard and notifications as our fragments, but we're going to require different ones. Okay, so let's get started by creating a new project. And the one that I want is this bottom navigation activity here. Okay, so let's call this fav dish, or however you want to call it. In my case, it's going to be fav dish. So the package name is something you can define for yourself. And then the language name will be Kotlin and the minimum SDK 
will be Android 5.0 using API 21. So Android Lollipop, so that it runs on different devices, in this case, 94.1% of devices, because we're going to use new features, but the cool thing is with App Compat, so the app compatibility functionality, this will still run flawlessly on all the devices. That's something that Android really takes care of very well. Okay, so now let's go ahead and press finish. Once the project is fully loaded, you will notice that your application is already prepared and you will see that in the layout folder, there are four files. So usually you might be familiar with the activity main XML file, but not having used fragments before, you wouldn't have seen that before. So as you can see, we have three different fragments and each of the fragments is basically one of those navigation options, okay? So a fragment is basically its own screen and here we can define our own UI. And that is something that you can define in each of those XML files. So here in the fragment dashboard, you can either drag and drop elements directly from the palette here to change the UI, or you can directly go into the code and you will see that there is a text view in fact, and these are the details of that text view. And the same goes for the fragment home. So here we also have a text view and the fragment notification. So it's really just this saying, this is home fragment, this is dashboard fragment, and this is notifications fragment. Okay, now what I want to also look at is that we have this menu folder here. You can see we have a bottom nav menu XML, which if you look at it in the designer here, is just this selection option here. So this menu that you have here at the top right corner. So that is something that you can also, of course, implement, and that is generally how menus are handled, at least internally, but our menu doesn't really look like that, right? It is a bottom navigation menu, so to speak, where we have those three options at the bottom of our screen. So it's those three here. You see home, dashboard, as well as notifications. Okay, so that's our menu. And you can see it basically is an XML file, which uses XML version one encoding UTF-8. And then it uses a specific namespace. Well, it's the default Android namespace. And inside of this menu tag, we have three items. And the only thing that those three items need is an ID, an icon, as well as a title. There are other properties that you can define as well, but for now, these are all that we are going to have. So you can see it's going to use this drawable icon home black. This is this one here, 24 density pixels. So it's this little home icon that you see in your application. So if you check it out, it's this little icon. So if you wanted to change that, you could change that anytime to any of the existing icons that you have, or you could create your own icon or use an own image. So if you would want to change that, you can do that directly here. And then you have the title. In this case, it's string title home. So that means that this title home is inside of your strings XML file. So if you go over here to values, you will find the strings XML file. And here you can define your strings. This is best practices because you want to be able to have everything in one place and also be able to change it depending on language, for example, or whatever else. So if you have everything in one place, it's a lot easier to maintain it. Okay, so here the text for home or this title home will in fact be home. So this is a string that you are defining in your resources strings XML. Now that's the case for all of those items. So we have item one, item two, and item three, and we give this item an ID. Now, if you look at it, you also have a MipMap folder, which is this IC launcher, which basically is the launcher image that we have. So that's created for us by default and uses this default image for the different screen sizes. So you see that there are six different files, even though it's all the same. And this is the default one, but then there's also the rounded version one. So here you see the IC launcher for the rounded icon. And these are the different files for the different DPIs, so different screen sizes, so to speak, and screen resolutions, basically. But then you also have a navigation folder in which we have the mobile navigation, which was also generated for us by default. You can see there's a lot going on. There's not even the proper visibility for the three vis navigations. So let me get rid of hosts as well as the component tree. So here we can see our three navigations 
that we have. So we have navigation home, navigation dashboard, as well as navigation notifications. And you can see there's no connection between them, okay? So you could create a connection so that it moves from one screen to another, but I'm going to get rid of that again. We're going to look into that in more detail later on in the course, so where you will see how you can use this navigation in order to move from one screen to another. But in our case, it's really not that necessary because, well, everything is handled by our bottom navigation for us where we are just moving between the different dashboards. This will only be relevant once we have other activities where we want to handle our, for example, profile details or whatever, okay? And then if you look at the code, you can see that it's inside of a navigation tag, which contains a lot of namespaces here, as well as an ID so that it's findable. And then it has fragments. In our case, three fragments. So one for the navigation home, then one for the dashboard and one for notification. Then it has a label and a little layout. And the layout, in fact, is this XML file that we have here, as well as this one and that one. So these are the three different labels that we have in our mobile navigation XML. Okay, and then we have the dimensions values. So here, you can see here we can define the different dimensions. So this helps us to make sure that our application always looks the same in the sense of moving from one screen to another. The screen shouldn't have suddenly super different margins so where, for example, you have a lot bigger buttons or the text is suddenly three times as large or something like that. And that's something that you can avoid by using resources. Then we have the themes folder, and this is something that has been added in version 4.1, I believe, in Android Studio, and that allows us to have two different themes, one being the theme for the day version and then the night version. So if you have the dark mode, for example, you will have a different theme and you can define different colors here. Now, the thing is, these themes, as you can see here, they take colors from our add color. So what is add color? Well, add color is this colors file. So if you click on that, it jumps over to this colors file. And that's where the add color is. So this is the color with the name purple 500. So here you can jump to the different colors and you can change them as you like. Okay, so here's the purple. There are different versions of purple. So purple 200, which is this one here purple 500, which is a little darker, and purple 700, which is super dark, so to speak. Okay, same goes for teal. Well, black and white, there are only two blacks and whites here, or one black and one white. <laughs> okay, and that's what we're going to change now. Okay, so basically this the idea behind this video was really to make sure that you have an understanding of all of the files that are resources folder, so that you have a full understanding of what's going on. So let's quickly change something here. And the thing that I want to change is basically, I just want to add colors here. Okay, and I'm going to use these colors and let me just put them into the colors.xml file. So I'm going to use a primary color, primary dark color, and primary light color, as well as secondary colors, secondary dark, and light color. Okay, and these are the hexadecimal values. So where do I have those from? Well. This is something that you can, of course, try to define by yourself, but then there is this very handy tool that you can use in order to achieve that as well. And that is material.io. Okay, so you can just go over to material.io and this is the page. You can just watch your video to understand better how it works. And it really just helps you to use colors that work together very well. Okay, because you don't want to have a very weird red with a very weird yellow or something like that, which wouldn't look good. So it's really useful for you to use a design that will actually help and where colors fit together. So here you can go through the different tutorials to get a better understanding of material components as well as how to get started. So here you can check out the documentation. It will explain what you need to add to your project. These implementations are usually done by default. So the thing that we want to have is actually just the colors. So the color composition, so to speak. And in order to get that, you go over to resources and here you can either get popular icons if you ever need that, or you can just go down to the tools and select the color tool here. Okay, so that's the tool that I want to use. 
and for some reason it didn't load correctly there. And on the color tool page, you can go ahead and create your color. So you can just pick a color from the template or a custom color to see how it looks in your UI. Okay, so then just select the color that you want to use. So let's say I want to use this color here, this blue color, which is Indigo basically, Indigo 400 as it seems. And then it creates the primary color for me, which is the one that I selected. Then the light version as well as the dark version. So these three colors, they work together now. And now I can basically export them for me. And that's super cool. And before I export them, you can also see how this color will look like in your application. So you can just click through and see how it will look like for text and different selection screens and so forth. Okay, and you can then click export here for Android, for example, and this will then export this colors XML file for you. Okay, now we can check out this file and you can see it just created those colors for us. Okay, so if we go over to our project, you could then put those colors in here. Okay, so these are the teal colors and the dark colors and so forth. Okay, but I'm going to get rid of those because I have already created those for me. So here, primary color will be this green, primary dark color will be this darker green and so forth. So you can just use my colors if you like, or you can use any other color if you prefer. So in my particular case, we are using green 300. So it's this column here. So it's this one. You can see these are the colors that we're using. So if you compare it, it's 500, 19, 6, 5, 7. It's this dark color here. And then green 700, which should be this one here, I guess. No, it's actually one column further. It's this green for the darker version. Changing that, however, will not be sufficient to change the design of our application entirely. Okay, so the thing is, if I run my application now, all of my new colors that I've added will not have any effect. And that is due to the themes. So here, themes XML, that's where we need to make the changes because we never used the new colors that we just created. You can see we're still using the old colors. And if you run the application, you will see that these are in fact the colors that are used here. So it's this purple and teal and so forth that is used. So if you want to change that, of course you need to change this part right here. So here, instead of using the themes that we had before, well, we need to now use this for color primary. I call this, in fact, primary color. And then for the primary variant, I call this primary dark color. Then let me actually get rid of this project window here. Color on primary will stay white. And then for the secondary color, we created an extra entry called secondary color. Secondary variant will be secondary dark color. And yeah, that should be pretty much it. It stays black for that one. And the status bar color, well, it should be also the color primary variant. Okay, so these are the changes that I made for my themes. And in this case, specifically for the day theme. But now let's also change that in the night theme. Okay, so here it says night in brackets. So here, I'm also going to change that real quick. And it's going to be primary light color for the color primary. And here I'm actually going to use primary color for the primary variant. Black stays the same. And here I'm going to use secondary light color. So the thing is, even though we're really taking care of colors here a lot, I'm just setting this up and explaining it to you as well as I can, let's say, because I'm not a color specialist. That's why I'm using tools such as material.io. And I would really recommend to check out the documentation here to really get a better understanding of what these colors are all about. What's the idea behind this to learn a little more about design. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. This will be a good resource for you. But I'm not going to dive too much into that because this is a developer course. We're going to go ahead and develop a little more. See you in the next video where we're going to take care of the splash activity. In this video, I would like to introduce view binding to you and give you an idea of what view binding is and why you should use it. So view binding is a feature that allows you to more easily write code that interacts with views. 
So once view binding is enabled in your application, so in your module, it generates a binding class for each XML layout file present in that module. And instance of a binding class contains direct references to all views that have an ID in the corresponding layout. So this means that you can then access your binding object and then directly access the view that you want to work with. And there are some really good advantages of using view binding instead of find view by ID and so forth, which it basically also replaces. So find view by ID is something that you can use, but for example, if you have the same ID in different XML files, which can very easily happen if you are working in a bigger project, then you can run into issues. Okay, and we're going to see how we can enable view binding first. So set the view binding build option to true in the module level build Gradle file. So inside of Android build features, set this property view binding to true and then sync your files. And this will then create the relevant files for you automatically. So now let's assume we have this XML file here. So if view binding is enabled for a module, a binding class is generated for each XML layout file that the module contains. So this means that this is, for example, such a layout file, and let's say it's called result underscore profile XML, and the generated binding class is then going to be called result profile binding. And we can just implement that in our code and use it throughout the application. Now, there might be the case where you want to ignore this view binding feature. So you can go ahead and add the following code, tools view binding ignore to your XML file, to your linear layout, top view group, so to speak. And this will then deactivate view binding for that XML file. The view binding class will not be created and you will not be using view binding for that particular linear layout and maybe still use find view or by ID. So what is the difference here to find view by ID, which is the default approach and has worked basically since Android's release in 2009, I believe. And well, null safety is one of the major points here since view binding creates direct references to views. There is no risk of a null pointer exception due to an invalid view ID. Additionally, when a view is only present in some configurations of a layout, the field containing its reference in the binding class is then also marked with add nullable. Then another important point is type safety. The fields in each binding class have types matching the views they reference in the XML file. This means there's no risk of a class cast exception. So for example, in find view by ID, you would have to define what kind of item it is that you are trying to access. So if you wanted to access a text view, you had to specifically state that this ID is going to be a text view. And in view binding, that's not necessary anymore. So these differences mean that incompatibilities between your layout and your code will result in your build failing at compile time rather than at runtime which basically means that you can directly see it in your editor. You don't need to run the application to then run in an error, which you then need to debug. The IDE, so your Android Studio, is doing all of that for you, which is why using view binding is such a great idea. So let's compare it with data binding. And therefore, you need to have a quick understanding of what data binding is. Well, data binding allows you to bind your data directly in the XML file, and it's a practice that is used in many other different programming languages. And it has been used in Android or was one of the, let's say, preferred ways to be used in Android Jetpack in the past. But then they came up with this concept of view binding and abandoned data binding. So basically, view binding in comparison to data binding is that both create binding classes that you can use to reference views directly. However, view binding is intended to handle simpler use case and provides the following benefits over data binding. Number one is that view binding has faster compilation. So your view binding requires no annotation processing, so the compile times are faster. And it's a lot easier to use. So view binding does not require specially tagged XML layout files, so it's faster to adopt in your apps 
And once you enable view binding in a module, it applies to all of the modules layout automatically. Now, what are the limitations compared to using data binding? View binding does not support layout variables or layout expressions. So it can't be used to declare dynamic UI content straight from the XML layout. And view binding doesn't support two-way data binding. And because of these considerations, it's best in some cases to use both view binding and data binding in a project. You can use data binding in layouts that require advanced features and use view binding in layouts that do not. We are going to focus only on view binding in our project, even though in some cases for simplicity reasons, I'm just going to use find view by ID. So if I'm using a demo, for example, I'm not going to go through the hustle of setting up view binding every single time because I believe you understand how view binding works at that point when this comes into play. So using find view by ID is going to be an easier or quicker option for demonstration purposes. But when you are working in a bigger project, I would really recommend to use view binding instead. All right, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. All right, so in this video, we are going to take care of the splash screen. And this is a small little screen that really adds a, a little flavor to your application. It is just a little better than just opening the app and it's straight away at the action. So it really is something that you see in many apps. So let me rerun this application real quick so you can see how this is going to look like on the device. So there we are, it's a white screen and then this pops up. Well, in this case, it popped up straight away in a very abrupt manner, but that's due to my emulator as it seems because usually it should be a little more of a transition and it will look a little nicer. Okay, so if you test it on your device, it will look a little better than what we have here, but that's basically our application here. You can see it says fav dish and this is the splash screen and then later on we will move over from the splash screen directly to our navigation layout okay or our navigation activity so to speak or the main activity that we have okay so let's close all of those resources we looked at them in depth in the last video now as you can see we have the main activity as well as the ui with dashboard home notification and the main activity well we are going to require a new activity so let's go ahead and do that directly in here. So create new activity. And this one will be an empty activity. I'm going to call this one splash activity. It will generate a file for me automatically as well. And there we are. So now we have the splash activity and now we can design it. So let's go over to activity splash XML. You can of course also go to your resources and open the layout from there. Okay, but an easier way will be to hold control and click on this and then it will send you over to the splash XML file straight away. And I'm just going to drag in a text here in the middle and I'm going to add constraints towards all directions here. So let me click on that text view and drag those constraints towards all directions and this will center the text view. Okay, now we can go ahead and make some changes to it. So I want this to have a different name. I'm going to call this one TV underscore app name. So text you underscore app name. It should wrap the context. The text should say something like favorite dish. Therefore, we can go ahead and create a new string. So let's go over to our values here. And inside of strings, I'm going to create a new one. And I'm going to call this one splash screen title. And I'm just going to call this fav dish. Okay. So you can call it however you want. I'm just going to add this new string here, maybe at the bottom. Okay. And now we can use it here. So here add string slash and we call it splash screen title. That's how we can now use this text. Okay. The color something that I want to add as well. So here color, and there is this text color property, and I'm going to use our white color. So do we have that here? Let me see white, just going to use the default white color here. Text size is something that I want to change a little bit. So let's use 50 SP. 
as well as the font family. I'm going to change that to be cursive. So there we are. Okay, and now let's look at this. Let's get rid of the palette and the project here. So we cannot see it because it's white on white. So we will have to change the background color of our layout here. So our constraint layout. And therefore I'm going to add a background color here and I'm going to use the primary dark color. This one here. And let's look at the designer once again. You can see that this is what we're getting. Of course, you can make this significantly nicer if you are a good designer or if you hire a designer to give you a proper splash screen, but that's what we're going to work with for this particular case. All right, now the next thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that we are using view binding. Okay, so you can go over to your Gradle scripts here and open the app one, so build.gradle, the one where it says app at the end here and we're going to activate the build features that will be binding, okay? So view binding, that's the name of it. So here, just underneath Kotlin options, I'm going to add this, build features, and it will be view binding set to true. Okay, so now this will allow us to use view binding, and now after I've added that, I need to sync it. Once it's synced, view binding will be activated for our application. So if you want to know more about view binding, definitely check out the view binding video in this course. Okay, so here we can now go over to our splash activity and work with it. Okay, so basically the first thing that I want to use is I want to set up the view binding for our activity here. So I'm going to call this val splash binding. You can see there it already is. It already offers me this name straight away and it will be our activity splash binding. So you see once the binding has been added to your build.cradle, you have a binding class that has the same name as your activity. So in our case, it's splash activity. So it just takes the activity at the beginning and then it says splash, which is the second part of this class, but it's the first part of our activity. Okay, so this will then use this activity splash binding to inflate the layout inflator. Okay, so we're passing the layout inflator and this will then inflate our application. And now once we have this splash binding, we can use it as the content view setting. So instead of using r.layout, we're going to use the splash binding.root. And now this will also allow us to access any property that we have inside of that view. Okay, in our case, we have this TV app name and you can now go ahead and set its text, for example, to be something like hello world, just to test it, if it actually works. Okay, so if you want to test it, go ahead, but we're not going to require it as it is right now. And before we can actually test that, we will of course need to make sure that this splash activity is the one that will be loaded for us. So we have to go to the Android manifest. And by the way, a different way to get to the Android manifest is to use shift twice and then just enter Android manifest or ender will already give you the Android manifest file. And here you can then directly make the changes. So you can see that our intent filter is set for our main activity. But I want this to be in fact the intent filter for my splash activity. So I'm going to change that up real quick. So exchange it there basically. And now our splash activity will be the one firing up once the application gets started. Okay, so we set the intent action main and the category launch to be the launcher for that particular intent. And now we can go ahead and test it and you can see it says a hello world. So whatever text we had there, we overwrote it with our splash code or splash activity code. So let's go ahead and change that because I don't want this to be the case. It was just for testing purposes to see if view binding is in fact active and working correctly. But now you will see that it is in fact working and Favdish is there. So this is the splash activity. You can see the thing that you need to set up for it is basically a new activity and then making sure that 
Android Manifest is aware of it and the rest was just designing. And now of course we want to move over from this activity back to our navigation activity, so to speak, or our main activity after let's say a second or two. So that's something that we're going to do in the next few videos. So see you later. Quick pause. This video is sponsored by our Jetpack Masterclass course, which we've been working on for a couple of months. And this video is basically just part of that course. And if you want to learn everything about Jetpack that is relevant for your future applications, definitely check out the link in the description below. We have created a great course, which teaches you to basically use all of the relevant Jetpack components, as well as build a real life application, which you can see here. So in the background, you can see the components. We're going to implement most of them in our application here. So you're going to learn how to build those, but we also have separate demos, which teach you the components separately as well. So definitely check out the course and of course you will build this little dishes application where you can store your favorite dishes using the room database. You can delete those dishes or edit them. You can create your own dishes with your own images or the gallery. If you have any dishes there, and then store it using the room database. And at the same time, use an API to get data from the internet. So here you can load a random dish, which you then can add to your favorite list. And then basically you see it in all your dishes and as well as in your favorite dishes. Thanks for watching the video. Check out the link in the description for the full course. And let's get back to the course. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take care of this little part of the application. As you can see a little animation, the text animates in and then we move over to the other activity. This looks a little nicer than just having the splash activity there and nothing happening. So adding this little animation will improve your overall look and feel of the application. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure that first of all, our splash activity is full screen because in our case, it isn't. And in order to do so, there is one way of doing it that is going to work amazingly well with newer versions. And that is this part right here. So let me add that in here. Actually, we can get rid of these empty lines. So we check if the SDK version, so SDK in stands for the SDK version. In our case, you see we are using API 30 for this particular application. And here it checks with the version codes and code for R is in fact 30. Okay, so if it is version code 30 or higher, so it is Android R, or higher, then it will use this line of code. It will just hide window insets type status bar. So it's going to hide the status bar. But then if you're running it on an older device, unfortunately, I don't have a better code than to use this code here, which suppresses the deprecation because this is in fact is deprecated code, but this is also really just used for all the versions. So this is just to make sure that this is going to work the same way for all the versions of Android. Okay, so here we're using window, set flags, layout params, where we make sure that the two flags that we can set for the windows are full screen. Okay, so if you do that, and you rerun your application, you will see that the splash activity will in fact be full screen, even though we still have this bar here at the top. Okay, we will need to get rid of that bar as well. But overall, that's the code that you need in order to get rid of this notification bar at the top. So this is something that you should usually not do, but in an activity such as the splash activity, which is really just visible for a very short period of time, that will be fine. Now, how do we actually get rid of this bar at the top? Well, therefore, we can go to our themes. Okay, so open up the themes XML file, and I'm just going to do that for the day version. And here we see that we are inside of a style tag, but we can use a different style tag as well. So this is the style tag for our dark action bar theme, which is the default. But now I would like to have another style here as well. So I'm going to create a new style and I'm going to give it the name theme fav dish dot no action bar, because that's what this style is all about. And I'm going to have an item with the name window action bar. And I'm going to set that to false. Okay, so this one will be false. And this should be window action bar. We're not talking about windows here. And then I need another one. So another item called window no title. So when 
do no tile that one and i'm going to set that to true okay now the next thing that we need to make sure is that in the splash activity android manifest file so here android manifest that the style is in fact set correctly because here you see there is no style defined it's by default just using the default style but if you want to make sure that you are actually defining this theme yourself you can use your own theme and i'm going to use style slash theme dot fab dish that's how i called it and then no action bar okay so that's the name of the style that we just created and i want to use that style only for my splash activity Now, if we rerun the application, we will see that it will be, in fact, gone. Okay, so the splash activity will not have this navigation bar anymore. There we are. It's taking up the whole screen. Now, I'd like to have a little animation where this fav-dish text comes up from the top towards the center. And in order to get there, I'm going to go over to my splash activity. And here, I'm going to use view binding again. So first of all, I'm going to set up the splash animation, which will use animation utils. So there is this class, animation utils, which you can use to load animations. And there you need to pass in the context and the ID, as you can see here. Okay, so the ID is going to be an animation that we need to set up ourselves. And therefore, I'm going to right-click resources and create a new directory, which I'm going to call anim. Okay, so inside of this anim folder, we can now go ahead and create a new file. Okay, so an animation resource file. You can see that because this folder is called anim, this is going to be an animation resource file. If I do the same on the resource folder, for example, you see it's creating an Android resource file. But as I want to actually create an animation, I right-click on anim, and then create an animation resource file. Now you can give this resource file a name and I'm just going to call this one anim splash because it will be an animation which will take care of the splash activity. And there we can just go ahead and say, okay. And now we can take care of setting up this animation file a little bit. So splash activity now is in fact not very happy because I'm not defining anything here. So I'm just going to make sure that I add this splash anim or anim splash that I just created here. So r.anim dot anim splash. Okay, now it will be a little happier, our Android Studio. And now we can go ahead and define whatever we need to define in here. So what I need is to translate something. So we're not talking about translating from one language to another, but we're translating a value from where it was to where it's going to be. Okay, so what you need to add here is this translate property. You can see there are a couple here, alpha, rotate, scale, set, translate. Okay, so these are the different things that you can set up here if you want to rotate, for example, your text or your whole screen or whatever UI element you have, you could use rotate. But we're using translate, which basically means move something. Okay, so we're moving something. And what are we gonna move here? Well, we're going to, first of all, have a duration. So here, Android duration, which will be, let's say 2000 milliseconds. So this 2000 stands for 2000 milliseconds, which in fact is two seconds. And then from X Delta, so we start at the X value of 0% P, and Y delta, so from Y delta, also 0% P. So it starts at the top left corner. And then we're using something called interpolator. So Android colon interpolator, which will use Android colon anim. And you can see that there are different animations that you can use here. So fade in, so if you want to fade it something in or fade it out, you can use those animations. But the one that I want to use is accelerate and decelerate interpolation or interpolator, that's the name here. Okay, so that's going to be the interpolator. And then I need to say to which position I want to polate it. 0% P 
and then I want to set it to the center of the screen on the Y coordinate. So here I'm going to say 50% P. So what this will do is it will start at 0, 0 at the top left and it will move it to 0, 50%. You see we are using the 0 position for our X delta in both cases. So what this will now do is it will move from 0, 0 to 0, 50%, whatever the middle or the center of the screen is going to be. And now this interpolator is going to accelerate and decelerate. So it's first going to increase the speed at the beginning. So it's going to start slowly, going to become faster, and then it's going to become slower again. So it's not going to constantly have the same speed in which it's moving to that position. It will be fast for, well, become fast first, then at the, at the middle of it, so at 25% P, for example, it would be at the top speed, and then it will become slower again towards the end. So that's one way of running this animation. You can change the interpolator however you want. Okay, so now if we run this, let's see if this is actually going to do anything. Actually, it's not going to do anything, so we shouldn't run it because we need to add one more line here because our splash animation isn't being used yet. Okay, so in order to actually use it, let's add a new line here where we activate the splash binding which is the binding that we have up here that we set up for activity splash dot tv app name dot animation. So you see that a text view has an animation property and now we're going to overwrite this property with our splash animation. All right, and now we can go ahead and actually run it. So let's see if the application is going to actually do the animation, run it again. So it was a little too quick here. You see, it starts at the center and then it goes down. So why is that? Well, that is because our activity splash text here has a constraint to the bottom. So let's get rid of that one here. So this line here, bottom to bottom off. And let's rerun the application. And then you should see how it only goes towards the center. So it starts at the top and then it goes towards the center. But it doesn't stay there as you see as well. We didn't set up the animation to have a start and end activity to execute. So that's something that we can do here as well. Okay, so for example, we can add an animation listener to our splash animation. So here, set animation listener. So that one here. Now this animation listener needs in fact an animation listener here. So here we can create a new object, which will be an animation listener object. So new object being animation listener. Okay, and now this will need to be implemented. So let's add those curly brackets and hover over it. And you can see now it says implement members here. Okay, let's implement all those three members on start, on end, and on repeat. We don't need to implement all of them. I just want to add those so you can see them. So you see here, we have the animation start. So this is where you could run code that will be executed once the animation starts. Then you have on animation end. That's where you can run code that will be executed once the animation is finished. And then this is if you repeat the animation, that's where you can add your code if you wanted to do, repeat the animation and in any case. And we actually need to implement all those three because they're all necessary. So if I get rid of those or one of them, you can see that the object is unhappy. So you need to make sure that you have it in there. So what is it that I want to implement here? And I don't want to implement anything on start. So let me get rid of that. But what I want to implement is something at the end. So once the animation is over, I want to move over to the other activity. In order to achieve that, I can use the handler. Okay, I'm going to show you the code for this. So the handler class offers an option where we can handle things with a delay. Okay, so I can go ahead and execute some code, which will be this part here, after a certain delay. Okay, so after a delay of 1000 milliseconds, and after the animation has ended, I want to execute this code here. Okay, so we can use a looper, and that looper has then a method called getMainLooper, which is what we need to pass to the handler. 
And then the handler has this option for us to use this post delete method. Okay, there are other methods that this handler has to offer as well, but the one that we're going to use here is the post delete method. So what that will allow us to do is to execute a code after a delay, and in this case, 1000 milliseconds, which is one second. So after one second, I'm going to start an activity with an intent, which will basically move over to my main activity. So the intent is go to go to the main activity and it will start it directly. And then I will finish the current activity as well. Okay, so if we now execute the code, the animation will run and then it will move us over to this other activity within one second. Okay, so let's see. So there we were. Okay, the animation ran through already. Let me be a little quicker with this one. So there we are, the animation goes through. Animation is done, one second later, it jumps over. So now I'm not so happy about the end position to be back at the top. So it finishes the animation, but then the text jumps over to the top. How can we fix that? Well, in order to make sure that this doesn't happen is, we need to add a line here, which will be fill after. Okay, and here I can set that to true. So let's look at fill after. So when set to true, the animation transformation is applied after the animation is over, the default value is false. So if fill enable is not set to true, then the animation is not set on a view, fill after is assumed to be true. So basically what we do here is by setting that value, by adding this value here, we are making sure that in fact the state that the animation leaves us at the end is the one that will be maintained. Okay, so let's rerun that to see if that is actually happening. So we have the animation, the text comes from the top to the center, it stays there, and then it moves over. Okay, so that's how you can achieve this behavior. Now there's one more little animation that I would like to show you here, and that is the alpha animation. And in general, if you want to know more about that, definitely check out some specific guidelines on, on how to use these animations. So the alpha that I want to set here is going to also have a duration. So over the course of two seconds, I want to run this animation, which will go from alpha 0 0.0 to alpha 0 1.0. So it's going to go from invisible to very visible. So this makes the text invisible and then visible. And here I will also need an interpolator so how do I want to achieve this? And I'm going to use the same here. Okay, so let's rerun this and see how the text will come from being barely visible to more and more visible. There we are. Okay, and that's it for this video. Now you see how you can create this little animation and also move from one screen to another. All right, so at this point, our application is far from being done. But what we are going to do next is something that I usually don't do in my projects in my courses because as you can see, I have a bunch of projects which have this default icon here and that's what we're going to change. So we're going to create our own favorite dish icon, so to speak, and add that to our project. We won't design the icon. You can actually just download it, okay? So you can just download the project that is assigned to this lecture and there you can download this image, but you can use any image you want as your icon. So this will be the icon for our application. So it will just be a spoon and the fork, right? So that's the idea here because we have a favorite dish. So it's green because we want it to be healthy and whatever. So that's really something that you can come up with yourself. If you have design skills, I'm really poor at that. So I asked someone to make it for me. And now let's look at how we can add that to our project. Okay, so therefore what we will need to do is we will need to go to our project, click anywhere in the project, then go to File, New, and here select Image Asset. And then you will find this screen. Let me make it a little bigger so we can see everything. So the image that I want to select is going to be the one that I get from this path here. Okay, so you need to select the image that you want to use. In my case, it will be that exact image that I just showed you. So I'm just going to copy the URL from here. I'm going to paste it in there and it will directly go to that folder where I can then select the image. Okay, and you can see this is how the icons will then look like. The ones that will be auto-generated for us for all of the different 
screen sizes and versions of Android and launches and everything because with different versions, things change, right? So either it's more rounded or it's more cornered or it's fully cornered or something like that. So depending on which launcher you're using, things might change. Okay, now you can trim the scaling if you want to, then the image will be preserved. And if you don't activate that, you can see that it might look weird on some devices, or maybe that's exactly the look you want to have. I personally prefer this look over the trimmed version, but it really depends on how you prefer it. Now, in this case, if you don't use the trimmed version, you have the situation where the background doesn't really matter too much, except for the full bleed layers. Okay, so I'm going to activate that for the particular tutorial here. So here in the background layer, you can then select a background. Okay, so it will be either an image that you can use, or it can be a color. Okay, so you can select another image as the background if you have any image and you have two layers then basically, or you just select the color. And in this case, you can select any color you want. I'll just use white. So I'm just going to enter F, 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 F. So six times F will be white. You can also use the color picker if you want to. So this will then make sure that the background color will be in fact white. Okay, so if you want your application to look like that, the, or the icon basically, then that's the way to go. And now at this point, once you have selected all of that and you're happy with it, you can press next. And you will see that some files will be overwritten. So the default files that were created for us, they will be overwritten. And once you're there, you can just go ahead and press finish. And now at this point, if we rerun our application, it will install our application once again. And we should now see our favorite dish icon pop up here. And it will look a little more like a real app rather than just a test version like this fav dish. Okay, so there we are, we have installed it and we can see that this is our favorite dish icon that we just prepared. And it's recognizable definitely, which is something that you should take into consideration when making an application. All right, so the next thing that I would like to implement in our application is this little icon here at the top, which sends us to a new activity. As you can see, the activity is empty, but that is something that we will take care of later. So for now, what we want is to have this little icon here in our app bar here at the top so that we can move over to another activity. Okay, so let's set that up. And therefore, we will need a new activity to go to. Okay, and what we are going to do for this is as well, change our setup. Okay, so for now, if we look at our structure here, we have our favorite dish, in which we have a UI folder, as well as our two activities. Now I would like to change that. Let me change that real quick, I'm going to create a new package here, which is basically a new folder. And this package will be model. This is where we're going to put all our models basically our database model. So how is our data going to look like? What kind of properties does it have? What kind of columns, so to speak, do you have in your table? And then I'm going to create another package here, which I'm going to call view. Okay, so here inside of view, I want to have two more packages, one of them being activities, because that's where all of the activities will go. And then I want to have another one in there, which will be fragments. Okay, so now if you do that, you can see now suddenly this becomes two folders here. Okay, so in activities, that's where I will drag to my activity. So you need to refactor this because a lot of references are there. So let's refactor that. Okay, the main activity will be moved over to the activities folder. This will take a little while as it seems. And then the same goes for our splash activity. So let me refactor that as well. And now I'm going to rename this UI here to view model. Okay, so this will be called view model. And inside of view model, that's where I want to put all of my view models. Okay, so you can see we have our dashboard fragment, our dashboard view model, as well as the home fragment, the home view model, and so forth. 
Okay, so let's take care of that because we want to use the MVVM architecture. Okay, and MVVM stands for Model View View Model. Okay, this M stands for Model, which is this folder here. Then the V stands for View, which is our activities and fragments. So we will need to drag the fragments in there as well. So let me refactor that. And then we have the View Model, which are all of our View Models. Okay, so I'm going to send those accordingly to the right folders where they are supposed to be. At least if you want to follow this pattern. Okay, so it really depends on which pattern you want to use. There are different patterns available. And in this course, we're going to focus on the MVVM pattern. Okay, now you can see that we can basically get rid of this whole UI subfolder. So let me delete that. And you can now see we have model, view, view model. But this model, of course, is empty as of now because we don't have any specific models for our data yet. We will take care of that later on. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, we can go ahead and create a new activity. Okay, so I'm going to create a new empty activity, which will be our add update dish activity. So add update dish activity. Why do I call it add update? Well, the idea is that this will be taking care of the adding of a new dish as well as updating a new dish. Okay, because I have this new structure here, you see it's complaining about the R because it's not imported. So we need to import that real quick by hovering over it and pressing Alt Enter. And this will then import R for us and the error will disappear. Okay, so now I can actually close this project screen. You can see this is a general activity that we have nothing too fancy here. What I will have to change, however, is inside of my Android manifest, which I'm going to move over to. I now have this add update dish activity, and I would like to add a couple of properties in here. Okay, so what I need there is on one hand, the label, and I also want to use this theme of no action bar that we had. Okay, so here, that will be the code that I need. Okay, so I'm going to add the label, which is going to be add dish, that will be the label for it, and theme, which will be the no action bar theme, which is the same that we are using for our splash activity. Next, I will need to take care of the fragment. And which fragment do I want to specifically take care of? Well, this home fragment, okay? The idea behind this fragment will be that it will be the all dishes fragment. So here we should see all of the dishes that we have, then this one will be the favorite dishes, this tab here, or this fragment here. And this one will be a random dish that we can generate anytime. Okay, so only in the home screen, you can see we have this plus button. You see, we don't have that in the other, at least that's the result that we want for this video. Okay, so let's take care of that. Therefore, we will go over to our home fragment. Okay, and I want to change the home fragment. Okay, so instead of it being home fragment, so right click, then refactor and specifically rename, or you can press Shift F6. And I'm going to rename that to All Dishes Fragment. Okay, that will be the new name. Now let's go over to the XML file. So it will be the fragment home. As you can see now, this is of course not the right name. So we need to rename that file as well. So therefore I'm going to go to my resources here, to my layouts, and this one will be renamed. Okay, so let's refactor that as well. And it will be fragment underscore all dishes. And maybe an underscore between all and dishes as well. Now we will need this little icon here at the top. So let's go ahead and create a new icon. And therefore we can just go ahead and use the vector assets here. So file new vector asset. Here you can select the clip art and I'm going to select add here. So just search for add, select this icon here and I see baseline add that will be the icon that we have here. Now you can of course change the color. So if we look at it, our icon should be white. Okay, so let's change the color to be white. Okay, six F's is white. Let's choose that. 
Now it's not very visible on this screen, but it will in fact be visible. Maybe we want to just call it IC add to give it a shorter name. So it really depends on how you want to call it and then finish. And now let's go ahead and create a new menu because this here at the top is in fact the menu, even though there are no additional options. So there's only one option, but still it's a menu. So let's go ahead and create a new entry here, menu resource file. And I'm going to call this one menu underscore all underscore dishes. Okay, the rest can stay the same because we will use the directory name menu and everything else is as we need it. Okay, now this menu doesn't have any entries in it. So we need to add an item to our menu. And if you want to know how to do that, well, you can always get inspired by other menus that you have already. For example, this bottom navigation menu, you can see here we have items. Okay. And we want to also have an item inside of our menu, all dishes. So basically what we need to do is we need to add an item here and we can now define that item. An item needs always an ID. So let's add an ID to it. And I'm going to call this one action underscore add underscore dish. Then it needs to have an icon and a title. Okay, so the icon that I'm going to use here is our IC underscore add, which is this one here that we just created this plus icon, you can see it here on the left hand side. Okay, and then we need to add the title, as I said, and the title will be something like add dish. Okay, now we can either enter the title directly here, but it prefers to well, we should use a string instead. Okay, so let's go over to our strings XML, you can also just search for strings XML, move over here and go ahead and create a new entry here. So let's create a new string, which will be called add underscore dish, for example, and what should it do? Well, it should say something like add dish. All right, and now we can go back to our other file. And that was our menu all dishes XML. And we can use add string add dish here. And then finally, I want this to always appear. Okay, so you can use something like show as action. And I'm going to set it to always so that it's always going to be visible for us when we are on this screen. Now we just need to make sure that our all dishes fragment here as of now, it's inflating this layout fragment all dishes. And we need to add a new line here to our on create method, which we don't have yet. Okay, so we need to implement a new method, which will be the on create method, which is an overridable method. As you have seen, this one will be called once this view is created. So on create, let's use that. And what I need to do in here is going to be to set has options menu to true. Okay, only then this options menu at the top will appear. And now we need to make sure that we implement this options menu style, so to speak. So we define how this options menu is going to look like and what should happen once it is created. And this is something that you need to implement by using on create options menu, which will then have to inflate our menu that we just created. So we use the inflator and we inflate r dot menu dot and we call it menu all dishes. And we need to pass the menu over as well, which is this menu that we get once this options menu is created. And now there is another override method which we can implement or we should implement and that is what should happen once one of the objects is clicked. Okay, because you could have multiple items inside of your menu. Like we have our bottom nav menu, nav menu, as you can see here, we have the navigation home, we have the navigation dashboard and so forth. And we also have the same thing for our menu, all dishes. So here we also have an item that can be clicked and we can define it or find out which item was clicked by its ID. Okay, so we can now go ahead and implement that in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say when the item 
die ID, so item ID is going to be r dot id dot action add dish. Then I want to start an activity. And which activity will it be? Well, the one with the intent of, and you will need to import intent by press, pressing Alt Enter. Now here, the thing is, because we are inside of a fragment, we cannot just say this, which we would usually do, because the fragment doesn't have a context by itself. It needs the context of the activity in which it exists. And in order to get that activity, you can just use this require activity, and it will then give us this fragment activity. And we need to pass the class that we want to go to or the activity that we want to go to. And that's that update the dish activity or add update dish activity colon colon class dot java. Okay, now the intent will be happy and we can return true. So we still need to return true because we are clicking this button here and it expects something. Okay, now at this point, let's test our application and see if we are actually moving over from one activity to another, which means from our main activity to the add dish and so forth activity. Okay, so there is our application. Let's click on this little icon. You can see now it appears and let's click on it and you can see we move over to this new activity. And how do we know that we are in the right activity? Well, we don't really know it because we don't have any text or anything here. We could use a breakpoint, of course, in our code to figure it out. But what is a very promising point is the fact that we don't have an action bar here at the top, which is in fact something that we have defined specifically inside of our Android manifest here. So as you might recall, this is where we defined it. Okay, so that's it for this video. Now we have this little icon ready and you also have refactored your application so that it now is going to be ready to be applying the MVVM pattern. Okay, so see you in the next one. The layouts library is now part of Android Jetpack and we're going to look at the different layouts because well, we're going to use some of them throughout the application and it's really important for you to understand that there are different layouts and how they are connected to each other before we are going to use them. So let's have a quick overview. A layout defines structure for user interface in your application, for example, an activity or a fragment or whatever you are using as the main view of your application. So all elements in the layout are built using a hierarchy of view and view group objects. And we're going to see what views and view groups are in a bit, how they are connected to each other. And a view usually draws something the user can see and interact with. However, the view group is an invisible container that defines the layout structure. And that's really the idea of this video to look at these layout structures. So here, for example, you can see how this is connected to each other. So you have a view group, such as, for example, a linear layout. And inside of that view group, you can have another view group but you can also have views. So inside of that linear layout, you could have another linear layout, but also buttons and image views, for example, or whatever kind of views you want to have. So view objects are usually called widgets, such as a button is a widget, a text view is a widget, but view groups are usually called layouts. So for example, linear layout, constraint layout, relative layout, and so forth. So in order to declare a layout, there are two different ways to do that. Either you declare UI elements in XML or you instantiate layouts elements at runtime via code. We're going to look at specifically how to do it in XML in this lecture, but in general, also in the course. So but first of all, you need to define that this file that you are writing there is in fact an XML file. And we're just defining that the XML version is 1.0 and the encoding that we're using is UTF-8. There are different types of encodings around the world and UTF-8 is basically the one that we use in the West most commonly, which basically allows us to use all of the keys that we have on our keyboard. And then you define the name of the layout that you want to have as your main layout, including the Android namespace. So here's schemas, android.com slash apk slash rest slash Android is the namespace that we're using, the XML namespace, so to speak. Then you need to define a width and a height for every single 
view that you're creating as well as for every single view group. And mostly it will just be something like match parent or wrap content. And then specifically when working with linear layouts, you need to define the orientation. So here, for example, vertical means that we're going to put our elements that will be inside of that linear layout on top of each other. And then, for example, we have a little text view with an ID and some other settings. Then we have a button in there as well. And what this will do is it will basically create a view for us where we have a text view at the top and a button just underneath it. And then in order to load the XML resource, each XML layout is compiled into a view resource. So you can load that layout resource from your application code in your activity on create method. So for example, in on create, what you would do is you set the content view using r.layout.activity main. And that would be the default way of doing it. And also the old fashioned way, which still works and still is fine and is also something that you will be automatically generated for you once you create an activity. But we are going to see how to do that using view binding as well, where you wouldn't pass the layout this way, but using view binding. And we're going to see how that is done in the course. So there are some attributes that you can define for a view, but also for a layout, and that is the ID. So you can define the unique ID via which you can then access this element in your Kotlin or Java code. So for example, for a button, you would define the ID, in this case, my button, and then you can access it. Then you have the width and height as always, and you can then define a couple more properties. So each view type has different kind of properties and the same goes for each layout type. So the different properties that you can use is something that your IDE can help you with, but also of course the documentation. So if you want to know what a layout can do for you in terms of the different properties that you can change, definitely check out the documentation for that. So in order to create an instance of the view object and captured from the layout, you would then go ahead and say, val my button, of type button, find view by ID using r dot ID my button. So that would be the old fashioned way using find view by ID, but we're also going to see how it's done using view binding as view binding is basically part of Jetpack. And that is the latest and best way of accessing UI elements. But just so you're aware, that's the easiest way to actually get access to an object and use it or a view and use it. All right, so now let's look at layout parameters. So XML layout attributes named layout underscore something define layout parameters for the view that are appropriate for the view group in which it resides. Every view group class implements a nested class that extends the view group dot layout params. So for example, you have linear layout dot layout params. The same goes for the constraint layout dot layout params. This subclass contains property types that define the size and the position for each child view as appropriate for the view group. As you can see in the image, the parent view group defines the layout parameter for each child view, including the child view group. Every layout params subclass has its own syntax for setting values. So each child element must define layout params that are appropriate for its parent, though it may also define different layout parameters for its own child. All view groups include a width and height, as I said earlier, and each view is required to define them. Otherwise, your IDE will tell you, so Android Studio will tell you that something is wrong and you need to enter something there. And many layout parameters are also including optional margins and borders by default, or you can set them up as well. You can specify width and height with exact measurements, though probably you won't want to do that because basically the width and height will be very different on different screen sizes. So using something like wrap content, where you tell your view to size itself to the dimensions required by its content. So if, for example, if you say the width should be wrap content and you have a, a sentence that you want to display, then it will only be as wide as the letters in that sentence require in terms of width for them to appear fully on the screen. Match parent, however, tells your view to match with the parent view and basically become as big as its parent view will allow it. 
In general, specifying a layout width and a height using absolute units such as pixels is not recommended. Instead, using relative measures such as density pixels, wrap content or match parent is a better approach because it helps you to ensure that your app will display properly across a variety of different screen sizes. And that is really the challenge that we have nowadays when it's designing an application because there are so many different screen sizes and ratios even. For example, on my Galaxy Fold, I have even two different ratios depending on if I have it open or closed. If I have it closed, then I have a ratio, I think, of 22 to 9. If I have it open, I believe it's something like 4 to 3 or something like that, right? So you have to consider this when building your application, and that's why using relative layouts is something very useful. And we're going to even see how to use a third-party library for that that will help us to make sure that our applications are going to look good on different screen sizes. Okay, so we looked at those letters here. So let's have a look at the mostly used attributes. So the layout position is something that's important, the size, the padding, margins, and you can use many more as you will see in the upcoming demos as well as in the bigger application that we are going to build. All right, so what are the different layouts that there are? So the linear layout is the one that is a classical one, let's say it's very useful if you want to organize the children into a, or a horizontal or vertical row. It creates a scroll bar if the length of the window exceeds the length of the screen, which is also very useful. Then you have the relative layout. And by the way, if you want to use them in code, you put no empty space in between the two keywords. And in the relative layout, it enables you to specify the location of a child objects relative to each other. So a child A to the left of child B or to the parent or aligned to the top of the parent and so forth. So that's something you can define in the relative layout. And then the constraint layout, and that is something that, well, recently is the default. If you create a new activity, this will be the default for you in your main XML and activity main XML. You will see that it's using a constraint layout, which is great if you want to drag and drop your UI together because constraint layouts basically allow you to create large and complex layout with a flat view hierarchy. So no nested view groups are required. It's similar to relative layout in that all views are laid out according to relationships between sibling views and the parent layout. But it's more flexible than a relative layout and easier to use with Android Studio's layout editor. So all the power of constraint layout is available directly from the layouts editor visual tool because the layout API and the layout editor were specifically or specially built for each other. So you can build your complete layout with constraint layout entirely by drag and dropping instead of editing anything in the XML. And while this works, it is a, let's say, challenge for itself. So you really need to learn how to do it properly because there are also a couple of things to consider when building a layout using the UI editor instead of using XML. I personally prefer XML. I really love linear layouts and relative layouts, but while constraint layouts are the way to go and very useful. And then you have web views, which are not something that you drag together, but it's basically a view that or a layout that you would use for websites or web pages. And then you have the frame layout, which is designed to block out an area on the screen to display a single item. And generally frame layouts should be used to hold a single child view because it can be difficult to organize child views in a way that's scalable to different screen sizes without the children overlapping each other. So a frame layout would be something that you would use, for example, if you want to make sure that you have an image on top of an image or a text on top of an, of an image or something like that. So a view on top of a view in the sense of you have an extra layer that is not centered on a Y axis on top of it, but on a Z axis on top of it. Okay, so basically if you have an image and you want to have another, another image inside of that image, that's why you would use the frame layout layout. <laughs> All right. And there are a few more, but they're usually not used very often. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching it. And let's go over to the next one where we're going to see how to use the different layouts step by step. So see you there. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to show you how to use a linear layout and what kind of different properties there are. Of course, I'm not going to cover all of them as there are 
but bunch of them. So I'm just going to focus on the main concepts of linear layouts and what's important to know about them. So basically I'm using a linear layout here and what linear layouts allow us to do is to basically arrange their children in a single direction. So either vertically or horizontally. You could also say that they align the views one by one. Okay, so you can define the orientation using this keyword here, this property orientation with either vertical or horizontal. Okay, so these are the two options that you have here. And if you don't know the options that are made available to you, you can just add the quotation marks and then press control and spacebar and options will be made available to you. Okay, so if I want to put elements vertically to each other, then they will be on top of each other. So let's have a quick look at that. So basically I'm just going to add a little button here and this button will have a width of match parent and a height of wrap content. Okay, what this will do is it will basically make sure that this button has a width that is going to take the whole width that the parent has and wrap content is going to make sure that it only takes the height that the button needs to display the content that is inside of it. So in this case, I'm using a material button here. You can see that here because it has this special color and this special style and all of that. But this is basically using material design here. So you can see that it also has a default height because otherwise there is no content in it. It would be zero if it would use this wrap content. You can also define this manually using density pixels here. So you could say something like 200 dp and then this button will be 200 density pixels high, which is more or less 200 pixels on older devices, but on newer devices, it will be a different number. So it will usually be a little more because devices nowadays have more pixels. Okay, so that's something that you can play around with here. Of course, it's a lot more interesting if we add a text property to it. So you can just add text and then give it a fixed text. So I'm gonna call this one my button. Okay, so you can also see they are by default capitalized. So that's what material buttons do for you. Okay, that by itself will not be as interesting as having two buttons, for example. So let's add another button here and a third one. So what you will see now is that all three buttons are on top of each other. So this is something that is achieved by using a linear layout with the orientation set to vertical. Okay, so if we now change that, let's say we change that to horizontal, then the buttons will be next to each other horizontally. But now we have a little problem because every single button is going to be as wide as the screen is. So this means that our three buttons are next to each other. And I'm going to change that by making sure that they are also just going to wrap content. So all three buttons will only wrap their content. And what you will see then is that the three buttons are now next to each other. They still take up the space that they need. And now let's have a quick look at what wrap content actually means. So instead of using my button, I'm going to get rid of this button. And you see now it only takes the my space plus a little bit of default padding. Okay, so there is the default padding, which basically creates this distance between the interior text as well as the exterior border. So if you want to change that, you can change a padding property to whatever value you want to have. So let's say I want to make sure that the padding is going to be smaller. So let's say I want to make the padding bigger. So I'm going to add 20 dp and it will now be a lot bigger. Now, if you try that with 2 dp, you will see that it won't happen. So there is a default value, at least for the material button, that cannot be overwritten, or at least it can't be lower than the default value that is assigned to it. You can make it bigger, however. So if you want to have more space between the text and the edge of the button, you can do that anytime. So you see, now it creates this padding of 20, that is the distance between this text, as well as the edge towards all directions. So if you make this text a little longer, my favorite, button, then you see it takes a lot more space. And at the same time, if the text becomes super long, then it forces this button on the right hand side to shrink. So now 
it's super thin and it looks super weird. So that's always something that you have to take into consideration, which is why it really makes sense to be aware of how thick you want the button to be. All right, and at this point, I would like to show you a concept called layout weight. Okay, so what you can do is, in this case, I'm going to get rid of this padding here to make sure that the buttons are similar in size or the same size. I'm going to use a button here. You can see now these buttons, they have all roughly speaking the same size, but basically it should be the same size. I'm going to change the orientation to vertical and I'm going to play around with something called weight, layout weight to be precise. So you can add this property layout weight and give an item a certain weight. So this one now will have a weight of one. You can see that it's the only button that has any weight. That's why it's taking as much weight as it's possibly can get basically. So now let me add this layout weight to the other buttons as well. And you will see that now the buttons are of equal size. Now, if I change the weight of one of the buttons, let's say this bottom button to two, for example, now this button will take two fourths of space. This one will take one fourth of space and the other one will also take one fourth of space in terms of height in this case of the screen. And that happens because basically it takes the weight of the item that is inside of the linear layout and divides it by the total weight available and then assigns the value accordingly. So in this case, we have a total weight of four and this item has a weight of one, which means it's going to be one fourth of the screen. This works well if there are no other overwriting factors. So if I now add a huge padding, for example, of 100 dp, then this will be overwritten. Okay, so 100 dp will be the priority, so to speak, and then the other two will basically take the available space that is made available to them. So this one will take one, yeah, fourth is not really the value here, but roughly one fourth, or at least this one will take half the space that this one will take. So it's not really one fourth anymore because this padding is overriding it, but depending on how you play around with your values, you will then get the situation where this one has twice as much weight as this one, so it takes twice as much space that, meets, uh, that is made available. But of course, having a padding of 100 dp would be incorrect for buttons mainly. You can also see that these buttons, they don't look great. Okay, so then there is one more thing that I wanted to show you real quick, and that is to use linear layouts inside of linear layouts. So I'm going to use another linear layout in here and it will match the parent in terms of width and wrap its content in terms of height. Okay, so now uh, this one, actually I will just use in default linear layout and not the compact one. Okay, let's use it like this. And then I need to have a closing bracket as well. So you can always see that we have an opening bracket as well as a closing bracket, at least in elements that need to have some more elements inside of them. So you can see that this material button doesn't have that because it doesn't need to have values inside of it. And you can also see that this material button just closes by using this, this slash and then the greater sign. Okay, so you open with the less than sign, then the, the description of the property that you want to use or the view type, the layout type, or the, well, the widget basically, material button is a widget, linear layout is a container. Okay, so what you're doing here is you're basically opening it here, but then you add all of the properties just before you close it, so to speak. Okay, and the linear layout now is a container, so we add all of our properties inside of the opening tag, so to speak, and then inside of the linear layout itself, that's where we put all of the different widgets that we want to use. Okay, and you can also see that every single element has to have a width as well as a height. Okay, so that's something that I haven't covered before. But now what you will see is that you can now use a linear layout inside of a linear layout, which means you can generally use a view group or a container inside of a container, as well as widgets inside of that. So let's add another widget in here and I'm just going to use another material button here. I'm not gonna use a weight here, okay? 
But what you will see is that this linear layout by default, if I add another button, you will see it very well. By default is going to be a linear layout that uses the horizontal orientation. So items are put next to each other. Okay, so now let's change that. You can add the orientation here. And now I'm going to use a vertical orientation as well. So you can see that these two buttons are going to be on top of each other as well. So that's how you can create a layout inside of a layout. But this would make more sense if this is actually going to be horizontal because why would I otherwise use another linear layout here? There are probably some occasions where it makes sense, but mostly you would use a linear layout inside of a linear layout if you want to change the orientation because otherwise you could have just put it in the upper level linear layout. Okay, so now this can also get a weight, of course. So if I add a weight here and it's called layout weight and this one will have a layout weight of five, for example, now you will see it will take a lot of space because these two or these three elements here, they have a layout weight of four and now this linear layout will take a layout weight of five, even though its height is only wrapping content. So you can see you can really override some values with other values. Okay, so that was a little introduction to linear layouts. It's a little longer than I anticipated, but I still believe that this was useful to you. And the last little thing that I want to show you, and this is a little trick if you want to learn more about what kind of properties there are and what a particular property does, is you can just hold the control key or command key if you're on Mac, and then click on the property that you want to know more about. Okay, so clicking on it, you will find that this is an attribute with the format float. So you need to enter a float value or you can enter a float value, which means you can have decimal points there. But here is a little description of what it does. So it indicates how much of the extra space in the linear lay layout is located to the view associated with these layout params. So we're playing around with layout params Basically, this is this attribute is a layout param. Specify zero if the view should not be stretched. Otherwise, the extra pixels will be prorated among all views whose weight is greater than zero. Okay, so you can learn a little more about what the different properties do. And you can see this file is huge. Okay, this is the file with attributes. So the ATT rs file has a bunch of different attributes and not all of them will be made available for our linear layout for example if you look at the text here for example you will see it's also inside of attrs but it's declare styleable for text use so this is not something that you would do add a linear layout. So you wouldn't add a text property here. You can see it doesn't have the X property available for you. It has text alignment and text direction. So if you want to define that on a container level, so to speak, you can define those things, but you cannot define a text property because the linear layout doesn't have such an attribute assigned to it, such a property assigned to it. Now there are still two more things that I want to show you. And one of them is that it's really important to assign an ID to your items if you want to access them using your code later on. So if you want to somehow access this button, you would need to give this button an ID and a good name would be button and then whatever the button should do. Okay, so button save, for example, if this is a button that will save whatever you are using in your UI. And then really the last thing that I wanted to show you is a very important property that is going to be called gravity. And I'm going to use layout gravity here, which will allow me to define to which direction an item, in this case, my button should gravitate. So I can, for example, select end here, and then it will gravitate towards the end, which means towards the right of its available associated space. And now you can play around with this. So for example, center would put it towards the center inside of its context, because well, in this case, the gravity is going to center it on a horizontal manner. That's because we are in a linear layout that positions elements vertically. 
okay so the space that is made available for that button is really only going to be on its horizontal level now for the buttons inside of our second linear layout which is the one here at the bottom if i now add the gravity here so layout gravity and put it to center then you'll see now it will take the center based on the available space for this item and this item is forced to be inside of this area on the left hand side because we're using a linear layout that has an orientation that is a horizontal okay so that's something that you can play around with with this layout gravity and you can see that there are a bunch of different options and i would recommend to play around with them to get a feeling for what they do okay that's really it for this video see you in the next one quick pause this video is sponsored by our Jetpack Masterclass course, which we've been working on for a couple of months. And this video is basically just part of that course. And if you want to learn everything about Jetpack that is relevant for your future applications, definitely check out the link in the description below. We have created a great course, which teaches you to basically use all of the relevant Jetpack components, as well as build a real life application, which you can see here. So in the background, you can see the components. We're going to implement most of them in our application here so you're going to learn how to build those but we also have separate demos which teach you the components separately as well so definitely check out the course and of course you will build this little dishes application where you can store your favorite dishes using the room database you can delete those dishes or edit them you can create your own dishes with your own images or the gallery if you have any dishes there and then store it using the room database and at the same time use an api to get data from the internet so here you can load a random dish which you then can add to your favorite list and then basically you see it in all your dishes and as well as in your favorite dishes thanks for watching the video check out the link in the description for the full course and let's get back to the course welcome back in this video i just wanted to quickly show you a couple more icons that we have here in the layout editor especially in the design editor. So here, once I drag in a button, for example, you can see that this button now doesn't have any constraints and we get this little warning here or an error that states that we're missing constraints. What you can do is you can click this little icon here, which says infer constraints, and then it will automatically generate constraints for you. So you can see it generates an estimated distance that it thinks that you want it to have for this button to be distant to the top edge here, for example. So that's something that you can do. And if you're not happy with the constraints, you can also clear all constraints that there are in your UI, and this will delete all the constraints in your current layout. So if you do that, you can see it is now gone. Now, let me add a constraint once again, using this magic button. Now you see the button has constraints. And now let me add another button here and a third button i just wanted to quickly show you the different options that you have here with the three buttons that you see here so first of all of course we need to make sure that we have constraints so this one should be underneath the other button and i'm going to add constraints to the left and right as well and same goes for this one so it will have constraints towards the different directions but also towards the bottom. Okay, so I'm going to add a constraint toward the bottom now as well. You can see that it positions it in the center of the two constraints that are given to it. So in both directions, vertically as well as horizontally. Now, what you can do is you can select a view or a widget or even layout. In this case, you can select multiple ones using the component tree, for example, and then you can use different options here. So for example, expand vertically. So this will now expand the buttons. This is probably not what you want, but this is something you can do just using these icons here. Also going back. What's more interesting, however, is what I believe is when you do right click here into your UI after having selected them, and then you add a chain. Okay, so we're going to create a vertical chain here. You see now the icons are distributed evenly considering of course the distance that we have here so here it had 138 of a margin towards the top okay so you can click on that button and then check it out you will find it here in margin top so let me get rid of that now 
they will be distributed evenly across the screen, but you can also select a different type of chain setting. Okay, so there are vertical chain styles now. Once we have added the vertical chain, you can see you can also remove it, but you can also select multiple options here. So spread is going to spread it towards the edges as we had the setting before. Now you can change it to, for example, packed. Now the buttons will be all close together or the views in general will be very close together. And then you have spread inside, which spreads them to the edges, basically, the external ones. And then the central one, well, it stays in the center. So they are spread evenly, but inside so that the edge items are really pushed towards the edges. Okay, so that's something you can do with spread inside. Now, if you look at your settings, you will also realize that there is something called layout constraint horizontal bias that was added for us automatically. We didn't add that manually and it wasn't there before. It was added by us using this chain, right? So this vertical chain that we have added. Now, the thing is, the bias is basically how do you want to tilt an item towards one or the other side? So if you have a bias of 50%, which is the default, then it will be in the center. If you have a bias of 30%, then it will push itself more towards one direction than the other. We can test that real quick by using a bias for our button in the center. I believe this will be the most easy one to realize the changes. And here, instead of 0 0.5, let's use 0 0.3. And you can see now it has a horizontal bias of 0 0.3, pushing it further towards the right. So this shows you that you can play around with the biases to push an item more towards one direction or the other. Now, if you try to do the same thing with the vertical bias now, there's also something called vertical bias, right? So layout constraint vertical bias, which is the same name except that it's not horizontal bias, but vertical bias now. And this is going to tilt it towards one or the other direction. But this won't work because we are overwriting it basically with this feature that we are using with basically at the top level here with the chain. Okay, so this chain style is overwriting this. Even if you add 0 0.5 here, you can see nothing happens. So this basically doesn't have an effect here. This vertical bias because it's really spread evenly across the screen using this part here, the spread inside vertical chain style. Okay, so this is how you can play around with the position relatively in your screen based on the space that it occupies and has available to itself for the view. You can learn a little more about the chain style and in general about the constraint layout using the documentation, of course. As you can see, there is not just spread chain, spread inside chain, as well as packed chain, but there are also packed chains with biases as well as weighted chains. And I would really recommend to check out the documentation to get a full understanding of how to use all of that if you ever need it for your application. But as it mostly is, it really mainly makes sense to learn something once you actually need it, because otherwise you're learning something that you might never use and this can be useless. But really recommend it to still check it out to at least have an understanding of what is available because that's very often enough to trigger something in your head when you ever need something new right you will know okay there is a, an option to do something like this and this is really something that's really important as a developer in general to have ideas of how things could happen based on what you have learned somewhere or read somewhere without even having really touched it or seen it in practice, right? So this is often going to be enough to make you find a solution very quickly, okay? So I'd say let's go over to the next video where we're going to build a complete UI using constraint layouts, which will be a little more complex. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to build this UI here using a constraint layout. And as a little challenge for myself, I will create this only using the graphical user interface. So I'm not going to go into the code and make any changes in the code. I'm going to do everything in the designer. And that's really the idea behind constraint layouts. At least that was the idea how, why they were created by Google and really you can basically just drag and drop elements from your palette directly into your UI. And the cool thing is it will look similar on different screen sizes. So you can see 
elements are still positioned roughly at the same spot as they were on the other device even when looking at it in widescreen you can see it's still fine so it really is something that is very useful when building a UI if you want it to be consistent throughout different devices and basically we're going to build this UI you can see we have an image view we have a bunch of labels as well as edit texts here and then we have this remember me checkbox as well as this forgot password text then the sign in button the Facebook icon as well as the Google by icon as well as some separators here this is also another label and what we're going to use here is going to be a bunch of different settings that constraint layouts have to offer as well as the UI elements that you can see here so now let's have a look at how we can build this UI using constraint layouts without using code, even though I'm going to go over the code. And I think it is best if I get started with it straight away. The first thing that you might notice is one thing that you have here at the bottom for every constraint layout, and that is to have constraints. And you need to have two constraints, at least one vertical and one horizontal constraint for every single UI element that you add to your screen. Otherwise, you will get a warning and the UI won't work. The constraints are basically what is next to it, basically. He's saying here that the bottom of this image view is to the top of whatever this view is. The left is to the left of the parent, which means that it takes the whole left side towards the parent basically as much space as is available. And then the same goes for right to right of parent and top to top of parent. So this is our image view that has constraints towards all those directions. And then there is another constraint toward the bottom, which was created using this label here. And that label is put next to it, so to speak. One thing that is very interesting is this part here, where it says constraint vertical chain style spread inside. So you can change this and there are different options. So packed would be an alternative. If you look at packed, then you can see that now our UI will be everything taking only as much space as it needs in between each other. But towards the top and bottom, you have some space left. Okay, and there are three options here. One was packed, the other one was spread. And what will, that will do is it, it will just spread evenly amongst the space that is available. And then the other one is spread inside, which will basically spread towards the edges. So you can see here, don't have an account yet, is at the very edge of the screen at the very bottom. And this icon or this image here is towards the very top of the screen. Okay, so these are the three options. And I think spread is probably the best one for our particular UI that we have here. It will then look really good on different screen sizes. You can see it's still very evenly spread and I'd say it is looking quite good. Okay, let's try to build this UI and I would recommend that you try to build this UI yourself, move along and just watch the video while building this and really trying things out. Okay, so what I'm going to create for this is going to be a new layout. So I'm inside of a project. You can just use any project and I'm going to call this login layout, okay? This is not going to be part of any application. This is really just for me to have an XML that I can work with and play around with. So what you will see is that here on the left-hand side, you have your palette, your component tree, and on the right-hand side, if you open it up, the attributes. And we're going to work with all three of them. So let's get started with the palette because that's where the interesting part comes in. So first of all, I'm going to drag an image view in there and I'm going to use our logo tutorials.eu and you can see it's positioned wherever I dragged it. Okay, so it's going to assume that this is where I want to position it. But at the same time, there is an error here saying this view is not constrained. It only has design time position. So it will jump to zero zero at runtime unless you add the constraints. So we need to add constraints to it. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's a little more visible. So I'm going to drag from this little circle here to the edge of the screen at the top side and then towards the left as well as towards the right. Now I have the constraints and it will be centered. By the way, if I get rid of this constraint, you can see it will be at the top left. If I get rid of this left constraint, 
So going back, you can see I still have an error. So I need to have a constraint towards the horizontal as well as vertical side of the screen or of your application. So you need to have two constraints, one for the vertical as well as one for the horizontal side. This can be based on other elements in your screen, but this can also, of course, be the parent as in this case. Okay, so now when clicking on this image, I can go to attributes here on the right hand side. And now I can play around with the attributes that are there already, and I can add new attributes as well. So let's for now change the layout width to being 300 dp, dp standing for density pixels, which are basically pixels that try to mimic being the same size on different screen sizes. So it's really just to make sure that it looks more or less similar on different screen sizes. That's what dp is made for, so for density pixels. And then the height will be 150 dp. Okay, now the next thing that I want to have is a text view. Okay, so I'm going to drag in a text view here and you will see it has all these circles so I can add constraints to them. So let me add a constraint towards this image at the top, which means I'm going to have the top of my text view to be to the bottom of the image view. Okay, this is the constraint that I'm adding here. I also add a constraint towards the right hand edge as well as the left edge. And now let me add some more settings here. So the margin towards the top, I'm going to assign something like, let's say 16 dp. So here it will be 16 dp distance towards this uh, top image. And then I want to have a couple more margins. Okay, so you can scroll up here and go to this plus sign in declared attributes and then enter margin for example. So I'm going to have a margin towards the left and the right, but then better statements or better keywords for that are in fact margin start, which is left, and margin end, which is right. Okay, so these you should use these instead. And then I'm going to use 32 dp for both directions. So I want to have a little bit of space in both directions. So here this will be also margin end being 16, actually 32 dp. That was the value that I assigned there. Now for the width, I'm going to take that it should match the parent. So it should take the whole width that the parent has available, except for these 32 density pixels on both sides. Then I'm going to change the text to log into account. And then I'm going to add a couple more properties. So one of them will be that I want to make sure that the text is centered. So you can search for gravity here for the Android gravity, which will center the element inside of its own parent, so to speak. So the text in this case, inside of the text view, well, if, and that will be centered. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that the text now will be centered and you can see now login to account is in fact centered. Now you can of course play around with the text size and I'm going to set that to 20 SP. And SP is basically the same thing as DP but for texts. So for text you don't use DP but you use SP. And then I'm going to assign a color. So I'm going to set the text color to be a black color. Okay, so here you can either select it like this or you can also select an extra resource. So here you see I have this resource called black. You can select it here at the top or browse even if you wanted to. So once again, select the resource black here. So it will be a black error black than it was before. I think before it was gray. And now we need to have another text view underneath it. So I'm going to put it at the bottom of this login to account. I'm going to add a constraint towards left and right. And then I will need to add a couple more settings. So first of all, I want to make sure that I have a margin towards the top. So layout margin top should be also maybe here 32 dp. So we have a little more distance to it. Then the text will be something like username slash email. And the width should be match parent. So it's going to take the whole width that the parent has to offer. And in my case, it didn't take it. So let me do it once again. Now it did. Now let's add a margin towards the left hand side by using margin start. 
Here I'm going to use 32 dp. So 16 and 32 dp are basic values that are very common to use when working with margins inside of Android UIs. Okay, and then I need to have a margin towards the end as well, which will also be 32 dp. Okay, so you can see these two, they have the same width, so to speak. Now, of course, you can play around with the size here. I'm going to change the text size to be 20 SP. So text size will be 20 SP. And this is a little more readable, I'd say. Now, of course, we can also add a black text color to it. So here color will be, so text color will also be this black here. And for some reason it doesn't take it. So I have to do it again. Now there we are, now it worked. So now this next thing that I had here, if you look at it, is an edit text. So a text entry field where the user can enter his username. So that will be here, if you don't find it directly, you can just search for edit text here. And then you will see that there are different options for edit text. So here, this is for plain text, for passwords, for emails. And depending on which one you choose, the user will see a different keyboard appearing when they click on it. So for example, if you want the user to enter an email address, you would definitely use the edit text with the email. So this is allowing the user to enter emails more quickly because the keyboard is going to have the at sign straight away and all those kind of things and the dot com button as well. And you can see here the input type is set to text email address. So that's basically what this edit text email really does for us. Now, uh, let me add this constraint towards the bottom of this username, constraint towards the left, constraint towards the right, and add a little bit of a margin towards the top, which I'm going to set to 16 density pixels so that we have a little bit of distance. The width should be match parent once again. And for some reason it doesn't take it in the first run <laughs> again. So now I'm going to add a margin towards the start of 32 dp and margin towards the end of also 32 dp. Okay and then it still didn't take the match parent here, so I'm getting a little annoyed at it. That's how it's gonna do it. Okay, now you can add a background color to it as well. So let me add a new background color. And here you can then select the background color that you want to use. So I'm just going to use a custom grayish color. So you can really just select something here, the grayer the better, and that's it. So. Let's select this. And for some reason, it sometimes just doesn't pick it up for it. So you have to click on the element once again and go to background, select the color, double click on it really to make sure that it takes this color and then it should take the color. Now this is very small. I would like to change its size a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to give it a text size of 16 so text size of 16 SP, but then I would like to have a little bit of padding in between. So padding is basically a distance in between. So let me enter padding of, let's say 12 dp. So now it will be a little bigger. The text will not be huge, but this whole added text will be a little bigger. Okay, now at this point, I'm going to create the two next entries which is going to be the password and add a text for the password, which will be of course a password here, this one, password, add a text. I'm going to drag those two in here and position them. I'm going to cut the video up to the point where I have added those in here as well, because this is basically the same thing that we have seen with all of those other elements as well. So next I'm going to add a checkbox here and let me drag that in there. Now this checkbox should be to the bottom of our password and it should be towards the left hand side of our screen. And now we need to design it a little bit. So I'm going to give it a margin towards the top of 16 
density pixels and a margin towards the start or left of 32 density pixels. Okay, now of course we want to change the text of it and I'm going to call it remember me. Okay, so you can see this is the checkbox that we have there. You can now make it bold or whatever you want. And the next thing will be another text field. So another text view here towards the right hand side. Okay, so now this will be, I need to zoom out a little bit. This will be also towards the bottom of my password and the text and it will have a constraint towards the right of the screen. But alternatively, you can also, of course, put it towards the left of the remember me. So now it will be in between those. So what you can do is, of course, change its text to something like forgot password. And then add a little bit of margin towards the top of 16 dp, as well as set the text size to be 16 sp and have a little bit of margin towards the left and right of 32 dp. So margin start of 32 dp, margin end of 32 dp, And of course, use a different text color here. So I'm going to use the color of 2196F3, which will be this light blue color for it. Here, like this. And this looks a lot better already. For now, this forgot password is not perfectly positioned, but that will be fine. Let's add a button to it as well, to our UI. And it should be constrained towards the left and right. So I want it to be in the center. And at the same time, it should be underneath this remember me. And by the way, this forgot password should also be on top of this button here. So I'm going to drag it over there. And you see now this forgot password has received the right height for it. Okay, now this button, let's design it a little bit as well. So I'm going to change up a couple of settings for it. First of all, the text should be sign in. Then I'm going to get add a layout margin left of 32 dp, layout margin end of also 32 dp, layout margin top of 16 dp, so a little bit of a distance, then match parent for its width, and it still doesn't have the right margin left for some reason, oh yeah, that shouldn't be margin left, that should be margin and start basically. Okay, so you already see margin left doesn't do the trick for us. Margin start is the setting that I want to have here, 32 dp. And as you see, margin left is overridden here. Okay, so this will be our sign in button. Okay, so now let's take care of the separators. So these little separators here. Okay, so we have two separators, an OR in between, and in order to build this, there are different ways. So you can either put them in here. So these are basically views. Okay, so the separator is of type view. So you can just search for view here and then drag it in there. But you can see that a view will try to take the whole space that is available, the whole page, so to speak. So I'm going to call this separator1. And it will, I will refactor this. And in terms of width, 
I'm going to take zero density pixels and in terms of height, I'm going to take one density pixel. Okay, so this is now going to be just a small line and then I'm going to give it a color, so a background color of black. Okay, so here I'm going to just select a color called black. So here by the way, you can select resources straight away. So if you don't want to define the value manually, you can take a resource from the dimensions file, for example, for your layout height or for values that have a density pixel, but for colors or backgrounds, you can directly choose either drawables, colors, or even mipmaps directly here. So now the separator will be a little more complicated to build. So I'm just going to go ahead and build it. <laughs> so the first thing that we will need for that is to make sure that we have a margin start. So I'm going to set that to 32 dp. And as you see, it won't work. So it doesn't know to which part it should take it. So I'm gonna say it should be towards the edge of the screen. So it should take the parent towards the left as the constraint start. Then I can go ahead and set the margin start. So here I'm going to set it to 32 dp. And now I want this to be underneath my sign in button. So this view is now going to be underneath the sign in button. I'm going to add a margin towards the top of 16 dp. And now I will have this separator. Now, in order to make it simpler, I'm not going to have this or text view in between because I think the video is long enough. I'm just going to make sure that the layout end is to the end of the parent as well. Okay, so this will be the separator now, and I'm going to add a margin towards the right hand side as well. So here margin end is going to be 32 dp. Okay, so now we have this little separator and the user can then select an alternative login option. And what I'm going to use here is another layout. So I'm going to use a linear layout horizontal. Okay, so now let's drag that linear layout in here and you will see it will take the whole available space. So I'll need to change that. Okay, so the what I want to do for it, for this linear layout is first of all, give it an ID. I'm gonna call this one social underscore login underscore parent. And in terms of height, I'm gonna say it should only wrap its content. So only take as much height as it needs for its content. As it has no content right now, it's going to be empty. But I want to have content in there. So how do I put content in there? Well, I can just go ahead and use an image view, for example, here and drag that in to this linear layout. So it's rather difficult, but it works. You can see I can hover it or put it in there. Alternatively, however, you can just drag it into your component tree here in the linear layout and then select the image that you want to use. So in my case, what I'm going to use is this FB login here. So this FB, this one. Now that by itself won't do the trick because our linear layout doesn't have a constraint towards the top yet. Okay, so it has a constraint towards, well, there's no constraints at all. I'm going to add a constraint towards the left and I'm going to add a constraint now towards the bottom of my line here, of this line. Let me see if that happened. Yes, it says top to bottom of separator. And now I need to add a little bit of a distance so I'm going to add a top margin of 16 dp. So now we'll have a little bit of distance. Now, if we look at this image view here, we will see that it has a source compat, but it also doesn't really have a height. Okay, so let's define a height for it. I'm going to say that the width should be zero dp and the height should also just wrap the content. And on top of that, I'm going to add a padding for my image view. So I'm gonna add a padding of six dp. And a background. 
So now let me select the background. It will be the FB button. And as a source, it should use not the FBBG, but the FB logo. Okay, and there we are. So now we can see that it takes shape. So now we have the FB logo in there, but I would like to have another image view in there as well. So let me call this one IV FB. IV standing for image view and FB standing for Facebook. And now let me add another image view in there just underneath it. And this one will be this Google logo. And I'm going to give it a background of this red color, the Google BG color. Okay, and now I need to, of course, define the sizes correctly for this image view as well. So the second image view will be called IV underscore G or Google login or something like that, Google login. And I'm going to refactor that real quick. And now I'm going to add padding to it as well so that it looks a little better. There's a little bit of space inside of it. So it really fills it up. So there we are. So you can see this is now the element, this linear layout, which has two elements next to each other. Now let's define the linear layout a little more because I want to make sure that it's set up so that there is a little bit more space in between, but also that it is not at the edges. So we need to add a margin towards the left hand side using margin start of 32 dp and margin end of also 32 dp. And now in order to create a little bit of distance between the two buttons, we need to add a little bit of margin for our Facebook button towards the right. So margin end of let's say 40 dp. You see now they are a little more distance to each other. So for some reason, let me check with uh, one here. Does it have a constraint? It doesn't have a constraint towards the right. Let me add that. And now at this point, we can add the margins towards left and right for the linear layout. So you can see if it doesn't have the right constraints, setting up these margins is not going to work. So margin start of 32 dp. You have to be really careful when doing that, <laughs> as you see here. And a margin end also of 32 dp and not DO, but DP. Okay, this looks a little better, I'd say. You can see the two icons are next to each other with a little bit of distance. You could, of course, give them a little more padding, but overall, this looks quite good already. And now the only thing that is left to do is to add the last element at the bottom, which says, don't have an account yet, and then sign up. Okay, so how I'm going to do that is with another linear layout like we did here. So I would recommend that you pause the video now and try it for yourself. Okay, so I hope you did that. So I'm going to use a linear layout, which will be underneath the other linear layout that we created. And again, I can't really drag it in there. It doesn't seem to want it. So let's make sure that we set a couple of things up. It should take the whole width, so to speak. And it should only wrap its content in terms of its height. Okay, so now it's going to be super small. Now I can actually drag it there. And it should be underneath the social logorin, uh, login parent. Okay, I gave it the wrong ideas, it seems, but that's fine. And now we can drag that even to the bottom if you wanted to. So now it will always be at the bottom, for example. Or you can also leave that. That's fine as well. Put it towards the left and towards the right. And now in this linear layout, which I'm going to give a name of sign underscore up underscore parent, I'm going to drag the different elements in. So for example, our text view, number one, which will be my text view that I'm gonna call sign up label, sign up label, and maybe like this, sign up label. And let me refactor that real quick. So in terms of width, it's going to wrap its content in terms of height as well. 
Then I'm going to set the account to don't have an account yet. How the text to don't have an account yet. As well as the text size to be 16 SP. And what else do we want here? Maybe a text color of black, text color of black here. And then I'm going to add another text view just underneath it here in the component tree. And this one will get the ID of sign underscore up. Let me refactor that as well. I'm going to continue here. And you see now we have this other text view. I'm going to give it the text of sign up. Now I'm going to also add the text color to be a blue color. Okay, so the blue that I'm going to use is going to be this one here. And this one should be a hashtag in between. So that will be uh, this blue color. Now there are a couple of settings that we need to make for this to be centered because you can see now they are not really nicely apart from each other. So in order to make them centered, I can define it inside of the linear layout. I'm going to add a property here called gravity. So it will define towards which direction it's going to be gravitate. And I want to make sure that the text is going to gravitate towards the center horizontally. And then for this don't have an account yet text, I'm going to add a property called gravity as well. And I'm going to set that to end. So that it goes towards the right hand side because you see currently it goes towards the left. So let me add end and you see now it goes towards the right hand side. Now let's add a little bit of distance between the two texts. Potentially, even though we don't need to, I think it's actually fine. But yeah, we can still do that. Let's do it real quick for our sign up label here. I'm going to add an end margin. So margin end of four density pixels, maybe. Okay, so now there's a little distance between those two. And now what you will also notice is that we don't have a margin towards the top here for our linear layout. So let me add that real quick. Linear layout margin top of 16 density pixels as we have used all the time. And now if we want to make sure that everything can spread inside, we need to make a couple of changes. Okay, so the problem is that we always only added the bottom constraint to the top one, but never the top one to the bottom one. So let's do that real quick. What I want is I want to make sure that this image here is to the top of the login account. Okay, so not just the login to account to the bottom of the image view, but also the other way around. So in order for this to happen, as you see, my editor doesn't even give me this option here anymore. I can't really add the constraint. So I need to type it in manually. So this one will be the bottom to top of. So constraint bottom to top of and then here I need to select this view here. Okay, so how do we call it? We call it text view. It was just the name of text view. Then we go to this login to account and we want to make sure that it's on top of this username. So we need to add a constraint. So here, bottom to top of, and this will be the text view to this ID here. Now let's do, use this one. And you see the constraint just doesn't want to work. So I need to do it manually here as well. So let me add that it will be bottom to top of, so to top of, and here it will be our edit text email address. Then this email address needs the same bottom to top of, and this one was on top of the password label. So here let's select password label. This password label it has a bottom one, as you see, that seems to work. Now this one, 
Let's add one here as well. Doesn't seem to work here. So let's add bottom to top off. And here I'm going to use the checkbox too, this remember me checkbox. Then this remember me checkbox should be, the right should be to the forgot password. And this one, well, they both are connected. So let's just add this remember me to the sign in here. So I'm going to say bottom to top off. And here I'm going to use the sign in. And there was this button here, which I called just button. I didn't give it a different name here. Okay, so now this button also needs to have this constraint. And here it will be the view. Okay, and did I give it the separator name? I called it separator two, or one actually. Now the separator, let's add a constraint layout to it as well. Bottom, not bottom, but bottom to top off. And here it will be the linear layout. So I called it social login parent. And now our social login parent, it has something like this constraint. So it is at the top off, bottom to top off, sign up parent. So here it's this one. And this sign up parent should have a bottom constraint to the bottom of the screen as well. Okay, now once we did that, you can see that our UI is spreading across the board. If we have in our image here, and now at this point, there's only one thing that I still want to change and that is to add to my very top image view here, a chain style. Okay, so here there is something called constraint vertical chain style. And here we have the option to spread inside. So you see it will spread it amongst the screen as much as possible. Alternatively, I can select packed. Then you will see it will put everything very closely together. And then finally I can change spread. Then it will spread it evenly across the screen. And this really makes a difference if you look at it on bigger screens, for example. So you can see it will spread it evenly and will still look very good. Even if you open it up on a huge screen, you see it will still be fine. And the viewers will keep their sizes, even though I seem to have missed or mixed up something here with my added text here. Okay, but overall you see this is the UI that we can build with out even using our code at all. So we only did that using the designer. It was quite an effort as you see, and it is definitely not my favorite uh, tasks to do. That's why I really prefer to use the code. And we're going to definitely use the code more throughout this course because it really is just a matter of practice. And I would really recommend to play around with UIs and that's something that you can try for yourself. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Now you see how you can create your own UI, even a more complex one as this one, using the graphical user interface completely, entirely without using XML code at all. All right, so in this video, I would like to show you how to use a relative layout and what you need to consider when working with relative layouts. Therefore, I'm going to create a new text view in here which will have a width of let's say 100 dp and a height of 100 dp as well. Okay, now I need to of course close this tag for this text view and now this text view will be here at the top left corner. So that's the default value. Now I'm going to give it a background so that we can see it a little better and I'm going to use black as the default color here. So this will be my item and I'm going to give it an ID so that we can see which item it was. And I can call this one, for example, TVA. TV standing for text view. So this is our text view A. And I'm going to give it a text of TV underscore A so that we can see which text it is. And 
even add a text color to it so that we can see it and I'm going to use the color of white. Now the text is there, it's TVA, it's not very big so let me change that as well to change the text size to be something like 25 SP. That's maybe still a little too small, let's use something like 35 SP. Okay, now I would like this text to be centered. In order to make sure that the text is centered, I need to add a property called gravity and center its value. So now you can see TVA is going to be in fact centered. The text will be centered inside of the text view itself. Now this by itself has nothing to do with relative layouts yet, but let's now look at properties of relative layout so that are important inside of a relative layout. And the idea behind relative layouts really is that you can position items relative to other items. So for example, I want this text view to be in the center relative to its parent. So in order to achieve that, I can use the property layout center in parent. What that will do is if I set that to true, it will position my TVA in the center of the relative layout. So whatever space this relative layout has available to it, that's where in the center of this text you will be. Okay, there are other properties, not just this layout center in parent, but for example, layout center vertical. This will position my text view in the center on a vertical level. Okay, now of course, you can do the same thing for horizontal. So layout and enter horizontal, so layout center horizontal, which will now put it in the middle on the X axis, so to speak, in the center. But I want to use layout parent, so layout center in parent. So now, what if I have another text view and I want to position it relative to this first text view? Well, let me call this one TVB. So standing for text view B and the text should say something like TVB. I'm going to change its size to something like 80 dp so that we can in fact see a difference there and maybe also change the color to something like purple. Okay, so now we have this purple text view and if you look at it now it's a block inside of this other block. So both of them are centered in parent and that's why they are both positioned at the same spot. So now if I want to make sure that this text view is going to be on top of, for example, this other text view, I can use a property here called layout above. So layout above, and then I need to define the ID to which this item should be above. So it should be above TVA. So if I use that, you can now see that this TVB block is on top of the TVA block. And that has to do with me adding this property called layout above. Now, if you want this to be to the left hand side, then you can say layout to left off, and this will now position it on the left hand side. If you want to put it underneath, you would use a layout below. And if you want to use it to the right hand side, you would use layout to right of. And now it will be to the right of this other item. So you see, that's how you can basically create these relationships, how they are positioned relative to each other. So TVA is in the center relative to its parent and TVB is relative to TVA, but also in the center. Now let's have another text view here and let's position it to the right of TVB and call this one TVC. So the text will also be TVC and this one will now have a different color. So let's have a look at what the colors we have offered to us. So let's use teal here, for example, teal 700 and this one will be even a smaller box. Okay, so I'm going to make it 60 dp in all directions and the text size should maybe be a little smaller as well. Now this one should be to the right of TVB, for example. So now you see it's relative to this item here. So all three are now next to each other 
and that is because we are using relative values as well as the relative layout here. So if you want to have a little bit of distance between the items, what you can do is of course you can add a property called margin to the text view. So here I can add a margin end, which is a margin towards the right hand side of let's say 10 density pixels. Now this is for our TVB text view. So now it creates a little bit of distance to the next view that is next to it. So it's generating this 10 density pixels distance. Now you can of course add a distance for this TVC, so basically a margin here as well, by calling this margin start and let's say also 10 dp. So now it will push itself 10 density pixels away from whatever is the edge, the defined edge so to speak of the next item that is next to it. So this one TVB has now 10 density pixels distance and TVC has also 10 density pixels of margin to the next item and both in opposite directions which means they meet each other here and that's why we have now 20 density pixels of distance between the two items. So what will happen now if we add another text view to our UI? Where will it be positioned? Just pause the video real quick and think about it. Okay, so if I add a text view, it will be at the top left corner. So if I create this text view with rep content and so forth, and it has a text of hi there, for example, then this will make sure that our text view is going to be at the top left hand corner, which is the default value. Now, if I wanted to position it somewhere relative to its parent layout, we could of course use again, layout, for example, center in parent, center horizontal, or we also have align parent bottom to true. This will now align itself to the parent at the bottom. Okay, so this is another property that you can play around with. It's still going to be at the left hand side, but it will be align itself to the bottom of the parent. And the parent is of course our relative layout, which is the container that now is taking care of the complete layout. Now you can of course also use other types of view groups or containers inside of this relative layout container. So you could of course create a relative layout inside of a relative layout or a linear layout inside of a linear layout. So let me make sure that this one is going to wrap its content in terms of height, but match the parent in terms of width. Okay, so this linear layout now will contain a couple of properties. So let's put this text view here. Inside of this, let's get of this parent bottom. And now this text as you see, it's going to be at the top, of course, but that's because this linear layout doesn't have any properties assigned to it. So let's assign a property here, which will be orientation. By the way, if you don't know what's going on here, check out the video on linear layouts that I created. And here I want to position items next to each other using the horizontal setting. So now if I have another text view in here, you will see that they are put next to each other. And if I do that once again, you can see it's put next to each other again. Now, if I want to move all three of those items because they are inside of this linear layout, I can very easily do so by, for example, change the layout parameters here, for example, layout center. So here, center vertical, for example, let's set that to true. Now you see it will position it just here. Now, there is something that is really tricky with relative layouts, that is that it's quite easy to put elements on top of other elements. So here, you see it's in the same position, basically overriding whatever is inside of the view otherwise. So this high there text, these three high there texts, if I add another one or make this text longer, both will work. I put that in here, you can see it overlaps with the other element. So that's really one of the challenges that you have with the relative layouts and you have to be super careful how you position elements next to each other and so forth. And that's really why 
Google developed the constraint layout to make sure that basically these things don't happen anymore because everything needs to be relative to something else, which is not the case in relative layouts. You can just position things as you want and they will overlap and create some super weird behavior. And that's why we are going to check out how to use constraint layouts next. Not saying that relative layouts don't have their place, they can be very useful, but you have to be very careful when you use them. Okay, so that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to show you how to use frame layouts and what they are used for. So the first thing that you need to take into consideration when you want to use frame layouts is that a frame layout must be in another container or view group. So in this case, the linear layout. It can also be inside of a relative layout or a constraint layout, but it has to have a view group that is surrounding it. Otherwise the frame layout will not work. So here you can then go ahead and enter frame layout if you ever want to use one. You need to define a width and I'm going to use match parent and a height and here I'm going to use 200 density pixels. Okay, so this will be an example of a frame layout that I have here, but this frame layout is basically also a container. So it's very similar to a linear layout in the sense of it can have many different layouts inside of it or many different items inside of it. What it usually is used for is, however, an image with an image or an image with some text inside of it. Okay, so this is basically a 3D layer kind of layout. And if you're wondering what the linear layout is, then definitely check out the video that I created for linear layouts. Okay, so here with this frame layout, I can now put some elements inside of it. For example, an image view. Okay, so you can also use the image view in the designer. So you can just drag it inside of this frame layout and you can select an image that you want to use. So I'm just going to use this avatar or let's use this background scenic. Okay, let's just use that. So here you can see now we have an image view inside of our frame layout, but we can have another image view on top of that image view. So I can put it in here as well. I'm going to use this add a photo icon and now there will be this add a photo icon. It will be also an image view and it will be this little icon there. And now what it will do is it will basically be on top of this image view here. So this means that it's going to be an additional layer. On the Z perspective, it is on top of it some from a Z coordinate point of view. So this image view two here will be layered on top of the image view one, which doesn't have a one here, but on top of this image view here. Okay, and now what you can do is you can change its position by using the gravity here, the layout gravity, and I want it to gravitate towards the right. This will allow me to now gravitate this little icon here towards the right. And it's barely visible here, so you can see it's up here. This view will help you to see that item. And if you want this item to be at the bottom right, then you can add a little bit more to the grid layout gravity and that will be the bottom. So this will now push this item towards the bottom right. It will gravitate towards the bottom right of its parent and the parent is or the frame layout. Now this image view, however, doesn't really look as good as I would like it to be. So what I need to do here is I need to scale it. So I can just scale it using, for example, fit X and Y. What that will do is it will stretch the image so that it fits the X and Y coordinates of the view that it is in. So this little icon that we have here now is going to be on top of this image view that we have here. Now you could have another image view that is on the top left, for example, by using start and start will be enough because the default value is top. Now this needs to, of course, to have an, another ID here, but now you could have these different icons and they will be part of your UI. You could even add on click events to them. So for example, when clicking on this item, the intent could trigger that you can now select an image, for example, to replace the image that you have in this image view here, which is also what we're going to do in the future project. 
Now, if you want to give this image view a little more space, you can of course add a padding. So I'm going to add a padding of, let's say, 20 density pixels towards all directions. And you can see now it has a little bit more space and it's more visible, so to speak, because it's not directly at the edge, but it really is a bigger element. And it's also going to be easier for the user to click on this item because its size is basically a lot bigger. Frame layouts, they're really useful whenever you want to use this kind of concept where you have one element on top of another. It doesn't have to be an image view. It could have been a button here as well. So instead you could have used just a simple button with a width of wrap content and height of wrap content. That would be fine as well. You can see now the button is on top of the image view. So generally speaking, whenever you want to have something layered on top of each other, then use frame layouts. And one last hint, if you ever are in the situation where you want to basically make sure that one layer is not visible at a time, you can go ahead and add an ID to that item that you want to make invisible. So I'm going to call this one button and my button, something like that, really stupid name. And then you can add the property of visibility. Okay, so there is this Android visibility and there are three options here. So visible is going to, of course, make the item visible as it is right now, which is the default value. Invisible is going to make it invisible, yet the item will still take its space inside of this view. So it's not like it's gone, it's still going to be there and it's going to basically request the space that it needs in the UI that you have built. And gone, however, will basically make this item zero times zero small, which basically makes it invisible and gone at the same time. So it's not going to take any space in your UI, it's just going to be gone. So you can trigger this visibility gone in your code and basically make sure that an item is only going to be visible in certain states. You could of course use this frame layout to make this button here at the top only appear after the user has clicked this icon here and selected an image. Then this button could be for example, delete image or reset or something like that. Okay, this is really just a very basic example of how you could use it. This is really up to your own design and your own philosophy that you want to use in your application. Now there's one thing to state, however, is that if you set the visibility to gone, then you will get the yellow background here in your IDE, which basically means that this item is never displayed. So it's never used in your application and therefore is redundant. This would only make sense if you ever access this item and change the visibility back to visible via code, for example. And by the way, in case you were wondering why this is still with the yellow background. That is because I have to make sure that I'm not leaving the button tag open. You could put some stuff in there, but that's not good practice. So you could have used this button tag to add a couple of views in there and some settings in there, but that's just not how it's done cleanly and in a best practice manner. Okay, so let's make this visible again and that would be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to take care of this screen here. As you can see, we can scroll in it. So we are using a scroll view, but you can also see, or maybe you don't see it very well, but this here is an image view, which has an icon on top of it. So we are going to require a frame layout for this part, because that's what you're using if you want to have different layers on top of each other. That's where the frame layout comes in handy. And then we still have this top bar here. So this app bar exists and should be visible. As you can see, this app bar is not scrolling with us. So this part should always be at the top, which means it's going to be at the top of the constraint layout in which we then have the scroll view, in which we then have the frame layout, under which we then have all of those text fields and finally, or edit text. And finally we have this button here at the bottom, which is this add dish button. Okay. And it should always be at the very button. And now the thing that I want to use here is going to be something called Intuit. So Intuit 
is an Android library that provides a new size unit, which is called SDP, which stands for scalable DP, which stands for scalable density pixels. <laughs> okay, so this size unit scales with the screen size, it can help Android developers with supporting multiple screens. Okay, and that's really useful. So this is something that I can highly recommend to use if you want to use SDP. Otherwise, you can, of course, use whatever other solution you want. So that's the idea of SDP. So this is so this is how the same UI would look on different screen sizes using SDP. So scalable density pixels. And this is how it would look using density pixels. Okay, so that's really the advantage of using SDP other than the default density pixels. Okay, because as you can see, this looks a little off and it doesn't really convert well. So it really depends what you want to achieve. So maybe this is the behavior that you do want to have, then it's fine. If you want to have this behavior at the top, then you should use or you can use SDP. Okay, so let's look at how we can use it. As you can see here, there's an example and how you use it is basically use, use underscore and then the number as well as SDP. Okay, so let's go ahead and use it for this particular UI. Let's build that UI using the graphical user interface as much as possible. Okay, so here for, I'm going to go over to this activity, add update dish. If we look at it, we are inside of a constraint layout straight from the start. So let's actually design this thing. And well, actually I think splitting will not cut it. We will need the palette here. And the first thing that I want to have at the top is going to be my bar, which will be a toolbar. So let's search for toolbar. All right, let's put it up here or in here and let's drag it towards the top as well as left and right. Okay, so now we have constraints. So you can see this toolbar was created for us and it is at the end of the parent, well, end of, end of, top and top of start to start off. Okay, so that's what we just created here. Then as we saw, we have a image view, which is inside of a frame layout. Okay, so you can search for frame layout here. Okay, let me put that in here as well. And this frame layout should be to the bottom of the toolbar, as well as to the left and to the right. Okay, so let me check that here real quick. It says to bottom of ID toolbar. Okay, maybe we want to change the name of that toolbar. Each toolbar should have a unique name. I'm going to use the name toolbar add dish activity. And I'm going to add that here to that one as well. Now, inside of that frame layout, I want to have an image view. So it will be inside of the frame layout, right? And here I'm going to use the default image and this image view should match the parent in width as well as in height. Okay, so it should be inside of our frame layout. You can see it is in fact inside of our frame layout, which is great. And then I want to use another image view on top of it as well. Okay, so that one will be a little difficult or more difficult. I'm going to use an icon that we don't have yet as it seems, so we will need to create a new icon icon for that. Let me see if we have that somewhere. Photo doesn't seem like it. We will need to create it. Okay, so before we drag that image view in there, that extra image view, let's quickly create a new vector asset. And I'm going to search for photo here, or actually not here, but here, photo. And I'm going to use this one, add a photo. All right, so that will be the icon. And now I'm going to call that I see add underscore a underscore photo. Okay, so let's create that. It will be inside of the trouble folder. Now we can drag that in there. And I want it to be at the bottom right hand side. So here use this photo. And now let me go to the component tree because this image view, it will need constraints. Okay, so this one is the one where I say it's a little difficult. So that's where you can already see the 
graphical user interface is a little limited in terms of how you can define the UI. And that's why I really like to do it directly inside of the code. So let's add a little bit of code here, which will be that this image view will be at the bottom right hand side. In order to achieve that, I can use the layout gravity and I can use end as well as bottom here. So end and then the pipe bottom will make sure that this icon is going to be at the bottom right hand side. Then for images, you always can scale them. So I'm going to add the scale type here as well, which will be fit XY. So it's going to fit the image into the whole screen. And then you can set a background as a default color, which will be a color that we can just define ourselves. Let me actually define a new color. Therefore, I'm going to open up colors, XML, and I'm going to create a new color, which I'm going to call dish image color or image background maybe, okay? And we are going to require a couple new colors as well, which I'm going to add here, which will be a blue gray, which will be this one, and a gray 900, which will be this value here. Okay, so add those two colors in there as well if you want to use the same colors. And then now we can go ahead and use that color. Okay, so here it was this image background color. Now in terms of IDs, I want to change those. This will be the image view underscore dish underscore image. And this one will be the IV standing for image view underscore add underscore dish underscore image. Okay, and then the next thing that we need in here is to make sure that the image also has a little bit of padding. Okay, I want to have a little bit of padding towards all directions, which I will achieve by using dimen, which stands for dimension. And here I can just use underscore and then the value that I want to use. So this is the one that I was talking about using Intuit, right? To use underscore 16 SDP, for example. In order for this to be available, we need to you go to our build Gradle and make a change there. So let's go over there, build Gradle, and we need to add a new dependency. Okay, so here in dependencies, you could see it earlier, right? So here, if you want to use it, well, you didn't see it probably, but that's the code that we need to use there in order to use this design. Okay, so now we can go ahead and add that in there as well. I'm just going to add that to the implementations here. This is my own implementation that I added. Let me sync it once I added this. And, and once the sync is ready, we can go back to our activity add image. And you can see now underscore 16 SDP is going to work flawlessly for us. All right, now let's go back to the designer. And you can see it stretches the image for us. And you can also see that this little icon appears as well. At this point, I'm realizing that I missed to add something and that was the scroll view because I wanted this image to be inside of a scroll view as well as all of those added text fields underneath it. So let's add the scroll view. Let's drag it in here and now let's drag the scroll view to the top of the frame layout. And if we open up our scroll view, we will see that there is a linear layout inside of it. Now the thing is we cannot drag the frame layout inside of to this scroll view. It doesn't work because the scroll view only accepts one child. Okay, so what we can do is we can drag this frame layout inside of this linear layout. But what I'm going to use instead is going to be a constraint layout for my scroll view. So I got rid of the linear layout, I deleted it, and then I dragged in this constraint layout. Now I can drag the frame layout into the constraint layout. And now we have a constraint layout in which we have a toolbar at the top, a scroll view, and then inside of the scroll view, a constraint layout, which then contains a frame layout. Now at this point, we can go ahead and add all of the other elements, which would be text input types. Okay, so if you search for text input, then you will find this text input layout. So let me drag that in there as well. 
you will see that it by default will be jumping directly into the frame layout, which is not what I wanted. I want this to be outside. So I want it to be underneath the constraint layout. So let me drag that out here in the component tree. And now it will be for now on top. So I need now to define the constraints that I want to use for this text input layout. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it should be at the bottom of my frame layout. At the same time, it should go towards the left and towards the right. So these are the two constraints that I want to add towards the sides. Okay, now there is a little error here. If we have our frame layout, let's look at that. It doesn't have constraints for itself. So what I will do here is real quick, I'm going to add a height and the width for it. So here, width should be match parent and height is something where I'm going to use 200 SDP for it. Now, as I said, this is not going to be enough. We will actually also need to add the different constraints. Okay, so I'm just going to go over to the designer, click on this frame layout and give it the constraints. So I'm going to say it should be towards the top of the parent, towards the left of the parent, as well as towards the right of the parent. Now, if we look at it, we will see that the frame layout has all of those constraints added to it and the error disappears. Okay, so I would say we are going to take care of the text input layouts and finalizing the UI in the next video because it really becomes a long video otherwise. And I'll use a little more code in the next video. So this was really just an example of how you can use the UI to create this. But I personally really prefer to use the code because it's more fle well, you're more flexible there or you have more control over your UI, even though, of course, using constraint layouts can be very useful. And we're going to look into them a little more in the next video as well. Okay, so see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to finalize the UI. And therefore, the first thing that I want to do is to take care of the scroll view a little bit, because the scroll view, we didn't define anything in it. We didn't define a height or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the height should only be zero density pixels. Now you might say, hey, I don't want to have a scroll view that is not visible. Well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill the viewport. And what that will do is it will fill the complete screen. Okay, now we can also define whether we want to have scroll bars or not. I'm going to say I don't want to have any scroll bars here. But then when we do that, we also need to make sure that we have constraints for our scroll view. So you see, once we have defined the specific height that we want to have, even though we use the viewport here, we need to have constraints for that scroll view as well, because it is inside of a constraint layout. Okay, so now what we need to do is we will need to add constraints. And I'm just going to use the same constraints that we had for our toolbar, but I want to make sure that the scroll view is in fact underneath the toolbar. Okay, so we need to make sure that well, we can do it in the designer, of course, which is, in my opinion, a little tricky. So I want it. Actually, this top part should be underneath the toolbar. So you can see now the scroll view will be underneath the toolbar. And we see top to bottom of is the add dish activity. Now the bottom should be to the bottom of the parent. Okay, so we don't have that anywhere. Bottom to bottom, actually, let's try it in the designer. And that will be for that scroll view itself. Now I clicked on the scroll view, you can see this little thingy pop up here, I'm going to drag it towards the bottom. Now it will take up the complete available space. Now, if we test that, let's run it and see how it's going to look like on our device. I also want to show you something else, which is going to be a pretty cool feature that Scrum Constraint Layouts offer. So let me open this up and you can see we have this image, which has this gray background, but then we have this hint, which is an edit text, which also has a gray background. It doesn't look great. So let's change that up a little bit before I will show you a very cool little feature that constraint layouts offer. Okay, and that will be to define a little more for the text input layout, make it a little more pretty, because well, it's not very pretty.
And what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to add a little margin and all of the good stuff. So let's add a margin towards the left-hand side of 16 SDP. So I'm using at diamond slash underscore 16 SDP for the margin start. Then for the margin top, I'm going to use the same thing. So layout margin top will be 16 SDP as well as the margin towards the right hand side. So margin end should also be 16 SDP. Okay, now we can give it a hint. So I'm going to add a hint here and I'm going to use a string here. Now, if we want to use the same strings that I have, you can just download them or you can enter your own strings. So here in the string XML, you can see I have a couple of strings. So the add dish, I think we had that before, but now everything from here is something that I have added. So we have an image content description. We have the label, title, the type, category, ingredients, cooking time and minutes, as well as directions to cook. Okay, so now I you can use that here for the title. Okay, this will be the text input layout for the title. I have defined a little bit of a style for it. Now we can use a different text color. So here I'm going to use the hint text color of a blue gray, which is also a color that we have defined. So if you don't have those two colors, add those to your colors XML as well. And now we have everything else. Let me change the name of the frame layout as well that we're using. So let me refactor that here. I'm going to call that FL standing for frame layout select underscore image. That's what this frame layout will all be about. Now this text input here, this text input edit text. Well, I don't like this name. I'm just going to use edit text. So the thing is like, this is actually just an edit text, but it uses different class there, but basically you can just go ahead and use edit text here instead. Now we can define this edit text a little bit. And before, actually before we do that, I will give this text input layout a little style. Okay, because there are styles that you can choose from. And the one that I want to use is under widget. And actually let me check outlined box. Okay, it's outlined box. Now, which one of those will it be? Oh, there we are. So text input layout outline box in material components. That's the style that I want to use for my text input. You can see it's a slightly different or better style than what we had before. We have a little margin towards the top, left, right, cor hand corner. All of those are there and this looks significantly better. Now this edit text needs an ID as well if you want to ever get the value from it. So we can just call it ET title, standing for edit text title. Now width and height are fine. We need to define the input type for it as well. And I'm just gonna use text here and we need to define text color if we ever want to change that. And I'm going to change that to a gray 900. And finally, the text size, while I'm at it, I'm going to use 16 SDP or maybe something like 15 SDP. Okay, now the hint, the text hint, we have used that on the layout level, so we won't need that here actually. We can get rid of that as well. Now, if we check that out, that's how it's gonna look like. So what I would like to do is I would like to copy this and duplicate it. Okay, so now I duplicated it and you can see it puts it directly into the text input layout, but I actually want it to be outside of it. Now, you see it creates a big mess here. So maybe it's easier to just do it in code directly. Okay, so that's the beauty about using it in code. You can just do this here, click this minus. For some reason in my case, that doesn't do anything. I don't know why, but you can just copy this text here. You can paste it in there. And now the only things that you will need to change are the details that you want to change for that edit text. And one of them will be the name, of course. So it's going to be the type and that should also go for the text input layout. By the way, I realized that this text input layout didn't have an ID. So I'm going to give this an ID of TIL underscore title. 
then this one will also get it an ID, which will be TIL underscore type. Now accordingly, of course, the hint should be the underscore type. So LBL standing for label type and add a text type is fine. Input type text is also fine. Now there is a little change here. So this should be a field which we can touch on, but it, nothing will happen until later on where we define what should happen. It should basically, a selector should pop up where we can then select which kind of food type or dish type it will be. Okay, so here I'm going to make sure that we cannot focus it, which means when we click on it, it will not open the keyboard in which we can then enter the values. So this will be set to focusable false. So we cannot add any text to it. And the same should be happening in the touch mode. Okay, focusable in touch mode is also set to false here. Now, of course, this will be in the wrong position. Okay, because if we look at the constraints, it's still at the bottom of our FL select image. So the type is at the same position as our other element. So you can see now they're on top of each other, which is not what we want. What we do want is that our TIL type top part is in fact at the bottom of our title. Okay, so I added that now, I dragged it in there. It's a little finicky in the editor, but if you look at it now, you can see that the ID is title of which this is at the bottom of. Okay, so the top of this element is at the bottom of that element, which means our type will now be underneath the title. And that's also what we can see here. So now let's run this application to look at how it's gonna look like, because the next thing that I want to show you is a very cool little feature. So let's see. There we are, plus, and we can see we have the title and the type. Now they are very close together. I would like them to spread evenly across the space of that screen. Okay, so across the space that is available to it. How can we do that? Well, what you can do is you can go over to your constraint layout and add a property here, which is super cool. So this is something that you can use if you want to spread things either across or you can, or you want to spread them like next to very close to each other or whatever. So there is this property called layout underscore constraint vertical chain style. Okay, so um, this is inside of the app namespace. So you need to add that here. App layout constraint vertical chain style. And here I'm missing an underscore. So constraint vertical underscore C chain style. Okay, now that seems to work. What this will do is it will take care of spreading elements inside of it. And well, it's a chain style. So chains are a very cool feature. You can check it out here, constraintlayout.com. So what they have are chains. Chains are a specific kind of constraint which allows us to share space between the views within the chain and control how the available space is divided between them. Okay, so here you can see such a chain in action. And now we are activating this chain for ourselves. Okay, so you can have different chain modes. You can use a, either use spread, spread inside or packed. So the code that we need to add is this part here. So this spread, for example. And in our case, we use spread inside. And unfortunately, this only works, or this will only be visible once we have an element that is connected to the bottom, so which is constrained to the bottom. So we can simulate that for this particular test real quick. And that is by adding this to the text input layout, which is currently the type. Okay, so if we look at it, we have those two, title and type, okay? Now, if we run the application right now, what we will receive is that they are really close together. Okay, so it's not spread, the elements are not spread inside of the available space. Okay, so that's what we have now. But if we now go ahead and add a constraint to the bottom, so here I'm just going to add bottom to bottom off, and it will be 
to the bottom of the parent. Okay, now if we rerun this, we will see that now they will be spread inside of the available space. So there we are, and you can see the type is now spread towards the bottom, the title is spread in the center and so forth. So this will be significantly more relevant once we have more elements in there. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this part here. And what I'm going to do is, because now you have seen how all of this is connected, I'm just going to paste the rest of our code in here. Okay, so the rest of the UI. And you can just download it because I really think it's getting repetitive at this point and I don't want to waste your time by showing you repetitive stuff all the time, okay? So I'm going to put that just underneath here, underneath our text input layout that we have created, which is our TIL type and on top of the constraint layout. So it's still going to be inside of this constraint layout. Okay, so what I'm adding here are all of the other fields. So you see we have the title, type, category, ingredients, as well as cooking time and minutes, directions to cook, and the button here which says add dish at the very bottom. So now if we run the code, we will see that we get this design where they are spread across each other or across the available space. So there we are. And as it seems, I have forgotten to add a margin top to the type. But other than that, you see they are spread evenly. Okay, so it takes this margin into consideration, but it also spreads at the same time. Okay, so let's look at that little part and that was type. And actually that didn't help me, but it was this edit text type here. Okay, we have a margin start as well as a margin end, but we don't have a margin top. Okay, so let me add that. And I'm going to use the 16 SP here as well. And now it should be evenly distributed. So there we are. And we can see our UI is basically ready, so to speak. And later on, once we click on this icon here, we will be able to select an image and so forth. Okay, so that's the UI. In the next video, we're going to implement a little bit of code for this as well in our Kotlin files. So see you in the next one. Quick pause. This video is sponsored by our Jetpack Masterclass course, which we've been working on for a couple of months. And this video is basically just part of that course. And if you want to learn everything about Jetpack that is relevant for your future applications, definitely check out the link in the description below. We have created a great course which teaches you to basically use all of the relevant Jetpack components as well as build a real life application, which you can see here. So in the background, you can see the components. We're going to implement most of them in our application here. So you're going to learn how to build those, but we also have separate demos, which teach you the components separately as well. So definitely check out the course and of course you will build this little dishes application where you can store your favorite dishes using the room database. You can delete those dishes or edit them. You can create your own dishes with your own images or the gallery if you have any dishes there and then store it using the room database. And at the same time, use an API to get data from the internet. So here you can load a random dish, which you then can add to your favorite list and then basically see it in all your dishes and as well as in your favorite dishes. Thanks for watching the video. Check out the link in the description for the full course and let's get back to the course. All right, so now let's take care of the back button to actually appear and also work. And therefore we are going to use view binding. So let's go over to the add update dish activity and here we will need to make some changes. So first of all, I want to have a private late init var, which will be my binding variable. I'm going to call this mbinding, which will be the activity add update dish binding object. And in the onCreate, we will need to initialize that variable. So I'm going to initialize it directly here, saying mbinding should be the activity add update binding dot inflate and what is it that we're going to pass to the inflate? Well, the layout inflator. 
And at this point, we can replace this r.layout.activity dash and use mbinding.root. So that basically achieves the same thing, but now overall, our whole class will allow view binding, which now allows us to go ahead and first of all, set up our action bar. And I'm going to create a new function for that, fun setup action bar which will be the one that calls the set support action bar, which is a default method that exists in Android and Kotlin. And here we need to pass the bar. So what is the bar that we want to pass? Well, we called it toolbar add dash or dish activity. So it's this one here, this green bar. Okay, so we're assigning this bar there that's the first part. And the second part is to make sure that our support action bar optional is set to display home as up enabled true, which will allow us to have the back button there. Okay, so this little back button is something that we now also need to set up and we need to add a click listener to it. So once we click on it, something should happen, right? So mbinding toolbar add dish activity set navigation on click listener. Okay, and I'm going to use this one here with the curly brackets. And what is it that I want to execute here? Well, the default functionality of the back button. So on back press is going to achieve the same thing as if we pressed the back button here. Okay, so it should appear here at the top left hand side. And that's what this setup action bar is all about. Okay, so for this to execute anything or run at all, we of course need to call the setup action bar method in the onCreate method. Okay, and at this point, there's only one thing left to do, and that is to go over to our Android manifest. And there it is. And here in the Android manifest, I want to set config changes. And you can see there are a bunch of different settings that you can have here, and I'm going to use orientation. So what that will do is it will prevent restarts when the screen orientation changes. Okay, so let me rerun this and see if we can now rotate our screen or not. Well, we can rotate our phone, right? But it will not change the UI. Okay, you see the UI stays the same. Let me go back. And well, it works for the screen as well because that's the default behavior here. All right, so that's our add update dish activity. Let's move forward with some more functionality in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to take care of this little icon here. So once we click on it, there will be an event triggered. And yeah, let's just take care of that. Therefore, we need to go back to the add update dish activity in which we will implement the view dot on click listener. Okay, so for this to work, you need to import view. So here I'm going to hover over it and press Alt Enter. And you'll see that view dot view will be imported. And now here we have the problem that we need to implement the members. So let's add that. And you can see we need to implement the on click method. All right, there we are. So it is generated for us. And now we can go ahead and define what should happen once we click on our little image. Okay, so here I'm just going to say when the view's ID is going to be, and this is this V here, and I need to surround it with a null check. So if the view is not null, that was clicked. So yeah, now it seems like they have added this to be a nullable. So in your case, it might be a nullable or it might not either way. So you can just surround it with this null check. And then when the ID is going to be our R dot ID dot, and we called it IV underscore add dish image. Okay, so that was this, that was this little image, this one here, this little photo icon that we created. Okay, so because if you click on it, actually, you can get the attribute details and you can see this is the ID that we have here. 
All right. So let's go back over here and now define what we want to execute if that happens. So I'm just going to run a toast saying, well, first of all, we need to pass in the context. Okay. And then what is it that I'm going to say? Well, I'm just going to say you have clicked the image view or on the image view. Either way is fine. Okay, so that will be the toast that we have. It will be shortly displayed and it will show it. Now we also need to return from that point. So get out of this execution because otherwise there might be some errors waiting for us, so to speak. And now before we can actually test this, we need to make sure that we assign the onclick listener to our IV dish image. So we need to use our binding object and here we can access our add dish image and can add an onclick listener to it. So set onclick listener and what should the onclick listener be? Well, we could have implemented it directly there, but we can also just say, okay, this class will be the onclick listener because here we have now defined the onclick events and we have separated, so to speak, everything from the onCreate method. Of course, we could have implemented it directly in the onCreate method as well using curly brackets here. So we could have executed this code there, but I think this way it's a little cleaner. Okay, now we can test the application and see if this is actually gonna work for us. So let's click on plus and here you see you have clicked the image view. Of course, we want to replace this functionality with an actual request where we are actually asking for permission to be able to use images or to make images or select images from the gallery or anything like that. But that's what we're going to implement later on. All right, see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to implement this little custom dialog that you can see here, and then we can select whatever we want to select. Well, you can see that a little text pops up as of now. We're just going to use Toast for that, but overall that's what we want to have at the end of this video, where we implement a camera functionality as well as a gallery functionality later on. Okay, so let's take care of that. So the first thing I will need is a new vector. Okay, so let's create a new vector asset, and I'm going to use the camera, but this time not this plus camera, but this camera alt version here. Okay, let's select that one here. And I'm going to call this IC vector photo camera. Then maybe we also want to change the color a little bit. So I'm going to use this color here. So 38, 8D, 3C. Okay, let's select this color. And there we are. Now we will also need to create a new vector asset for the gallery. And here we can search for image. So I'm going to select this image icon here and I'm going to call this IC vector gallery. And the color can stay the same. Okay. Now we need to take care of the custom dialog layout. Okay, so we can go ahead and just create a new custom dialog layout inside of our layouts. Okay, so create new layout resource file. I'm going to call this one dialog underscore custom image selection. And the root element will be a constraint layout. That is fine. Now let's define this thing. So what I want to have is basically this layout. Let me just paste it in for you and talk over it because I don't want to bore you with me typing all of that in. Basically what we have is the constraint layout with a little bit of padding. Then we are using the RTL chain. What this will do is it will use chains, but it will also spread elements accordingly. Okay. So you can see there's a certain diff distance from A to B and from A to the parent's wall or edge, so to speak, the same goes for B. And in our case, this will be the uh, image selector and this one will be the gallery selector or something like that. Okay, so that's what this chain use RTL stands for. 
Then we have a text view called TV title. Then we match the parent, we wrap the content, and here we need to add a new string. So let's go ahead and create a couple of new strings as well, because we are going to require them for the different elements. So here we have also label camera as well as label gallery. Okay, so let's, let's create those strings real quick. Therefore, I'm going to go over to strings and here title select image action. We'll just say select image action. Then label camera will be camera and label gallery will be gallery. Okay, and now back in the dialog custom image selection, here you see we have this text view, which is going to be the one at the top. So here select image action, as well as the camera and the gallery image. Okay, so here are the values. You can really just download them. As I said, just download the file, the XML file and use it, or you can design it the way you want it. Okay, what's important are going to be the IDs and we can then use them directly in our add update dish activity. Okay, so that will be the layout for our dialogue. Now, how can we actually make this dialogue visible? Well, therefore we're going to require a new function here. So I'm going to create a new function called custom image selection dialogue. Okay, and, and here, first of all, we're going to create a new dialogue object, which I'm gonna call dialogue, and we need to pass the context. So I need to import dialogue for this to work. So here, Android app dialogue is the import that was created for me by using Alt Enter. And then we need to set up the binding object. So here, file binding will be dialogue custom image selection binding which will be a dialogue custom image selection binding where we inflate. And what is it that we want to inflate? Well, the layout inflator. Okay, so basically this is our binding and you can see we have to set up this binding object here as well in our custom image selection because this will be a different binding object, view binding object than our activity update or add update dish binding. Okay, so that's why we need to create this variable. And then we can go ahead and set the dialogue. So it's content view. So what should be visible inside of that dialogue to be binding.root. So the root of that binding is going to be this dialogue custom image selection binding, which is this XML file. Okay, so this is the exact same name, the XML file, as what you can see here. That was created for us through view binding, which is only made possible because we added this implementation in our app.gradle file, if you recall. Or Gradle, here, build Gradle app. We have this view binding to be active. Okay, we set that to true. Okay, so now we set the content view. And the next thing that we can go ahead and do is actually to replace the toast message with displaying that part. So here, we're just using the toast message, super boring, but instead what we can do is we can actually call our custom dialogue. So custom selection dialogue method. Now for this dialogue to appear, we need to show it. Okay, dialogue.show at this point. Now let's go ahead and test this. And as you can see, it's not very happy with my name. Maybe I should rename it, but let's run it first and see if this is actually going to work and then I can rename this variable here. So there we are, click on it and you see it appears. So we can select camera or gallery. Okay, let me re name this real quick. So this should be custom image with a capital I. And now we need to implement the on click events. So how do we implement on click events for our dialogue? Well, we can do that directly in our custom image selection dialogue method. So here we're just going to use our binding object again to implement the TV camera on click listener, and we're going to implement it straight away in here. Okay, so here I'm just going to use a toast 
and the toast is going to use this context and the text will be camera clicked and we're going to do the same thing with our other text view gallery and here it's going to be gallery clicked all right now let's run it again to see if this is actually going to do anything and let's click on it you can see camera clicked and here gallery clicked but it's still open right so this dialog is still visible we can click away and then it will be gone but if you want to make sure that this appears directly when we click on it we can dismiss the dialog at that point okay so dialog dot dismiss here as well so let's rerun this and test it again okay there we are click on it and you see camera was clicked and it disappears gallery is clicked and it disappears now you might have noticed something with the image with both of those images they are pretty small now we can change that by going to our ic vector gallery for example here and change its height to let's say something like 80 density pixels and the same goes for the width so here 80 dp for both of them and now of course i would like to do the same thing for the other image for this one here for the photo camera so here this should be 80 dp for the height as well as 80 dp for the width and because this is a vector it will scale it perfectly so there are no pixels visible here so that's the beauty about using vectors because it's just a path that it creates for us and it does it very well okay now if we rerun this our application should, should look a little better or the image should look a little better here as well as it will be bigger okay let me run this again open it up and there we are so it's roughly the width of the text that is required in order to state the name of that icon so to speak okay that's it for this video i hope you enjoyed it now you see how you can create your own custom dialogues it's actually very easy you can create a design and then inflate that design and then basically use view binding to access the individual ids or elements inside of that design to then run actions such as the on click events all right so see you in the next video welcome back in this video we are going to implement the runtime request for permission because if you want to use any data from your phone or want to use the camera you need to ask the user for permission as a developer okay so that's what we're going to implement so here for example if i select camera this little window pops up and then i can well either allow it while using the app only this one time or deny it altogether okay so uh, let's select while using the app and then it also asks for photos and media on your device so we will give it access to it okay and we're going to use dexter for that because it makes this whole process a lot easier okay so dexter is a third-party library which is pretty amazing when it comes to requesting permissions at runtime so it simplifies this process significantly okay so let's go ahead and implement it therefore we need to go to our android manifest and add a couple of lines here because whenever you ask for permissions or want to use permissions you need to add users permission here okay so i'm going to ask for the read external storage permission okay so that's one of them and then another one uses permission and here it will be the write external storage so i also want to be able to write to the external storage and not just read from it okay and here we need to add a line which will be the maximum sdk version of 28 okay because afterwards it's not really necessary to add that it really depends on the version of the device that the user is using but with this we're making sure that it's going to work perfectly on all the devices as well and then we are asking for the permission for the camera as well okay so that's the final permission that we want to request in our 
complete application. So this is not the actual permission request that we do here. We're just saying in the Android manifest file that we want to request for those permissions at one point in our application. And if we don't do that, well, then this code would be useless, but we will do that later on in our add updates dish activity. Okay, now the next thing is that I would like to use Dexter. Okay, so I need to go to the build Gradle file and I will need to add another line here. So earlier we used Intuit and now we will use the next third party library, which will be Dexter. And well, you can get this code directly from Dexter here as well. So that's what you need to add to your build.gradle file. Okay, so now that we have that, we need to sync this file, make sure that it's actually going to work. And once it's synced, we can go back to our add update dish activity. Now, instead of just displaying this toast, I would like to actually do something a lot more interesting. Okay, so once the user clicks on the camera, for example, I'm going to use Dexter. Now, the cool thing is we can use Dexter because we have implemented this third-party library and Dexter comes with a couple of methods, for example, with context. So we need to pass the context in and then we can ask for permission. So either for a single permission or for multiple permissions. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask for multiple permissions at the same time. So if the user clicks on the camera, we want to ask for all the different permissions that are relevant for our application. So I'm just going to ask for manifest permission dot read external storage. So here read underscore external underscore storage. And in case this doesn't work for you where permission is read, that can be because it has used the wrong manifest. Okay, I don't want to use the Java util jar manifest, but I want to import the Android dot manifest and with a capital N M here. Okay, so now let's see. Now I have access to this permission. Okay, now let's do the same thing with the other permissions that we are going to need and that is to write external storage. And then finally, we have manifest permission. And the one that we are going to require is access camera. So let's search for camera. There we are. Now that is how we define which permissions we want to request. But now we need to add listeners to it. So we can add a specific listener here, which will be the multiple permissions listener. Okay, so let's create a new object here of multiple permissions a listener. This this one here. It also comes from our third party library. So it is really good because it allows us to do all of that or add all of that. And once you implement that, you will see that suddenly this object turns red because it's not happy because you need to implement certain members. So whenever we use this class, we need to implement those members or whenever we create an object from it. So let's implement those and it's on permissions checked and on permission rationale should be shown. Okay, now you see we need to implement those so the one that is going to be called once the permission is checked is going to be for now. What we will do here is we will use the report, which is this part here. So I'm going to recall this or rename this. This is actually a report. This is multiple permissions report. So I'm going to use that report. And because it's a nullable, I'm going to force on wrap it. And I'm going to ask for all permissions. So if all permissions are granted, what is it that I want to do? Well, I'm just going to use a toast here, which will just use the current activity as the context. And the text will be, you have camera permission now. Okay, so that will be the text that will be displayed then. Now the problem with this here is we cannot use this. Specifically, we need to define which this it is. And it is going to be the add update dish activity 
context. Okay, so you need to add this here. Why is that? Well, because we are in a closure. So we're inside of this object of multiple permission listener, and we're not in the context of our complete application anymore. So that's why we need to add this at, and then the name of the activity anymore. Okay, that will now display the toast, and that will be executed if all permissions are granted. Okay, now what should happen if we are asking for the permission rationale should be shown, okay? So first of all, I'm going to rename this to permissions because I don't like this P0 and P1 here. And this one will be the token, okay? Because those names that were given weren't very descriptive. So here I will add a to do because I need to add something. So show alert dialog. Okay, so this is where I want to then display an alert dialog. Now the thing is, this here, so this whole with permissions, needs to be executed on the same thread. Okay, so I want to run this on the same thread and check. Okay, so that's the general code that you need to run whenever you want to ask for multiple permissions using Dexter. So this on same thread is if you want to receive permission listener callbacks on the same thread that fired the permission request, you just need to add this. Okay, so you can also run it without it, but then you will not run it on the same thread. Okay, now at this point, let's actually implement this alert dialogue functionality. Okay, so I will create an extra method for that, which will be private fun show rationale dialog for permissions. Okay, that's the name that I'm gonna give it. And basically what I want to do is just to display an alert dialog. Okay, an alert dialog is something that you have seen probably before, and you will see what exactly it does in a second. So once we have implemented it, I think it will be a lot clearer. Okay, so this will be displayed if the user has not allowed us to have access, for example. Okay, so the user has entered no, and now we don't have access to his camera or whatever. Okay, so what I will display is just a little text here. It's a little long text, but basically what it will say is, it looks like you have turned off permissions required for this feature. It can be enabled under the application settings. Okay, so that will be the message that I want to set. But now that's not everything that you need to set. There is more. So you also need to set the positive button. So what should be displayed on the yes buttons. You can now set up what should happen when the positive button is pressed and also the text that should be displayed. How to do that would be to enter or yeah, write the text that should be on the button itself. So I'm just gonna say go to settings. You should maybe use a string here, which you store in the strings XML file if you want to make this a application that will run on multiple different languages or with different, different languages. So that's really up to you. So what we will need here are two variables that are not going to be really be used. And then we use this Lambda expression, which will try to run some code. Okay, so we're going to start an intent to go over to the settings of that application. Okay, so that's a cool thing because we can now go ahead and say settings dot action underscore application details settings, this one here. And we need to import intent for this to work. Now, the next thing will be to use an URI, so val URI, which will take the URI from certain parts. So first of all, it needs to know the package name of our application. And for URI to work, we need to import URI as well. Then we will pass the package name itself. So first the scheme, which will be the package. So where do we get the URI parts? And then the fragment, which will be null. And then we can add that data to, the U, to this intent and we can start that activity with our prepared intent. So what is happening here? This looks pretty sketchy, pretty complex. Well, the thing is, 
we're using a lambda expression here. This is basically, these are two variables that we're getting. You could give them a name, but they are two variables that we're getting when this positive button is uh, created for us. And what we're saying, we don't need those variables. We're not gonna do anything with them. But then what we will do is we will try to run some code. And what is the code that we will try to run? Well, we're going to create an intent, intent that will go towards the settings, okay? So we want to go to the settings of your phone and where specifically, well, we would like to go to the settings specifically of our application. And that's what we get from here. So we get the application link, so to speak, in your settings based on the package name. Because every application has a unique package name. In our case, the package name will be EU Tutorials Fav Dish. Okay, that's the package name. And what we do is we add that URI to the intent data and then we start the activity. So this will go to the settings and then we can directly save or change the settings in the sense that we can now give permission to the application to access, for example, the camera if the user has not given the permission before. And now this can result in activity not found errors. Okay, so activity not found exception. And I'm just going to run the print stack trace here. So you could of course do something else here, like print it to the user, display details to the user and whatever. Okay, so that's the positive button. So if the user wants to make changes to his permissions that he has given, what if he doesn't want to make these changes? What if he says, yeah, okay, well, I don't need this feature. So what the user would then usually do is he would click the negative button. Okay, so we're going to set the negative button now in which we're going to give the name cancel. The button will have that name. And in this case, the variable that we are given, as I told you, there are two variables that are given to us and we don't use them, so we can use the underscore. But in this case, we actually want to use the dialog that will be given to us and we want to dismiss that dialog. Okay, so dialog dismiss. And now we need to show that whole thing, which means it will show this alert dialog, this entire alert dialog. Why don't we need to dismiss the dialog in this particular case? Well, that's because we are moving over to another application, which means we are moving over to the settings application. That's why we don't need to display or dismiss the dialog because it's not being displayed on the other application. Okay, and now we can actually call this method and that was here in the to-do. Okay, so now let's run our application and see if it is actually going to ask for permission. And it will only do that, by the way, in one particular case. And that is if when we click on the camera, because we don't have implement, we didn't implement it for the gallery here. Okay, so let's go over to this other screen. Let's click here, camera, click on it. And let me deny it. Okay. So you saw that, let me click on it again, camera, and you see this is the alert dialog. Okay, so I had to deny it for this to be appearing. So why did it appear? Well, because we didn't have access to that feature. We didn't have access to the camera. And that's where this part is going to be called. So this here, on permission, rationale should be shown. That's when it will be shown. Okay, so let's go back here. Let's go to settings. And now you see it directly moves us to the settings of our favorite dish application. So here you can directly go to permissions because otherwise it would be a chore. The user would have to go to settings manually, search for our application, then click on our application, then change the permission settings. So we now have a very clean way of showing the user or they're basically sending the user directly to the settings where he can then allow the permission. So here, for example, we can now ask every time. We can add that, for example. Okay, now let's go back to our application. Let's ask for the camera. And at this point, nothing really happens. Okay, so as you see, we will only display you have camera permission now if all permissions were granted. Okay, but we didn't grant all permissions.
Now it doesn't show this text because we don't have all permissions granted. So we would need to now grant all of the permissions for this to be shown. Okay, so you can now of course say if all permissions aren't granted, so in the else case, you would still show this rationale dialog permission. Okay, let's rerun this because in my case, it didn't appear for the second time that I clicked on it, for example. So I'm gonna click on that and click on camera and you see now because we didn't give all permissions now it will be displayed but that's not something that you will necessarily want because potentially you really want to only display it once so now let's give all permissions here well actually at this point i don't want to give all permissions but i'm going to allow only while using the application okay for now and now if i click on the camera well, it will still not display because I didn't give access to the other functionality. Okay, so this is not necessarily something that you want to have. It really depends on the sec well, structure that you set up. Okay, now a little challenge for you. Set up the same thing for the other button. So for this TV gallery. So pause the video and try to implement it yourself, please. Okay. So I hope you tried it. Basically, it's going to be the same thing. And I'm just going to paste the code in here for you to see. So I'm going to put it in here. Okay. So what we need is we need to have the context again. So Dexter with context with permission. And now we are asking for the external storage as well as the well writing and reading of external storage. Here we also asked for the camera. Now we also have the listener, which will be a multiple permissions listener and on permission checked. So if the permission was given to all permissions that we asked for, then we will display this little text, which will say you have the gallery permission now to select an image. And on permission rationale should be shown. We also call our show rationale dialog for permissions. Okay. And that's basically it. So let's run it again and see if it will ask us for the permission for the other parts of the application, which means the gallery. Okay. So gallery, well, the thing is because we already denied it, it's not going to ask for it directly again. So we manually implemented this. So let's add this permission to files and media as well. And now at this point we should have access to all of the features that we need for our application. By the way, one little side note that I haven't covered in the video, and that is that for now, on for some reason on my emulator, when I click on camera, it doesn't show the camera functionality. So this toast doesn't appear. But if you test it on your device, you should on your phone, for example, on your real phone, you should get this toast. Okay, so on the emulator, for some reason, this code doesn't execute correctly. And by the way, why would you ask for all of those permissions when only wanting to use the camera? Well, the thing is, throughout the process of this whole basically application, you will require to also be able to write to the external storage as well as read from it. Because when you click on the camera and you want to store the image, well, you need to be able to write to your device. And yeah, that, that's why you need to set it up. Okay, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to implement the actual camera functionality so that the camera pops up, we take an image and then this image is stored here in this image view and where it is displayed there. So selecting camera, then this pops up as you can see, and then you can move around to take another image. So for example, hold W while holding Alt will move you forward. So let's make an image or take an image of that cat, I'm going to save that. And you can see now we have that image up there. Okay, so that's the result of this video. In order to get there, I want to make a couple of changes to the code that we created last time first, because there are a couple of things that aren't working perfectly yet. And that is specifically because of this line here. And we are accessing the external storage, which is fine, we want to do that but it works differently in the latest API levels. Okay, so 
in API level 30, if you hover over it, well, it doesn't display it here, unfortunately, but basically this is not required anymore in the latest API levels. So if you ran this code on your older device or on a device that uses an older Android version, this will work. Okay, so this statement here will work. But because we want this to work on newer devices as well, we need to comment this line out. And now this toast should work. Before we do that, there is one more thing that we also need to change real quick. And that is the same thing when we ask for the permission when we click on the gallery. Okay, so here, instead of asking for multiple permissions, we are only going to ask for the read external permission. Now with that in place, we need to make a change here to our multiple permissions listener here as well, because we are only listening for one permission. And that will be the permission listener that we need to implement now. Now, of course, the methods don't fit correctly anymore. So we don't need to have this on permission checked anymore. However, well, let's just implement the methods that are going to be there by default. So implement members, let's add all of those. And these are going to be the ones that we will require here. So on permission granted, I'm just going to display a toast. You have the gallery permission now to select an image and then if the permission was denied, then I'm going to display, you have denied the storage permission to select image and then on permission rationale shown. So if we want to display to the user that, well, basically our rational dialog permission where we tell the user that he didn't activate the permission and we need it for the application. Okay, so this will be the changed code for our TV gallery. And now there is one more thing that I would like to change and that is this part here. Okay, so I use this report double exclamation mark because, well, this is a nullable, right? There's a question mark here. Now you can do that, but this is not the cleanest way to do it because potentially report could be empty and then, well, our code would crash. So if you want to make sure that this is definitely going to work and not crash, even though maybe report is empty. Well, in that case, it won't execute the code, but in order to really make sure that everything is fine, you can surround it with a let. So you say report question mark dot let, and then in the brackets, you execute the code that you wanted to execute. So now you will see that you don't need the exclamation marks here anymore because we only execute this code here if report is not empty. So that's basically what we do with this report, not empty, then execute this. And that's how you do it with this let. Okay. So, but now instead of displaying those toasts, I want to actually, well, execute some interesting code, which means I want to open up the camera. And in order to open the camera, we need to start an intent and you can do it using intent media store dot action image capture. And this allows us to capture an image. Now we need to start at activity, but not just like that, but for a result or with a result, because we want to also have the camera details, well, the image that was taken basically, and we want to store that. Now here I'm going to use my camera ID. So this should be one, well, you can, you can use any number, any request code number. I'm just going to enter camera here and I will also create a companion object for that. Okay, so you can do that at the top of your class or at the bottom, either way is fine. So I'm just going to add a companion object which will contain my fixed variables or my constants, so to speak. Okay, so const val will be camera and I'm going to set that value to one. Okay, so this is just a cleaner way. You could have, of course, just entered one, but the idea is that you can have multiple activities for result. And in our case, we will have multiple start activities for result. The other one will be, for example, when we select an image from the gallery, then we will have a different request code. So this one should be a different one because we need to know 
what the activity result intent was. So what was the goal of opening this thing? And then also we need to know what was returned to us, what kind of information was it that was returned to us. And then accordingly, we are going to make changes to the code then. Okay, so then if you do that, so use activity for result, you need to also have a ver variable that will take care of the result that we get. Okay, so on activity result, that's the one that we need. And now, what is it that we want to execute here? Well, I want to check if the result code is that it was successful. Okay, so activity dot result okay. This means that we opened the activity, which means we went over to the camera and then we came back and everything went fine. And then we check if the request code, well, in this case, the request code will be our camera. And here, this is the camera integer that we created, okay? So if the request code is that camera request code, and that's that one that we passed when we started the activity for result here, if that's the case, then we want to assign the image that we have taken to the image view that we have in our UI, okay? So activity add update this, this UI here. We want to update this image there. And we will need a new variable for that. I'm going to call it thumbnail, which will be of type bitmap. So I need to import bitmap here, import. And then we can get the data that was sent to us. So here, this intent data. And now, again, this is something where you can use data let so this code will only be executed if data is not empty and then we get the extras from that data and specifically well the thing is extras can also be or is also nullable so we get the data there that's the name of it as a bitmap Extras can be in nullable as well. So let me add extras here. So now we're checking the extras as well as the data. And at this point, we can add those exclamation marks because we know that it will not be empty. Okay, so data, extras, exclamation point, two of them. And then we get the data as a bitmap. And now we can use our binding object to set the image. So IV add, well, it was IV not add, but dish image. That was the one. And we set the image bitmap to be our thumbnail that we created. So this variable here. So now if we execute that, let me run it. Then we will see that we can now in fact take an image in our own application. So this was the final result that we wanted to achieve. So this is the one that we're building right now. Our favorite dish here, let's go over. Let's take an image, go to the camera. You see the camera opens up. Now let me take another image, this one from the TV screen, taken and received, and there we are. So now our image has been stored inside of this or displayed inside of this image view. Now there's one thing that I want to change as well because this little icon here is now not representing what we actually do. So we want to now edit an image instead of add an image. Okay, so what we can do is quickly add a new vector image. So here I'm going to create a new vector asset. And here I'm going to search for pen. That didn't do it. Then, well, actually I'm searching for the pen part. And here you can search for edit. It's this one here. So I'm going to select that and the color that I'm going to use is going to be white. So six F's is going to be the trick or it's going to do the trick for us. And I'm going to call this vector edit. All right. So let's click next and finish. Now we have a new vector file. And what we can now do is we can now replace this image here with the edit image. Okay, so I'm just going to Go ahead and once it was set, well, actually we can do it directly in here and binding 
dot iv at dish image set image and here it's not going to be a bitmap but it's going to be a drawable which we get from our resources folder okay you could have also used image resource but image drawable is going to do the trick for us and here we need to use the context compat context compat get drawable and then what is this drawable well we need to pass the context as well as r dot drawable dot ic vector edit okay and let me put that into two lines so it's a little more readable so there we are so this is going to make sure that now the image will also be changed once we have selected an image okay so let's test that and let's see if this is actually going to work and if that's the case then we can move over to the next video okay so let's see go over here select an image or take a camera well open up the camera take an image store it there and you can see now the icon has been changed now it's the edit icon which basically means okay now we can just select a different image and i'm just going to move around well i preferred the dog so let's take an image of the dog here all right and there we are our dog is there all right so that's it for this video see you in the next one welcome back so now let's take care of the permission for our gallery because i want also to be able to select an image from the gallery instead of having to take a photo because well some people just don't want to take new photos they already have them in their gallery and that will be fine as well and as you might know from my other courses i really like to have homer simpson in my application so i'm just gonna select that image and you can see now we can also select images directly from the gallery okay so in order to implement that we need to follow some simple steps it's always the same basically the first thing is you need to make sure that you have an extra constant for your gallery so that you can in fact know which request was the activity for result request because we are going to need another start activity for result request and we did that once here as you can see with the request code camera we will need to do the same thing with the other request code which is our tv gallery request and here that should be happening once we have the permission granted and instead of saying that we have gallery permission we can now actually select an image this would be very similar to what we had with the camera so i'm going to call this gallery intent which will be a new intent being intent dot action underscore pick this one here and then we need to pass the media store so i'm just gonna put that in the next line media store images dot media dot external content uri okay so that's the line of code that you will need in order to create that intent and now you need to start that intent and we're going to start an activity with that intent and we're going to ask for a result so we're going to wait for a result basically and here we can pass the gallery intent that we just set up and we can pass the request code which was the gallery request code which is basically just the number two okay so that by itself will allow us to select something from the gallery but if we run that well it will not store the image directly in our image view so in our on activity result we already used this if statement with the result code being result okay and then if the request code was camera then we would set up the details there so the thing is it will be very similar in this case so we can actually do the same thing here if the request code is going to be gallery and instead of using this part here we will need to use a new selected photo URI. We need to know the directory at which this image is, so the link, so to speak, on the device, and that is data.data. .data. So this is a little confusing, but if you look at this data here, it is the data that is given to us as a result 
once the activity came back. So once we selected an image, we get the result code as well as the request code with which we started the request that was two. Result code will be, for example, OK, and then we get the data. So what is this data going to be? Well, it's going to be, it contains this data property, which is, as you can see here, a URI. So it returns a URI. This will be the selected photo URI, so the link to the image. And now we can set that image based on not a bitmap, but based on a URI. Okay, so set image URI. There is an extra method for that. And we can now pass our selected photo URI for that. Okay, and then here we do the same thing where we bind the image to be the vector edit that we created last time. And now, of course, we have this result code being activity result OK. But what should happen if the result was not OK? So we can check here if the result code is activity dot result cancelled. So if the user cancelled the operation, so he started to select an image, but then he didn't do it in the end, what we can do is we can just select a or write a log entry and it will be cancelled and the message will be cancelled. You can of course give it a better name here, more descriptive. We also need to import log for this to work. So yeah, the message could be user cancelled image selection. And then there is one more thing that we need to change. So we copied this whole thing, right? This whole code. And as you might recall, we used the extras from the data that we get. Now, in this particular case, in our gallery request code case, we don't need those extras. We're not going to use them. And this will also create a problem where if the extras are in fact going to be empty, which they will be in our gallery case, then all of this code will not be executed. So we need to get rid of that as well. And now let's run our application and actually see what's going to happen. Okay, so let's go over. Let's select gallery here. Let's select Homer. And there we are. So now we have Homer Simpson as our dish image and he creates the best dishes. Okay, that's it for this video. And yeah, as you might have noticed, we are using Dexter here instead of, let's say, the default approach of Android Jetpack, where this whole permissions stuff would be significantly more tedious. Okay, so Dexter really takes away a lot of work, even with Jetpack, which made it better. But still, Dexter does the trick, and that's why we're using it. Okay, so this is a Jetpack course, but still, if, if there are libraries that make our life even easier, rather than using the Jetpack default functionality, why wouldn't we do that? All right, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. Quick pause. This video is sponsored by our Jetpack Masterclass course, which we've been working on for a couple of months. And this video is basically just part of that course. And if you want to learn everything about Jetpack that is relevant for your future applications, definitely check out the link in the description below. We have created a great course which teaches you to basically use all of the relevant Jetpack components as well as build a real life application, which you can see here. So in the background, you can see the components. We're going to implement most of them in our application here. So you're going to learn how to build those. But we also have separate demos which teach you the components separately as well. So definitely check out the course. In the course, you will build this little dishes application where you can store your favorite dishes using the room database. You can delete those dishes or edit them. You can create your own dishes with your own images or the gallery if you have any dishes there and then store it using the room database and at the same time use an API to get data from the internet. So here you can load a random dish which you then can add to your favorite list and then basically see it in all your dishes and as well as in your favorite dishes. Thanks for watching the video. Check out the link in the description for the full course and let's get back to the course. All right, so let's look at Glide. And first of all, what is Glide? Well, Glide is a fast and efficient image loading library for Android focused on smooth scrolling. Glide offers an easy to use API, a performant and extensible resource decoding pipeline and automatic resource pooling. So this is the coolest part, in my opinion, because it really helps us to 
just use Glide in many different cases, no matter what the source image is like. Okay, so if it comes, for example, from a link or if it comes from the file system of the device and so forth, it really is super smart. It understands directly what to do with whatever we're giving to it, which is always going to be an image, of course, but we can give it in different formats. So basically you can see you use Glide with the fragment in which you want to display it or the activity. Then you load, for example, the URL, and then you say into which image view you want to put that image. And that's basically it. It's really one line of code, basically, which is enough for you to assign an image from a website directly into your application's image view. Okay, so let's have a look at that in an actual project. And by the way, I would really recommend to check out the documentation. There you will find a lot more. There's also a GitHub repository where they show you what to do. So first of all, you need to make sure you have these repositories as well as these dependencies. So let me go ahead and create a new demo here, new project, and I'm going to use the empty activity, the default one. I'm going to call this one Glide Demo. You can call it however you want. We're going to use Kotlin here and the minimum SDK API 21 as usual. And then once the project is loaded, you can go to the Gradle file. So the build.gradle file, the app one in particular, make sure that you have the right dependencies included, which are the ones that we just saw. And it's this line here where you need to make sure to add Glide from com.github.bumptech.glide as well as the compiler with the annotation processor. So we need to add those two dependencies and then of course sync it. So click sync now. And now you can use Glide in your application. So the next thing that I'm going to set up straight away is going to be in my manifest. I'm going to add the permission request for internet because I need to make sure that I have internet permissions in order to basically load an image from a URL and display it in my application. So the next thing that I will do is I'm going to get rid of this text view here and instead I'm going to use a couple of image views. Okay, so I'm just going to paste them in here. You can follow along if you want, but basically this is really just for demonstration purpose. It says, so here inside of the constraint layout, I'm going to put the three image views. So one of them is going to be called image one, the second one image two, and the third one image three, and all of them will have a width and height of 150 density pixels. And that's how the UI will then look like. So you have three image views here. It's really not about making a nice application, it's really about how to use Glide in this video. Okay, so once you have that, the next step would be to have a URL that you want to display. And this URL can come from many different sources. You could get that from an API. You could get that from whatever source you have, okay? The user could select it, for example, on the device and so forth. So I'm just going to use this image here, which is just a generic image URL. And I'm going to store that in this image variable, which is going to be of type string, of course. So you can see this is just this image that if you check it in the browser, will be this image here of our little Android with a little gradient. Now, the next thing that I need to set up are going to be the images. And I could use view binding here, but I'm just going to use find view by ID here to keep it simple. And if you want to know more about view binding, check out my video on it. I created an extra video explaining the different approaches that you can take. But for this very simple example, it's really not worth the effort to set up view binding. Okay, so we are going to find the view by ID for image one, image two, and image three in order to make sure that we have access to all three images throughout our application. Now let's use Glide here. And that will be the part where it's super cool because as you saw in the documentation, you just need to pass the context, in this case, the activity, in the case you are using a fragment, then it will be the fragment. Then you just need to say what you want to load. And as you see, it can be a bitmap, it can be a drawable, it can just be a string, a URI, which means a directory on your device or a URL. It can be a file, a raw resource, a draw resource, and it can even be a model of type byte array or even any. So 
you can throw in so much different stuff in here. It says URL is crossed out here, but I'm still going to use my image URL here from the top that I have there. And then I just need to say where I want this image to appear. And I want this image to be appear in my image one, which is basically this image view that we have here. Okay, so this is the image view one. You could call this image view one if you wanted to make it a little more precise, but well, that will do the trick. Now let's run our application and see if this is going to work for us. And you can see it took care of the work for us. And that is really super cool because we didn't have to use all of this boilerplate code of downloading this image, then making sure the format is right and all of that. Nope, everything was taken care of by Glide. So really, really powerful tool. Now let's look at another example. Let's take care of image two. Therefore, I'm going to use with again, then I'm going to load the image once again. And this time I'm going to give it a couple more settings. So for example, I can make sure that the image is fit towards the center. So if you have different formats for your images, for example, you can fit it into the center. Then you can, for example, crop it in a circle format, or you can use a center crop. You see there are different kind of options what you can do. So there's a lot going on here, you see. You can set the thumbnail and there's a lot going on. So really, I would recommend to just play around with it. So I'm just going to use circle crop here. And then I'm going to even add a disk cache strategy. And here I can define the disk cache strategy all. What this will do is it will set the available caching strategy for the media and caches remote data with both link data and link resource and local data with the resource only. So basically what this will allow us to do is to cache the data. And then I'm even going to use a placeholder here. Okay, so you can see there are placeholders, either a resource ID or a drawable that you created beforehand, but I'm just going to use the resource ID here. So I need to have an image in my project. So therefore you can go over to your drawables and you can of course use your IC launcher background as a default image, but I'm just going to use an image that I've prepared here, which is this image that I'm gonna paste in, this image placeholder, which is this image here. So you see, we got it from html.com, pretty good image, 300 times 300, very good stuff. So here I can now go ahead and just use my image placeholder. Of course, I need to say where it's from. It's from our drawable dot, and there we have this image placeholder. And if it doesn't appear correctly straight away, you just need to re-enter the name because it didn't find it straight away. And now the most important part, of course, is to say where I want this image to appear and I want it to appear in the image view too. So image two will be the image view. Now let's rerun the application. And you will see now you have a rounded image. I can tell you it's a pain in the butt to create a rounded image without glide. It's really hard. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of code going on if you want to achieve this same functionality and behavior. And that's really the beauty of glide. Glide takes care of that and just does it for us. Really, really powerful tool. I can really recommend to use it. So now let's look at the third example. All right, I'm going to basically use the same image once again here, load the image. This time, however, I'm going to override. So I'm going to override the width and height. You see there are different kind of options you have here, override height, override width, or override both of them. So I'm going to override both of them and I'm going to say, okay, I want to use the size of 300 times 400, for example. And I want to center crop the image. You see there is also center inside, for example, as an option. And then if there should be an error occurring, I'm going to say, okay, if there is an error, just go ahead and use my replacer image. So my placeholder image. And of course, put it into the image 
three. So here into image three. Okay, let's run this again and see what kind of result we get. And you can see now we have the image in this format. So we changed the width to 300, the height to 400, and that is basically it. Now there is something that you will notice potentially. So if you look at this and you yeah, basically remember how we set up the image width and height, you see that we used 150 density pixels here. And then you can already see that this, what we used here were pixels and not density pixels. So here we use 300 pixels as the width and 400 as the height. Here at the top we used 150 for both directions, density pixels and not pixels. And this is really showing you the power of density pixels versus pixels because on a different device, on not the 3A for example, this would have looked very differently. Okay, so this might have been much bigger image on a device that has less pixels, for example, in general. So this depends on the pixel density of the device that you're using, of the screen of the device that you're using. Okay, and that was basically the introduction to Glide and a couple of things that you can do with it. There is a lot more that you can do and you can even wait for the image to load and then only execute code once the image is loaded using a listener. So this will then allow you to basically add a request listener here and only execute what is inside of this listener once the image is actually loaded. Because this can take a while depending on the internet connection, the speed that you have there. Okay, so now I would like to show you real quickly what this error is because I believe that this will be interesting because, well, I explained it, but Let's actually see how this is going to take place in our application. So therefore, I'm going to uninstall this application so that th there's nothing in the cache because these images, they will be in the cache even if I rerun the application. And now let me use a slower internet, something like 3G, UMTS. Okay, if I run the application now, it will first of all load this placeholder, which is there by default as we set it up here as a default placeholder. But here, it's only going to use this image once there is an error. So only once this error occurred, this placeholder was set there. So you see, it's probably a little too slow, this internet, to run these images or to download these images because they're just too big. So then instead we can use, let's say, LTE here. And let's rerun the application. And you can see with LTE, the placeholder was displayed here in the middle. The error never occurred and the images were loaded as soon as they were basically downloaded. So as soon as our device downloaded them and you also saw that they were all loaded at the same time. So it didn't download the image once again and again for each of the entries. It just had them in cache and then just set them up for the different image views. Okay, so I think this is in depth enough for a Glide demo. We're going to learn a lot more about it in the course, so see you there. Welcome back. In the last video, we implemented the functionality to select an image and populate our image view with it. And in this video, we're going to use a third-party library to do the same, even though it is not going to save us too much code, at least for now, in terms of the overall code that we will need for our application, but it will be significantly better once we are using any type of downloads from the web in order to populate an image or something like that. Okay, and that's where this tool comes into play. Glide is going to be really helpful when, it, when we're there. And in order to use Glide, you just need to add those repositories or make sure you have them and add those dependencies here. Okay, so let me go over to my project and make sure that I have those dependencies in my Gradle file. So here, build.gradle, and I'm going to add them here. And then in the other build.gradle file, we need to make sure that we have those two repositories. So Google as well as JCenter. And in my case, they were there already. So in case they aren't for you, then you need to add those. And by the way, I have, for some reason, I have these 
lines twice, so this navigation as well as the fragment. So let me sync that once again. And now we can go ahead and use Glide. Okay, and where would we use Glide? Well, at the point where we used to set our image and that was in the activity result or on activity result method. So here, the thumbnail, that was the data that we received. And now instead of using this particular code here to set it, we can just use glide here. So glide.with and here we need to pass in the context and alt enter in order to import glide. So we need to pass in the context and then we can load an image. And which image do we want to load? Well, we want to load this thumbnail image. And then we can define how we want to display the image. So in my case, I want to center and crop the image, which will look a little better to what we have right now. And then I'm going to add where I want to put this. So I want to put it into mbinding.iv dish image. Now you could of course also add a line here. As you can see here, there are a bunch of options. So what would here be very interesting is to add a placeholder. So if you have a placeholder available, that would be an option where you then would just use the image directly here. Okay, but I'm just gonna leave it for now because we have our gray background for our image view, which is fine. So you see, it's basically the same thing that we did here, but now we will crop it correctly so the image will look a little better. And this is generally very useful, especially once you have online usage or when you load the data online or something like that, which we will do later on as well. Okay, so that's part one. And the second one is of course, for our photo that we have from the URI. And that's really the cool thing that Glide takes care of the data source type for us straight away. So it doesn't care if we give it a drawable or if we give it a URI, it will understand what it needs to do with it. Okay, so here, before we had to now use set image URI. In this case, we set image bitmap and we always needed to find the right method for the format in which we have the image. And now Glide will take care of whatever data it gets and will make an image out of it. At least if it is a data that is in fact an image. Okay, and the binding was going to be the same. We want to do that for our image view dish image. Now let's run the code to see if our application is still gonna work or if we are gonna run into problems here. You could see that Homer was a little stretched potentially, especially once we took the image earlier and not the one that was Homer, but the actual camera image, so to speak. You saw that it was somehow distorted and that's something that I want to avoid and that's hopefully where Glide will help me out a little. Okay, so let's take an image of the dog once again and let's select it and you can see it centered it and cropped the image so that it fits into the screen, which is in my case specifically what I want, but of course you can use a different method here. Instead of center cropping it, you could center inside, fit center, optional, yeah, there are a bunch of different options. You can just play around with them and decide which one you want to use for your particular image. Okay, so that's it for this video. Now you've seen how to use Glide and how quickly we can adjust this. And by the way, here we also set it up. So if we look at the image here, you see the scale type was fit X, Y. That's the type that we defined here. But there are of course other options here, center crop, center inside and so forth. But there you need to define it in the XML file. And the cool thing is here, you can do it in code straight away and override whatever you have written in the XML file. Okay, so see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to take care of actually storing that image because this image here is not really stored on the device. Well, it is available in memory, so to speak. So. It is inside of this image view, but once we get out of this application, this image will not be available anymore because if you look at the gallery, and I have the gallery open somewhere. Nope, doesn't seem like it. I have Homer Simpson there. So if you open up the gallery or you go to photos here, you will see that in my case, it only shows one image and that is the Homer image. So there are no other images, even though we have just taken an image with our camera. 
okay so earlier the dog and so forth okay so what i would like to do now i would like to actually store the image and we're going to in this video take care of displaying the uri at which the image will be stored okay so we're not going to then permanently have it in here but we will have it permanently on the device in the gallery in order to do that we will need a new image directory so we can define a constant variable here so private const val which i'm going to call image directory okay so you can define your own image directory for your images and i'm going to call this five dish images and this will be basically the folder so to speak in which our images are going to be stored okay the next the step would be to create an well an extra function which will take care of saving an image to the internal storage so private fun save image to internal storage and we will get that image as a bitmap and we will return a string or this method will return a string and the idea is that it will return the absolute path of that file that we have stored so how do we do that so first of all we will need a context wrapper that context wrapper is going to take the application context so that it knows where well to, to which application this bitmap that we're trying to store is assigned to because it needs to know that this is an image that was created with our favorite British application and then we can initialize a new file so we can create a new file var file by using that wrapper now so wrapper get dir dir stands for directory and this should need not be a warper but a wrapper and here we need to pass in the image directory variable that we created earlier and the modus so in this case we have multiple modi and i'm going to use the mode private so what is mode private you can click on it by pressing control and the file creation mode the default mode where the created file can only be accessed by the calling application or all applications sharing the same user id so this image should then only be accessible via our application there are other contexts you can just check them out here mode append mode above client and so forth i'm just going to use mode private here okay then we can use that file object to set it up or override it with an actual file okay so here we need to import file and this file object needs to know first of all which file it should store and this file has two different constructors so either a uri or a string okay and we're going to pass the file itself that we prepared this directory so the location as well as now we need to give it the name of that particular image okay so this here basically is the folder in which we want to store it and now we need to give this image that we want to store a real and unique name and in order to do that i'm going to use a string here which will use uuid this is going to give us a unique id so to speak and then i'm going to randomize this so i want to have a random image which will be of type jpeg or which will be well that will be the name it will store the image as jpeg Okay, and now the next part is going to be to actually create an image out of that bitmap that we are passed. Okay, because here we set up everything for the file, but now we need to do the magic actually. And we can do that within a try catch block because something could go wrong here. For example, the bitmap couldn't be incorrect or something else could run into errors here. So here we're going to need an output stream which will be an object of file output stream and it needs to have the file okay so we prepared a file output stream with our file which basically is where we want to store it with which name and now we can go ahead and compress our image that is passed to us our bitmap because bitmap is a format of images right and here we can then define the compress format okay so here bitmap dot compress format dot 
JPEG, for example, and the quality that you want to have. So if you want to have a super high quality, basically the quality in which the image was taken, you would use 100. You can also use 90. That would reduce the quality a little bit, which is still fine. And here we now need the stream. So that's why we prepared this output stream because we needed it for our bitmap to be compressed. And then we can flush our stream because we're done with the compression process. So we need to make sure that we flush it and close the stream because otherwise the stream will be open all the time and this is not very good. This is something that you should avoid at all cost. It's like a connection to the internet when you download something and you keep the connect download connection, so to speak, open, that's also not a good thing. So the error that can occur here is going to be an IO exception here. So input output exception. And in that case, we're going to print the stack trace. And then finally, we can actually return the files path. So return file dot absolute path. What that will do is it will now return the directory in which the file exists as well as the name of the file itself. And it, this file will then be our compressed image, so to speak. Now I will need the location, this path, so to speak. I will need it throughout my application. So I'm going to create a private var which I'm going to call image path. So this new field will be empty at the beginning, an empty string, so to speak. And then we can override it. At which point will we override it? Well, at the point where we have selected the image and that will be inside of the glide. There we are. So once we have taken an image from the camera, that's where we would want to do the setting up of the image. So here I'm going to set that image path to be save image to internal storage with the bitmap that was created for us, which is in this case, the thumbnail. So thumbnail, this one here. So we created this thumbnail, which is of type bitmap, which is exactly the type that we needed. As you can see, we converted it into a bitmap earlier. The data that we get, because this data might be in a slightly different format, which is in the end bitmappable, so to speak, so convertible into a bitmap. And now we can go ahead and use that thumbnail to save it to the internal storage, well, which basically will call the method that we just created, where we then create the wrapper and the file and to open up the stream and then return the path itself. So calling this method will basically just create a string, okay? And that's exactly what we store inside of this image path, which is just a string. And now at this point, I'm just going to display this path in the log, okay? So let's run this real quick and see how this is gonna work for us. And therefore we should open up the log cat. So let's go over here and select an image from the camera because that's the only point where we implemented this. Let's run this. And now let's go to info and search for image path. And we will find it here. It says image path and that's where it's going to be stored. So under data, the folder, the folder user zero, and then the name of the applications um, project directory here. So this one here, EU tutorials fev dish. Okay, so that's pack the package name. Then the string that we have defined ourselves, so which we have selected or created here at the very bottom. Let me go down here. This is this image directory which we set up. So fav dish images. So you see it created it app underscore fav dish images. And then this is the UUID, so the randomly generated unique ID for our image dot JPEG. Okay, so that's the URL. And now if we wanted to get that image back, we could load it based on that URI or on that path. So that's something that we will later on store in our room database so that we can retrieve the data from there and display the image accordingly. 
So that's just part one. How do we do that with the gallery? Okay, and in the gallery, we need to do some other steps. So it's slightly different there. So inside of this request code gallery, we get Glide, and that's where the power of Glide really comes into play. So we have the photo URI, we set the photo URI, but now we will also add a couple more executions of code here, which will be disk cache strategy, where we can define which or how we want to cache the image. And we are going to use disk cache strategy all. So what does that do? Caches remote data with both the link data as well as the link resource and local data with at link resource only. Okay, so this is the strategy that we're gonna use and then I'm going to add a listener. So this will ask for or wait for a request. So I'm gonna create a new request a listener and this will be this one here, request listener that will listen for a drawable. And now if we do that, we need to implement its methods. So it's members, so to speak. So let's implement those two members, which will be on load failed and on resource ready. So what is it that we want to do if the load failed? Well, we need to, well, in this case, just log it. So I'm gonna log it with error loading image. And it's important that we return false here so that the error placeholder can be placed. Okay, so this would be the placeholder that we then use for our application. So here, well, the thing is we don't even need to put that in here, but the error placeholder will be generated by for us by Glide. So that's the on load failed. And now let's look at on resource ready. You can see there's a lot going on here. So we have the resource, which is a drawable. We have a model, which can be of any type. We have the target, which is a target drawable and data source, as well as its first resource. So pretty a long definition of this method, but it will give us all of this information if we ever need it. But what is really going to be relevant for us is the bitmap. So we can go ahead and use that bitmap, which will be resource dot two bitmap. So it's this one here, it's resource drawable. Okay, and because this can be a nullable, we can ask or add a resource let block around it to make sure that this will only be executed if the resource is in fact not empty. So it's not a, an empty drawable here. And then we can use m image path to save the image here as well. Save image to internal storage, and that should not be a dot, but an equal sign. Save image to internal storage with that new bitmap. So pretty long way, but that's the way how we can use Glide in order to get the image from whatever the user has selected. So this return false should, by the way, be outside of our let condition here or our resource optional condition. Okay, so that is pretty much it. The only thing that's left to do here is to potentially also add this log entry where we see the image path. Okay, let's run this and see if we can actually select an image. So this is something if you wonder where would I get this information from? Well, you would just go to the Glide documentation and there you will find it. Search for Android Glide and there you will find Glide and here you can check out the documentation. Okay, so all of the details that you need come from here. So let's run the application and go to our gallery select an image from the gallery, in this case, the Homer Simpson one. And here we can see we have Homer Simpson. Well, this is the file name and this is the whole directory. And now we could of course also store that in order for 
our application to know where to get the image from and all of that so that it can reload it once we have a dish ready in the future that we have created and stored on our device. Okay, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to take care of this little pop-up here where we can then select the dish type as well as the category. So for now, we can't select it, so they won't do anything. We can just click away to get rid of it. But in the end, we want to have that. Same goes for the cooking time. We want to be able to select the cooking time here. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement all of that good functionality. And the first thing that I will create, therefore, is going to be a new folder, which I'm going to call utils. So it will be our utilities, it will be useful, where we put stuff such as, for example, our constants. Okay, so I'm going to create a new Kotlin file here, new Kotlin file class, which I'm going to call constants. And this one will be an object. So it's not really a class, it's an object, as you see here. So what we will need here is, first of all, the constant values for our dish type, dish category, as well as dish cooking time. Okay, so I'm just going to add them in here. You don't need to see me create those manually. So we will need to know the dish type, the dish category, as well as the dish cooking time. And these are just strings that I want to use so that we can access this constant in order to not have any typos when entering strings. So we will reuse these constants every now and then. And then I want to have a function in here, which will give me the different dish types. Okay, so it will just be an array list here of strings, which contains a list of array lists, objects. So array list, entries of string. And now I want to add to that list. Okay, so for example, I want to add an element called breakfast. So this would be one of the dish types and so forth. Okay, and then in the end, we need to return that list. So now you can go ahead and add the types that you want to have in your application. So the different dish types that you want to have. I'm just going to paste some in here, such as lunch, snacks, dinner, and so forth. Okay, so these are the dish types. Then we also need to have dish categories. Okay, so for example, barbecue, pizza, bakery, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to create another function here, categories, which will also return an array list of strings. Okay, and now this of course needs to have a list of strings so an array, a list to be precise. And then it will return that list. So now, of course, this list will be empty at that point. So we need to fill it with some data. So for example, pizza and so forth. So let me just add a couple here. As you can see, we have pizza, barbecue, bakery, burger, coffee, chicken, and so forth. All right, then we need to do the same thing with the cooking time. So now you could of course say, in order to cook this meal, you would usually enter a value like a number, for example. So this could also be an option, right? Where you enter it like this, but in our case, we're going to make this a selectable item as well, where the user can then select however long it will take him to finish this meal. Okay, so it will be within those categories of 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and so forth. So this is a function called dish cook time, and it will return an array list of strings. We create that array list, we add all of the items that we want to have in there, and we return this list. Okay, now the next thing will be to select those. So this will be a custom dialog again. So we want to be able to select any of them. And we're going to use the same XML file for all three of them because they will be looking the same, right? So we can go ahead to our resources folder 
and here to the layout. And as you might recall, we used this dialog custom image selection where we created this custom dialog. We'll do something similar now and it will be a layout resource file which I'm going to call dialog underscore custom underscore list. And the root element will be a linear layout. Well, actually, we can leave it here for now. We can replace it inside of the XML in the end. So I want to use a linear layout here instead, linear layout. All right, so what is it that I need to set in here? Well, the orientation would be a good one. So whenever you're working with linear layouts, it's useful to have the orientation. I want this to be vertical, so the values are from top to bottom. And let's add a little bit of padding. So I'm going to use 10 SDP, okay? And then I can go ahead and say what I want to have in there. And basically what I would like to have is a little text view at the top and then a recycler view underneath it. So let me add that text view in here so you don't need to look at me entering this. So you see text view TV title. Now you could make this TV dialogue custom list title or something like that to be, well, to make sure this is going to be fully unique throughout your whole application because I believe we have used this ID before, but through view binding, that is not the problem as you have seen. Then if you want to use tools, we need to add the namespace here. So XML and S will be this tools namespace. And this will just add the option for us to see the text here straight away. So it's going to be dialog title. Okay, so that is going to be the text view. Then I will require a recycler view because I want to be able to scroll through it and have multiple different options and so forth. And that's where a recycler view comes in handy. So just add a recycler view here and we will give it the name of RV list or the ID. It will match the parent in terms of width and wrap the content in terms of height. It will have a little bit of margin towards the top of 10 pixels. And I want this to be visible and also visible in the tools so that we can see it like so. Okay, so let me zoom in a little bit. We see here we have item zero, item one, item two, and so forth. And these of course will be based on the values that we have here. So based on what we have here. So pizza, barbecue, bakery, and so forth. Okay, that's our dialog custom list. Now we will need an item custom list as well. So let me create our custom dialog here. New layout XML file. I'm going to call this one item underscore custom underscore list. And now what this will be is basically a linear layout with a text view and a view underneath it. Okay, so let me just paste that in here and go over it with you. Okay, so we're using a linear layout once again with a vertical order orientation. So stuff is from top to bottom displayed in a way. And this means that at the top we will have the text view, which is going to be TV text, which will be centered, has a little bit of padding. Text is fully written in caps. So that's the property that we have here. We use the gray color as a text color and the text size should be 16 SDP. And the tool text will be item value. Okay, and then we need to add colors as well. So we have this new color divider line color. Let's create that. Let's go to color XML and here we will need to add that new color and I'm just going to use it like so. So this is just going to be a gray color so that we can see a little divider there. This divider will allow us to have this little part here. So you can see this is the all caps text and then we have the divider, all caps text, divider and so forth. So this is our custom list item view that we are going to use inside of our recycler view that we're going to use inside of our custom dialog. So, which is inside of our activity. All right, so that's how everything is connected to each other. Now let's go ahead and take care of the adapter because every time you're working with a list, 
or a recycler view, you need to have an adapter. And therefore, I'm going to create a new folder inside of my view or a new package, which I'm going to call adapters. Okay, and now here, inside of that, we can go ahead and create a new adapter, which I'm going to call custom item list or list item adapter. Maybe that will be better. So here, a new Kotlin class, custom list item adapter. Okay, so what is it that we want to have inside of this adapter? Well, we need to know the activity. So private val activity in, the, in which we are. So that will be of type activity. And let me get rid of this part here on the left hand side. We need to import activity for this to work. Then, and let me put that in different lines here, private val list items. So we want to know which list items we need to display. So this will be a list of strings. And then finally, we want to know what the user has selected. So private val, and this will be selection, which will also be a string, or just a string in this case. Okay, now for this to work, we need to make sure that this is going to be inheriting from the recycler view here. Okay, so recycler view adapter, view dot, and we need to add a colon here, otherwise it don't I won't understand what we want from it. So we need to use recycler view. So let's import recycler view dot adapter. And this adapter will use our custom list item adapter dot view holder. So what is this view holder? Well, that's the thing. We need to create a new class inside of this custom list item adapter class, which I'm going to call view holder, which will be overwriting the default functionality of view holders. So item custom list building, which will be recycler view dot view holder. So it's going to inherit from the default view holder functionality, but the text view text will be our view TV text. So this view holder basically describes an item view and metadata about its place within a recycler view. And a recycler view is just a list view. Okay, so it can also be a grid view, but in our case, it will be a list view. Okay, now it's not happy because we still need to implement its members. So as you see, we have three members that we need to implement. Number one is on create view holder, which will be called once the view holder is created. Then the on bind view holder, which will be called for every single item inside of our recycler view, and it will bind the individual item. And then get item count will just need to know how many items do we have in that particular recycler view. Okay, because it needs to know when to stop producing views, so to speak. So here, this is the easiest one, the get item count, because we can just return the list items dot size here. So what is this list items? Well, it's this variable that we created here. So when we create a custom list item adapter object, we need to pass the activity as well as the list of items that we want to have. And then finally the selection that the user clicked on, for example. So on bind view holder, how does every single item have to look like? So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to create a new item, which will be the item that is currently at the position of the list items that we have or that we're looking at. Okay, so let's say we have all of those items, right? And this one will be at position zero, this at one, two, three, four, and so forth. And for every single one of them, it needs to set the text. Okay, let me go to this one here. It needs to set holder.tv text dot text to be the item. Because the item itself is 
inside of our list items, which is of type string. So we can just assign this item, which is a string, just text, right, to the text of our holder, which is going to be the view holder, which is in fact our class view holder that we have here, which is going to be this one here. Okay, now what should happen once we create the view holder? And here we just need to pass the binding object. So let's create the binding object, item custom list binding, which will be of type item custom list binding inflate. We pass in the layout inflator from the activity that we are in. And here we need to pass in the parent as well as attached to root. We're gonna set that to false. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, basically we will need to return a view holder. So as you see, this method on create view holder is expecting to return a view holder. So we need to return a view holder and that view holder, well, needs a view and of type item custom list binding. Well, and guess where we get that from? Well, that's our binding variable that we just created with just one D. So it's this one here. So now we created a new binding object that we pass over to the onCreate view holder so that we can now use it inside of our activity and then inflate the whole view. So this part here, we can then inflate it, basically display it and fill it with data. Okay, so that's the custom list item adapter. You can see neither selection nor custom list adapter were used yet. So let's go over to our code and I believe it will make sense for us to implement the rest of our code in here in the next video because this video would otherwise be way too long. So what we've done is we've set up the constants KT where we prepared all of those functions which will contain the list or return the lists of items that we have, which are either our dish types, our dish categories, or dish cooking time. And then we set up the adapter, this custom list item adapter, which we are going to use for our recycler view that we also have set up and our recycler view will have items that will be customized. So we have this item custom XML here, custom list XML, and we set up the actual dialog custom list as well, which will then display all of those individual items that are going to be rend uh, customized based on what we have defined in here. So every single item is gonna look like this item value. Okay, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. Welcome back. Now let's finalize the functionality where we can actually select, or at least we can display the different selections that we have as options. And something that I didn't specifically state in the last video, which I wanted to do in this one is that we are using something pretty cool here. We are using view binding in recycler views. So this is a more advanced concept, so to speak, when it comes to binding or view binding. So usually we would use view binding in very simple UIs, but when it comes to recycler views, it's a little more complicated and that's really how you do it basically. Okay, so that's the view binding jetpack kind of way, right? So you're using jetpack here in order to get the most out of your application. All right, so then let's go ahead and add update dish activity stuff to our add update dish activity. <laughs> so the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a new function here. And I'm going to put it down there all the way down. And it will be a private function custom items dialog. Now it will need a title which will be of type string and it needs the items list of type list string or well, list of strings, so to speak, and the selection, which will also be a string. So what is this custom items dialog? Well, it's basically this thing here that should then be displayed. So this is a dialog in which we then populate or inflate our recycler view, which has all of those 
<laughs> unique items in there. Okay, so in order to have a custom dialog, you of course need to set it up and I'm going to call this one customer list dialog, which will just be a basic dialog with our current context, which is this, which means the context of that current activity that we're in. And then we're going to use data binding once again, but this time it will be dialog custom list binding. So as you can see, this class has been auto-generated for us as well, which is pretty cool. And it is based on our dialog custom list here on this XML. So we are going to use its binding in order to use its views, which means now we can access this RV list and TV title and so forth. Okay, so let's do that. And therefore I'll need to go back here. So we have the binding ready almost. Well, we, we prepared the variable, but we didn't assign it. So we're going to use dialog custom list binding inflate with the layout inflator. Now we can go ahead and set the custom list dialog content view to be binding dot root. So that will basically say that our custom list dialog should use the complete XML file that we just looked at. Okay, so it's this, I, cl I closed it already, but it's this dialog custom list. Okay, so it should basically use this linear layout as its complete layout. So as the layout of our custom list dialog of this pop-up, so to speak. Okay, then we can use binding at this point to set the text, for example. So the title, TV title text to be the title that is passed to this method, okay, to the custom items dialog, as well as use binding for our recycler view. So RV list layout manager is going to be our linear layout manager with this as context. Okay, so usually you wouldn't use binding here, but well, in the past you wouldn't have used binding here, but as we are using a Jetpack approach or we are using view binding here, which is part of Jetpack, we will use this approach, you see? So we're setting the linear layout manager and now we can set up the adapter. So I'm going to create an adapter object, which will be the custom list item adapter, which we created in the last video to which we needed to pass the activity. So I'm going to pass this as well as the list that we want to display and then the selection. Okay, so whatever the user has selected, for example, and then binding RV list adapter should be the adapter that we just set up. And then we can dis display our custom list dialog. So if you watched the Android Masterclass course that I created and learned from it, you will have seen that exact approach, but without using view binding as well as without putting it into a dialog. So now we are really putting things together, which adds complexity, but it's good because now you're learning the highest, well, a higher level of complexity. So what's going on here? We are creating an adapter object of our custom list item adapter, which is the class that we created in the last video where we had the create view holder where we set up the binding. Okay, and we inflated it to be basically the, well, use the layout inflator from that activity in which this view holder will be created. So that's a cool thing because that's in fact this activity. So it's our add update dish activity in which it is created. Now, if you look at it, here's the top, you see you need to pass an activity, a list and a selection. Guess what? That's exactly what we do here. We pass the activity, which is this. We uh, pass the items list, which is going to be passed to this method once this method is called. And we pass a selection, which is also something that will be passed to this method once we call it. So we of course need to call it at one point with the title as well as the items list and the selection later on. And then we set the um, recycler view to use that adapter. And by the way, the layout manager that we assign to our recycler view is the linear layout manager, which means we're saying that the recycler view ju should just use the linear layout approach. 
so to speak. It should be of type linear layout. Okay, and then we use this custom list dialog to show it here. All right, at this point, the custom list dialog will be displayed with the items list that the user can then select from. Now, if we would run that, nothing would happen because we never call this method. But before we can call this method, we need to add something else because that's something that I usually forget and I want to do it straight away at the start. So whenever you want to be able to click on any of the elements inside of your view, which is in our case, the type, for example, you need to set an on-click listener to it. So make sure that you do the same thing for all of the types that we have here. So added AET category, we need to add an on-click listener here as well. And then I'm binding dot ET cooking time. So these are the three where we need to add an on-click listener to them because otherwise, if you look at this, so let me click away here. If you click on the type, for example, nothing would happen. So we need to add an on-click listener to it. Now the type will then actually do something. So now at this point, we can go ahead and add the on-click events for all of those different buttons that we have there. So here, well, it's not really buttons, but those edit text fields, right? So here, where we had this r.id, where the ID was the, for example, add dish image, we need to add a couple more of those. So r.id.et type. So once we click, click on the edit text type, object or view so to speak then this code should be executed so what is the code that should be executed here well first of all we want to call this custom items dialog which we created which is this method here from the very bottom custom items dialog maybe we should name it custom list dialog or custom items list dialog well, it really depends on how you want to call it. It's fine. So custom items list dialog. Now, what is it that we need to pass to it? Well, first of all, the title. And here I'm going to use a string and I'm going to use the string from our resources. So we need to go ahead and go to our resources to set it up there. So let's go to our string XML file and add those titles that we want to have. Okay, so I want to have, for example, the select dish type, select dish type category, the dish cooking time. And as you can see, these are going to be the texts that I want to use there. So these are the titles that I want to use in there. Okay, now we can actually use that string resource. We also need to pass the constants dot dish types. So this will then, then be our dish types list and then constants dish. So here, once again, constants dish type. So we need to say which thingy we selected. So what is the selected list that we selected? So the thing is like this dish types, that's the list where we get the data about the list, so to speak, but the dish type, this is the actual name of that list, so to speak. So that's why we created this extra constant here at the top for our dish types. Then we created one for the dish categories and so forth. So now we need to add return here for this. And now we need to do the same thing basically for the category as well as the cooking time. So that's something that I would like you to try for yourself. So pause the video and try it for yourself. We can, however, already start the execution here and run the code and see if this is going to work with our custom items list for the dish types. Okay, so let's go over to our application. Okay, let's go over here and click on type and you see it pops up. We have all the different options. Of course, they are not clickable because we didn't implement it but we can click on it. At the same time, we cannot click on category. Well, we can, but you see it's not focusable, even though we can try it. Yeah, <laughs> so this is something that we definitely want to change. So once we click on it, we want to execute something, which means we want to do the same thing as we did here, but with the dish categories. So pause the video real quick, try it for yourself, please. 
Okay, I hope you tried it. So here I have the ET category, which means it's going to be this added text, of course, which is this category text in the UI that we just saw. And then we also call this custom items list dialog method, which will basically just pop up this little pop up or display this pop up where we set the string to be the title of the dialog, then the categories dish list. So this is the list of categories and then the name of the selection, so to speak. And now the same thing goes for the cooking time. So let's now add that in here as well. So now cooking time, same concept, but here it's the AT cooking time, which is basically, if you scroll down, it's this part here, this one. And here we also call the custom items list dialog. We set the title, we set the list, and we set the name of the list. So we know which list we selected from, so to speak. Okay, that will be relevant later on once we move on with the application. Right now it won't be relevant, but later on it will be important to know from which dialog did we select something, okay? That will be really important because you don't want the time to be set up for the types, for example. Okay, let's see if the category works. We see we have all of those categories and you can see this is a recycler view where we can now scroll because, well, that was also the idea to make it big enough so that we actually have to scroll and select from a bigger list. Now let's do the same thing with the cooking time in minutes and you see here we have all of those cooking times included there. Okay, so that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a more complicated part and it took a little longer, but now we used view binding and we used it in combination with a custom dialog, which then used also a different approach of using the adapter because we used view binding, of course. So really good stuff. This will help you to move forward in your career with more complex applications. Okay, so see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to implement the functionality so that it actually works to select something. So for example, if I select pizza, that will work out. If I select the cooking time, that will be entered here as well. And then once I click here, it will basically tell me what is missing, if anything is missing, and otherwise it will try to add the dish even though the actual adding of the dish will be done later on. So for now, we're just going to take care of these features. And if you feel comfortable doing that by yourself, feel free to do so. But of course, I'm going to show you how to get through all of this step by step. So the first thing that I need to make sure is that I know th about the dialogue outside of just this dialogue method here. So for example, when we display the dialogue, let me see dialogue here, the custom image selection dialogue, you see that this is a local variable. So it's only visible for this function. We cannot use it outside of this function. So we need to make sure that we can actually use it outside of this function. And therefore I'm going to create a new global variable here, private late init var, because we're going to initialize it a little later. And I'm going to call this mcustom list dialogue will be of type dialog. Okay, now because this is a late init var, this is going to be fine. Now we need to take this variable name and replace it at the point where we had this other dialog. So here in custom image selection dialog, we need to make sure that now we're using the global variable here, which is our m custom list dialog. And at any other point where we use that, we need to do that as well. Why did we do that? Well, we do it because I want to make sure that I want, can dismiss this dialog from other points of the application. Okay, so as of now, I can only display it and dismiss it directly from this method itself. Okay, so now let's go ahead and change that. The next thing that I want to know is which list item has been selected. So I'm going to create a new function here, selected list item and I will need to know the item name which is going to be a string and the selection which will be a string as well. Okay so what I will see here is when the selection is of a certain 
type, which means, for example, let's say it's our constants dot dish type. Then I want to make sure that my M custom dialog is dismissed. So we make sure that it's not going to be displayed anymore. And I set the M binding dot ET type to be the text of that item. So what does this mean? So what is the selection and what is this item? Well, if we look at this application, once I click on it, this is the selection. So basically the list that we selected. And then once I click on, let's say lunch, then this lunch is actual the, actually the item. So you see, we set the ET type to be that item. So this lunch item, okay? Now we need to do the same thing for the other constants as well. So for our dish category, and then finally for our cooking time. Now, of course, you could also use constants dish cooking time here instead of else, but in our case, we only have those three cases. So having this as the else case is going to be fine. And then we set the text accordingly. Okay, at this point, we can go over to our custom list item adapter. And here we need to make sure that we can click on any of the items. So meaning that we can in fact click on any of these elements here, for example, on snack. And it won't work right now because we didn't implement it in our on bind view holder. So this one is going to bind a view holder for every single of the items, so every single one of them. And we need to make sure that the item view had a, has an on-click listener here. So we can implement an on-click listener for that individual or for every single individual item. And what we need to check is, are we currently in the add update dish activity? And if we are, then we want to call its method called selected list item, which we have just set up with the item and the selection. So the item is going to be this item that we just created based on the list items. And the selection is going to be, well, it's going to be this private val selection that we have created, well, that we will be passed once we create an item adapter object. Okay, and that's what we do here. So we, let me see, custom. So over here, that's where we get past the selection. And we get that selection once we call this custom list dialog and that's where we get it passed. Okay, so once we click on any of the edit texts, we will get the selection passed as well. At this point, let's go to our onClick method and take care of the other onClick events here. So we need to add this button at the bottom. Okay, so here, if you scroll down, there's this add dish button, and I want this button to have a functionality so it can execute something. So we can execute its code by getting its ID and its ID was button add dish. And then what is it that we want to execute? Well, we need to set the title to be whatever we get from our et title dot text to string. And the thing is like you could use to string here only, but I'm also going to trim it directly. Okay, so what is it that I'm going to trim? Well, I'm going to get rid of empty spaces. Okay, so this here is a lambda expression once again. So we are trimming empty spaces from it. Okay, and then we assign it directly to it again. So basically we make sure that this title is going to be whatever the title would have been, but without empty spaces. So if someone enters something like a favorite food, and has an empty space here at the end, as well as an empty space here at the beginning, for example, then this line or this trim here would get rid of those empty spaces. Okay, that's basically what I want here because it otherwise looks very weird if you have it in your application. So we need to do that with the title, but also with the type, then with the category, the ingredients, the cooking time in minutes and so forth. Okay, so we will need all of those 
here. So by the way, this ET title is this edit text title. Now we'll do the same thing with the edit text type, the category, the ingredients. Even though we use this type right now like a button, so to speak, which pops up this little dialog that we have there, but it still is an edit text which is there to display text. Okay, so that's what we are going to do with it. Okay, so we're going to display its text or at least we get the text from it because after we have selected it, so here, for example, after we have selected burger, we can get that text burger from it. Okay, that's what we do with these lines here. And then we can also check if any of those is empty because I want to make sure that none of them are empty because if any of them is empty, we know that we don't want to store it. We don't want to save it anywhere because we don't want to have empty fields in our database. Okay, so this is a requisite that we have in our application. If you want to handle it differently in your apps, feel free to do so, but you could run into issues there. So I really recommend to do this. So what you can use is a class called textutils, which has this method called isEmpty. So what that will do is it will check if a particular variable is in fact empty. And in this case, if a string is empty, which this text utils is really for. Okay, so we're checking if the image path is empty. If that's the case, then we know that no image was selected. Or maybe something else went wrong while the image was selected. So what is it that we want to do here? Well, thing is, I will just display a toast. Okay, I'm just gonna say toast make text. And here I'm going to display an error message in that toast. Now the thing is we will need to add a couple new strings and feel free to use your own strings and you can even, if you wanted to, you could of course go ahead and add that directly here. Like enter the string as a hard coded string, but we are going to use the strings XML here. So these are the strings that I'm going to use. Error message, select dish image, select this dish image, enter dish title, select dish types, and so forth. So here, the user is prompted to do something if he missed out on any of the entries. So if you forgot, for example, to enter the dish title, he will be notified about that. Okay, so now we will need to do that same thing with all of the other fields. So we are going to check the title. So first we checked the image path. Now we're checking the title. If the title is empty, we are going to display the error message, which will display that he should enter the title, the user, I mean. And then the same goes for the type, okay? Then the same goes for the category. And now I'm pasting these in because it's always the same code, so there's really not too much going on here. I still would like you to have these things, these lines of code in your project as well. And then finally, we have those two here, which is the cooking time in minutes as well as the cooking directions. Okay, once you have all of those, we need to implement the else case, which is actually the one that is really interesting because all of the other just mean we are missing some data. So the type was not selected or anything else, right? But if all of that is not the case, so if none of them is empty, we know that we are good to go and good to store the information. So for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to display this text here, which will say all entries are valid. But of course, you could go ahead and create an extra string for that as well. But as we are going to overwrite this, this is really just for testing purposes or for educational purposes in this case. But later on, we're going to replace this with actually storing the data in a room database. And that will be, I think, the next video or the video after you're going to see how that is done. So that's going to be another very interesting Jetpack part of this course and of this project. And now before we test this, there's one very important thing and I forgot about it again, and that is to set the onclick listener for the button. So our button add dish needs an onclick listener. So let me add that one here. And now I realize that I made another mistake here with variables. So here in the custom image selection dialog, I call this custom list dialog, but here it's fine if it's just a dialog. And I wanted to change that actually for another method. 
Okay, so here I'm just going to make sure that we are going to in fact use the dialog that is inside of this class or this method, I mean, this custom image selection dialog because it's a different dialog, right? The one that I wanted to actually change was, well, maybe a little challenge for you. Which one was it? Maybe you can pause the video and figure it out. Well, it's this custom items list dialog, of course. So here I should use the M custom list dialog. Okay, let me set the content view here and also show this custom list dialog at that point. Okay, now let's run it again. Now our, our application should be good to go. So as you can see, it's really tricky if you have multiple different dialogues in the same class, you have to be super careful. So now let's go ahead and select a type here, lunch, okay, that worked, that's good. The chicken lunch and this one here would be Homer chicken V5. Okay, let me select an image as well. Not from the camera maybe, but from the gallery, there we are, Homer Simpson. And let me click on it and you see dish ingredients are missing. So what it, will it be? It will be chicken and Homer. Nothing else in there and maybe also V5, whatever that is. <laughs> and then cooking time um, over 9,000 and direction to cook, throw in the chicken and Homer for 180 minutes, then add V5. Okay, very simple directions to cook. And now let's add the dish and you see all entries are valid. So at this point, our application would be ready for this to be stored, for this data to be stored on the device permanently using the room database, which is what we're going to see in the next few videos. So see you there. Quick pause. This video is sponsored by our Jetpack Masterclass course, which we've been working on for a couple of months. And this video is basically just part of that course. And if you want to learn everything about Jetpack that is relevant for your future applications, definitely check out the link in the description below. We have created a great course, which teaches you to basically use all of the relevant Jetpack components, as well as build a real life application, which you can see here. So in the background, you can see the components. We're going to implement most of them in our application here. So you're going to learn how to build those, but we also have separate demos, which teach you the components separately as well. So definitely check out the course and of course you will build this little dishes application where you can store your favorite dishes using the room database. You can delete those dishes or edit them. You can create your own dishes with your own images or the gallery. If you have any dishes there, and then store it using the room database. And at the same time, use an API to get data from the internet. So here you can load a random dish, which you then can add to your favorite list. And then basically you see it in all your dishes and as well as in your favorite dishes. Thanks for watching the video. Check out the link in the description for the full course. And let's get back to the course. Welcome back. In the next few videos, we are going to set up our room database in order to then basically store data on the device permanently. And you could of course use SQLite for that. And there is a complete tutorial that I created going over how to do the crude operations using SQLite. But the thing is that Room is just so powerful and it's so like clean from an architectural perspective that it really makes sense to understand it. And it is quite complex. That's why I would recommend that, that you go through this tutorial here. Okay, so there is in code labs, Android room with a view Kotlin tutorial, step by step, you see it's 16 minutes just to read through it, which is incredible. But uh, Florina Muntunescu has written this article, and she's done a great job here. Th shout out to her. I guess she's from Romania based on this name. But yeah, really good stuff. And I really recommend to check out this article to really understand what room is all about, how it works, how everything is connected to each other, because there is a lot going on in room architecture. You can see that this is the general architecture here where you have a UI controller with an activity or fragment. 
and then you have the view model which contains the live data as well as a repository that then communicates directly with the room database which then internally has a thing called DAO and DAO stands for data access object then it has an entity here which is an annotated class that describes a database table when working with the room so we will need to set that up as well and then this room database internally communicates with SQLite. So we don't need to communicate with SQLite ourselves. It's all done by room for us. Okay, so it takes a little while to get used to this rather complex architecture, I'd say. But at the same time, once you get a hang of it, you will be a significantly better developer. And you can call yourself a senior then. <laughs> because if this is really like using the MVVM concepts here that we're going to do the view model using as well as live data that will be part of the view model. And of course, we are going to require coroutines. And of course, we're going to go over every single aspect of the code and I will explain every single thing as well as I can. But I still would recommend that you take the time here again. It's 54 minutes to go through this complete coroutines tutorial because we're going to use coroutines in our application of course because well when you're using room you need to use coroutines and that's just a better way of doing something in the background so that's a way to run asynchronous tasks because you don't want to run your database relevant stuff on the ui thread and that's the whole idea of this architecture here so how we would have done it in the past what well if if we were to a beginner let's say we wouldn't even look into all of this architecture stuff we would just do everything in our ui controller which is basically our activity so we would do everything in the activity not even think about it right and that works but it's not good it's not good practice depending of course on how you handle it so it's still not good practice to do it this way that's why we have this whole architecture that will be good practice where you separate the ui entirely from the, the database work and that is done by using the view model as well as repository so basically what we want and that's the cool thing we want to update the ui based on new entries in the database anytime so basically our ui is observing whatever is happening to our database and if there are any changes well then it will basically update the UI automatically and that is the powerful thing here. So UI is notified of changes using observation. So basically the UI is an observer of the view model which internally then does the communication to the room database and all of that. So we're going to first of all set up our entity in this video. So that is a class that describes the database table when working with room. So we're going to set that up where we have all of the different columns that we want to have in our database. And as you might recall, it would be the image, it would be the title, the type, category, ingredients, the cooking time, and so forth. Okay, and I would say, let's get started with that. And once again, I really recommend checking this out. This is super powerful stuff. And it's really well written as well, highly recommend it. Okay, let's go over to our project. What we will need is to first of all, go to our build.gradle file, okay? So build Gradle, and it will be this app variant. Okay, here we need to go to plugins all the way up here, and we need to add this line here. So ID Kotlin kept, okay, the kept plugin. Then the next step would be that we go to our, well, actually inside of Android, we need to set up a new entry which will be packaging options okay so i'm going to put it on top of kotlin options here it actually doesn't matter but i'm just going to set it up here we're going to exclude meta in atomic foo kotlin module what that will do is it will exclude the atomic functions module from the package and prevent warnings so that's the idea behind this get us atomic functions uh, module would otherwise create warnings and we don't want to have those okay then if you don't have this here then you need to add this kotlin options jvm target 1.8 as well and then finally we need to add a couple of dependencies and that will be in here so you can see that these were the implementations that we added so far the dependencies that we needed and now we are going to require this one here so we need to enter a room version so this will just be a variable right 
So this is a new variable defined as 2.2.6 and we're going to use it at two points. So one for the implementation of the room Kotlin X, the dependency with this room version and then also the kept, which is the room compiler. Okay, so And you can find this also detailed in the data storage slash room training on the developer.android.com page. So here you can see the setup. You need to add those here, the room version, as well as this kept line. And then if you don't have that, well, the Kotlin extensions and code routines, code routine support for room, as well as test helpers, if you want to use them. Okay, coming back to our project, let's actually get to the part where we're going to implement something. So let's sync this before we go anywhere else. And then I will go ahead and create a new file inside of our models because we have not created anything so far in models and the model folder will contain multiple different folders later on. But for now, it's just going to contain one folder, which will be the entities folder. And inside of that entities folder, I want to create a new file, which will be a new Kotlin class. And the class will be called favdish. That will be basically the entity name here, favorite dish. Now here we need to make this an entity. Okay. So this will be an entity and we can achieve this by using an annotation. Okay. So this at here indicates that we're using an annotation and we're using the entity annotation from room. Okay. And now we can define the table name for our table in the database. Okay, this has to be a string and I'm just going to call this favorite dishes table. And this table then of course needs to be inside of a database then. Then this should be a data class instead of just a normal class. And here I need to now define the different columns that I want to have inside of that data class. I will add a new annotation here. So this will be a column info and I will create an image as a string. Okay, so the image will be stored as a string, which means the location of the image on the device. Then we need to have another column info for our image source. This will contain the details about whether we use the image from a local source or from the online source, which means it comes from the web. And then we need to have the title, the type, the category and the ingredients. Okay. So basically we're creating a table called favorite dish table. And we have all of those columns because we need to have the details about all of those different values as we get them from the user. So when the user enters all of them, we have them and we need to store them. And we will do the same thing with online data later on. So now you can also specifically define a different name for an entry rather than using the variable name. Okay. So for example, I want to use the cooking time and here I realized something and we should not use different cases for our variables. So here cooking time and cooking time. So here, what we're going to use for the table name is going to be snake case. That's common practice. And for the variable name, we're going to keep on using camel case. Okay. So snake case, if, if you use underscores for new words coming up and camel case is if you use a capital letter instead of an underscore uh, for the break of a new word, so to speak. And if we do that, you can see we can define a specific name or a special name for a variable that we want to define. Okay. So we don't need to use the variable name as the table um, column name, but in case we don't define that manually here with this one, what you can see here with this name definition, then it will use the default name. So it will use title type category. And if you do that, re you realize that image source potentially could also, or should also be changed to image underscore source. So the name should be in fact also like this and I need to put it here. Okay. So now the same thing for the instructions. So I would like to use instructions, but the internal name will still be direction to cook. So that will be the column name 
and that will be the entity property name, so to speak. And we need also to define if this is a favorite dish or not. So we're just going to use a Boolean here. All right. And then finally, we add this line here that will be necessary to um, define. So the thing is, every single table needs to know what the primary key is. And this is usually an ID that you're using. So we are going to auto generate this because we don't want to manually add a new entry each time adding the ID number manually. Okay, so that's the cool thing is if we set auto generate to true, then it will automatically increment any entry that we make to our table, it will automatically generate a new primary key. So a unique ID, so to speak, for that entry. So every single dish will be recognizable to be unique by its ID. Everything else could be the same. For example, let's say we have the same dish twice in the table, but they will still be unique in the sense that they will have a unique ID. So they will be recognizable as separate entries in the database. Okay, so that's it for this video. As you see, we only set up this data class, this entity. And if we look back at this architecture here, we have now prepared this part. So the entity part, of course, we still need to set up DAO, which stands for the data access object, the view model, the repository. Well, we have the UI controller already, our activity, right? But we need to set up all the other components still. Okay, so let's move on in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to set up our DAO. DAO, this part here inside of our room database, as you see, it's a data access object, a mapping of SQL queries to functions. When you use a DAO, you call the methods and room takes care of the rest. And that is pretty cool because we can just create a new DAO method, so to speak, to insert an entry into our database, then another one to fetch data from the database, another one to update it, and another one to delete it. So basically the crude operations here. And this will make our life a lot easier. But when you use DAO, you also need to understand the concept of coroutines. So I hope you watched the video on coroutines that I have uploaded to this course. If you haven't, then check it out. And also, if you still feel like you need to know a little bit more, check out this guide on how to use coroutines in your Android app. It's a pretty long guide, but it will go really into depth what's going on. Now, what's really important to understand is that when you do something with your database or when you fetch data from the web using a network request, this can take a while. And the important part is that our screens on Android, they refresh every 16 milliseconds or more. So basically, if you have 60 frames per second on your device, which is at least right now still the default for most devices, then it will be called every 16 milliseconds. But if it is a newer device, let's say uh, the Galaxy Fold 2, then you already have 120 frames per second, which means every eight milliseconds, your screen needs to refresh whatever it needs to calculate and everything, right? Or whatever it needs to display basically. So you should not run fetching tasks such as fetching data from a database or a network directly on the UI thread because then your application could stop working and it could crash. And that's something that we definitely want to avoid because otherwise, well, your application will not be usable. So what's really important is that basically coroutines they make our life a lot easier. They remove the wait for callbacks, especially if we have multiple callbacks that we want to use. Then we basically can just use the suspend functionality and use sequential code, which makes it a lot easier for us to write our code and also understand our code. And now if you come from another programming language, then you probably have seen this keyword async. So you would need to add the keyword async to a method, for example, and then it would give you the result and a wait would be a method that would wait for another method that has finished its task, so to speak. Okay, so the suspend keyword is similar to async, but the await functionality is implicit when calling a suspend function. Okay, so 
Gutland has a method deferred weight that is used to wait for the result from a coroutine starting with the async builder. But as stated here, it's implicit when calling. So that means we don't need to take care of that manually. But now let's go back to our project and actually set up our first DAO. And we're going to create a new folder inside of model because we have a model entities folder. And now we will need to create a new folder, a new package for our model slash database. Okay, so now we have a new one. And here I need to create a new interface. So Kotlin class file, and it will be an interface. And I'm going to call this fev dish DAO. So now when working with DAOs, you need to understand that a DAO must be either an interface or an abstract class, which is why we used an interface in our case. And by default, all queries must be executed on a separate thread. So this helps us when we develop to directly not make the mistake of calling some database fetching code, so to speak, on the UI thread, which would really cause a bunch of problems potentially because the calling of data from a database just takes longer or retrieving the data. At least it can take longer in many cases. Okay, so now let's come back to our DAO file here. So our DAO interface. We need to add this annotation here that says that it will be in fact a DAO. So here you can see we imported room DAO which we will require. And now inside of this interface, we can now go ahead and prepare the methods that we are willing to use throughout our application. So for example, this function called insert favorite dish details. Okay, so what if you want to insert all of the details that we get from the user? So the user has selected his favorite dishes entry. So he has made an or added an image. He has entered the type and all of that. Well, then we need to get this favorite dish object to be passed and we can then insert it. Now, because we're going to use coroutines here, and that is the general approach that you should always use when working with your DAO, you need to make sure that you use the suspend keyword, which basically is similar to async if you come from other programming languages, okay, such as C sharp or maybe even Java and so forth. Okay, so now, this will be our insert function. Okay, so here you need to add the insert annotation and import insert. So this will import room insert for us. And this will then allow us to insert our favorite dish into our database. Now at this point, there is still nothing to see. Okay, so we're not using it yet. And we still don't have all of the other functions that we want to call here, but that's what we're going to take care of in the next video. Okay, so we are going to build it up step by step, but in a couple of videos, that's where we are going to finally see something. The thing is, this whole concept of room databases is rather complex, and I would like to give you a little more time to digest things step by step. And yeah, let's go ahead to the next video then. Welcome back. So far, what we have prepared is our entity, which we created two videos ago and our DAO, which we created just the last video. And now in this video, we're going to take care of the room database. Now you could of course say our DAO isn't finished yet. Yeah, of course we were going to uh, adjust it later on, but for now let's set up the room database in which the entity will be used as well as the DAO will be used. So the room database will then manage the local data, the SQL light data source using objects. Okay, so that's the cool thing. Let's go over and check out what this room database is going to really do and what it is. So a room database is a layer on top of the SQLite database. So internally, it's still using the SQLite database that it used for 10 years now or even more. And on top of that, it now makes it even better using room with all of this DAO and entity stuff. So now Room takes care of mundane tasks that you used to handle with a SQL light open helper. And Room uses the DAO to issue queries to its database. So we set up the DAO, which allows us to insert data, to delete data and search for data, filter data, all of that stuff. And what's important is by default to avoid poor UI performance, Room doesn't allow to you to issue queries on the main thread. Okay, so 
by default it's the case so you can't run into this error which is amazing so now let's look at what a room database class will look like so here you see you need to add this annotation at database for this to be a room database then you need to define the entities that you want to use this is an array of entities in this case they use the word example in our case it will be a fav dish so that's the entity that we created this class that we created earlier and you need to define a version now the export schema is an optional value you don't need to define it and then you need to make sure that your class is inheriting from room database you need to define the DAO that you want to use and then the companion object that's where the interesting part comes in where you basically need to use a singleton of your instance okay so that means we create a singleton of our room database which is an instance of our room database that is a nullable so it can be empty at the start but it will be defined if it is empty inside of this get database so we need to pass the context when we call this get database but then we will get as a return the word room well in the room database specifically in our case it will be the favdish database and then what this will do is it will basically return instance so if instance exists already it will return instance the current database instance the room database but if it doesn't exist that's what this here is it's going to create a new instance synchronized okay so it will create a new instance with the database builder from room it will use the context application context as well as it will then use the class itself so it's this class in which it exists so it will pass that to the database builder then you need to define the database that you want to work with and that will then be built and this instance that was just created will be assigned to that global variable instance this private var and it will be returned okay so that's the general structure What's important is that a database class for room must be abstract and extend the room database. Okay, now you can, of course, read through all of this in detail here, but I would say let's go back to our project and actually implement it there. So here inside of model database, I want to create a new column class and this class will be called fav dish room database. So whatever you had before plus room database is very good when it comes to a naming convention here. Now, in order to make this a room database, you need to add the database annotation. It needs additional information as you see the entity as well as the version. And then there are a bunch of other optional values such as the views and the export schema and so forth. So what's important is the entities. And here you need to enter an array so I'm just going to use brackets here saying that I want to use my entity favdish colon colon class okay so this class that we created earlier which contains all of the different properties which basically is our table that's what I need to define here and then of course the version so what is the version going to be well it's going to be one and the thing is, every time you make a change to your database structure, you need to migrate that and change the version up. Okay, we're going to keep it simple in this example. We don't want to make it too complicated. But that's something that you need to take into consideration, especially during development. You can just go ahead and wipe all the data and then use the same version as you go. But if you want to have a proper like if you have a live project, so to speak, which is already live, you shouldn't wipe the data. You mustn't wipe the data because then all the data will be gone and you will need to handle it via using of migrations. Okay, so now let's make this class abstract. As I told you, it's important that a room database class is in fact abstract and we need to inherit from room database here. Now, inside of that, we need to add a companion object which will then take care of the rest. So first of all, we need to create this volatile. So this is our nullable singleton. And then we need the function to get our database. So let me paste that in here. So we have this function called get database, which we need to pass the context to. 
and it will return our fave dish room database object, which is basically the instance here, which is our singleton. So if the instance is not null, then return it. If it is null, then create the database. So that's what we're doing here. And that's basically what I explained earlier, but in this case, with our own database. Okay, so that's it for this video. As you see, we have prepared the room database now. We have our DAO and we have our entity. And they are all connected to each other. And we will see a little more about that later. As you see, we didn't use the DAO in our room database yet, but we're going to do that later on. We also didn't set up our view model using live, live data, as well as we didn't set up our repository, which we are going to do later on. And really the whole idea of this whole thing, don't forget it, it's that we separate the UI functionality, which means the events that the user can trigger by working with the UI, by clicking on stuff or touching stuff, buttons, for example, or whatever, separating that from any heavy load stuff like database entries or database fetches and so forth. Okay, so see you in the next video. All right, so let's get back to our project in which we are now going to take care of the repository. So you see the room database, including DAO and entity is done now, at least prepared now. We're going to adjust them accordingly once we need them. But now let's take care of the repository, which is the single source of truth for all app data, a clean API for UI to communicate with. Okay, so your UI can then communicate via the view model with the repository, which then communicates with the room database. So that's basically the structure here. So let's set up our repository. And by the way, you can check out how the repository works here. So a repository class abstracts access to multiple data sources. The repository is not part of the architecture component libraries, but is a suggested best practice for code separation and architecture. So why would you use it? Well, it manages queries and allows you to use multiple backends. In the most common example, the repository implements a logic for deciding whether to fetch data from a network or use results cached in a local database. So that's pretty cool. And we are going to, in fact, use both of the features. So we're going to get data from a network as well as use DAO. So let's look at the implementation. You can see we take the name of our data model and then repository, at least in our case, it will be then the fav dish repository. Then we need to pass our DAO into the constructor, as you see here. And what we're going to use next is this suspend here. So this is a worker thread and the suspend function is part of coroutine of the coroutine structure. So the cool thing is it can be called on the UI thread, even though it works in the background, but this suspend is just going to say, okay, please execute me real quick and then do your other stuff that the UI needs to finish like that it basically needs to call every time reacting to the user input and so forth. And once you are done with whatever you're doing, let me know. And that's what this suspend function will do for us, which is pretty cool because we can just use the same kind of structure that we would have used in normal coding examples, but we have something that runs in the background and does it very efficiently. So what is to consider is the fact that the DAO is passed into the repository constructor as opposed to the whole database, okay? Because it doesn't need to have access to the whole database. It really just needs to have access to our DAO, which then contains the read-write methods for our database. And yeah, that's basically the idea here. Now there's one more thing to consider, and that is this part here. So I said that suspend functions can be called on the main thread, but room executes suspend queries of the main thread. So not on the main thread, but of the main thread. Okay, now let's get back to our project and actually set up our repository. So this will also be part of our model database. So here, right click, new, and this one will be a class. And I'm going to call this fav dish repository. All right. So now what is going on in this class? Well, we saw we need to pass the DAO to it. So private val fev dish 
DAO will be our, and uh, this should maybe be uncapitalized, our fifth dish, DAO. Somehow it feels like Bao, and then it feels like Southeast Asian meal or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, now we need to go ahead and take care of our suspend function. So I'm going to call this insert fav dish data, which will need our favorite dish, which is of type fav dish. Okay, so this is going to be the type of data that we're going to pass here. And now we can use our fav dish DAO in order to call our insert fav dish details with the fav dish that was passed to our suspend function insert fav dish. So now we need to make this a worker thread, which denotes the annotated method should only be called on a worker thread. If the annotated element is a class, then all methods in the class should be called on a worker thread. Okay, so in our case, it is not going to be the whole class, but only this particular method will be called on that worker thread and not on the main UI thread, so to speak. All right, so now looking at this architecture that we're using, we are done with the room database. We prepared our repository. And now the next step will be to take care of the view model. So let's do that in the next video. All right, so looking at this architecture, as I said in the last video at the end, we are lacking the view model still. So we still need to set that up and that's what we're going to prepare in this video. So we're very close to actually being able to use all of that. You see, there's a lot of setup to do when you want to use the room database. But once you have everything set up, it's going to work so easily that you are going to be very happy about this approach. This is going to be specifically useful once you have bigger applications or in general, if you want to have a very efficient application that is super easy to maintain and update. Okay, so let's take care of that view model and therefore, and the first thing that we are going to need to do is to of course set up a view model. Okay, so I'm going to create a new folder. Actually, I believe we have it already. Yes, we have the view model folder already. Now let's create a new view model here. And I'm going to call this fav dish view model. Now this fav dish view model needs a constructor that where we need to now pass the repository. So private val repository, which will be our fav dish repository. So you see in my case, it was already super fast and did it for me automatically. Now here we need to inherit from view model because well, this is a view model and the role of a view model is to provide data to the UI and survive configuration changes. A view model acts as a communication center between the repository and the UI. And you can also use a view model to share data between fragments, for example. The view model is part of the lifecycle library. And what's really the important part is that the view model will survive even if your activity in which you use the view model is changing or refreshing or reopening, so to speak. So let's say you have your activity and then the user twists the phone or turns the phone, then the activity will be recreated because now it's in a different format, right? And what you don't want to happen is that all of the data that you have prepared there is gone. And that's why the view model is taking care of maintaining all of this data. And yeah, if the user turns around the phone, well, the data will not be gone. That's basically the idea here. Okay, so the next thing that we need to uh, prepare here inside of our view model is the coroutine. So we're going to create a insert dish fav dish. So we need to pass the fav dish. So we need to import fav dish here equals view model scope dot launch. Okay. So here, what we want to do is we want to use the repository, this one here that was passed to the view model once it was created. So we need to pass a repository and we then can use that repository to call its method insert fav dish data with the dish that is passed to the insert function. So you see this view model 
will be called and this insert method will be called, which then internally will call this insert five dish data in a coroutine, so in the background thread, so to speak. And then this will call, this insert five dish data will then call the insert five dish details inside of our DAO. And this will then insert the five dish to our database using the model that we prepared in our entity, this five dish. What we will need to add here is another class. And that class will be our fav dish view model factory. So we need to add that factory and that factory will get a parameter, the dependencies needed to create the fav dish model. So in our case, the fav dish repository. By using view models and view model provider .factory, the framework will take care of the lifecycle of the view model. So it will survive configuration changes and even if the activity is recreated, you'll still get the right instance of the Fafdish model class. So that's really the idea of using the view model concepts here. So we're going to create a new class here to which we also need to pass the repository, which will be our Fafdish repository. And we're inheriting from view model provider dot factory. So the factory is an interface inside of the view model provider. Now you will need to accordingly implement its members. So let's do that real quick. And it's just this create member. So what is it that we want to do in this create function? Well, what we want to check is if the model class, which is this model class that is passed to this method once the factory is created, if that is assignable from our Fafdish view model. So our class Java here. Now this should then return a Fafdish view model with the repository that we get from the factory. And here we're going to use as T. And T is this view model optional as you can see here. Okay, and then because this can go wrong, we are going to throw an illegal arguments exception. So illegal argument exception here, and we're going to just call this unknown view model class, if that should happen. Now, by the way, if you should get any remarks here, or any errors or warnings, you can suppress the unchecked cast here. Okay, so in your case, you might get a warning or something like that. So you can add this in order to get the warning for unchecked cast away. And then a little word of warning. So here, what you can also find as a detail is that you shouldn't keep a reference to a context that has a shorter life cycle than our view model. So for example, an activity has a shorter life cycle than a view model. The same goes for a fragment and a view inside of an activity or in general views, okay? Keeping a reference can use a memory leak, e.g. the new model has a reference to a destroyed activity. All these objects can be destroyed by the operating system and recreated when there's a configuration change. And this can happen many times during the life cycle of your new model. And this would then lead to a crash in your application or a lag or something like that. You don't want that. So definitely avoid that when working with view models. And view models don't survive the apps process being killed in the background. So when the OS needs more resources, then it will basically kill your application and your view model will die. So the view model has a longer life cycle than an activity or a fragment or a view, but it doesn't have an, a limitless life cycle. Okay, so at one point it will be gone and that's when the OS kills your application. So when on destroy is called. So if you want to still save your data, you can use the safe state module for your view. So you can check this out if you ever have this situation. We're not gonna have this situation in our case, but you can call this method on safe instance state if you want to back up any kind of data that the user has entered, okay? For example, or whatever state you have at the point. Okay, so this is how you can then basically do it. I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but you can definitely check out 
the documentation for this particular safe state module for view models. All right, so now let's get back to our project because we're still not done with this view model setup. So we need to go to our favorite dish room database. So to this one here, and here we need to set up our DAO, okay? As we have not done that, abstract fun fav dish DAO will be of type fav dish DAO. So now we are using our interface here. Because if you look at the components here in the architecture, our room database needs to have the DAO. Okay, so you created the DAO, that's what we did, right? In our case, we only have the insert function, but later on we will add query functions as well, where we delete everything or where we get the data in a certain format and so forth. But then once you add the room database, you also need to add this abstract function word DAO, which is the abstract getter method for each DAO. So for every single DAO, you would set it up inside of your room database. Okay, in our case, we only have one DAO, which is our favorite dish DAO, but let's say you have multiple different DAOs that you want to use, then you would go ahead and have to set them up here as well. And now that that is set up, we need to create another file, which is going to be our favdish application file. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new folder inside of our favdish, so a new package. I'm going to call this one application. Okay, and there we're going to create a new Kotlin class, which I will call favdish application. Now this should inherit from the application class, okay? The idea behind this application class is so that we can define the variable scope to use throughout the application, okay? So, for example, here we can set up our database, here we can set up our repository, all of the good stuff, okay? So here I'm going to use private val database, and here we will use something called by lazy, okay? So the idea behind this is that we don't want the database to be loaded straight away when the application is started, but only once it's needed. So the database and repository are only created when they're needed rather than directly when it's be while the application starts, right? So the lazy keyword used for is used for creating a new instance that uses the specified initialization function and the default thread safety mode, which is called lazy thread safety mode synchronized, which is this one here. Okay, so that's the idea behind this lazy keyword. And what we want to do here is we want to set our room database with get database. And there we then pass this, which is our favdish application. So if we want to specifically state that not here, we can do that as well. And then we need to set up the repository so repository, so that we can use it throughout our application as well. This one also should be loaded lazily, which will then be our favorite dish repository to which we needed to pass the database dot dish DAO. Okay, so we are going to pass the DAO to our repository and you can see we're going to set up the database before we can then actually use it here. All right, and then I would like you to note something here is that the return instance uses itself to synchronize on and don't synchronize from external code on the returned instance as it may cause accidental deadlock. But we're not gonna do that in our project. It's just a little side note for you in case you ever want to extend your application significantly. Okay, so then there is one last step to do in this video, which still unfortunately doesn't get us to the point where we can then directly see something in our application. But as I said, it's a lot of setup. We need to get through it and we're almost there. Okay, so here, what I need to change is the name of the application, which will be application favdish application. And other than that, we don't need to do anything here. But as you can see now, our 
application will be linked to the application class that we just created to this favdish application. And we can now go ahead and use our database throughout our application, which is really the idea of this file here. Okay, so that's it for this video. See you in the next. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to connect with the data. So we need to set up our view model inside of our add update dish activity. So let's go over to our project and create a new entry right here. So I'm going to call or create a private val m fav dish view model, which will be a fav dish view model by view models. And here in the brackets, we need to go ahead and use our fav dish view model factory. Here we need to pass the application as a fav dish application and use dot repository here. Okay, so we are passing the repository from our application to the model factory which then basically creates our view model object here. Here you need to import view models for this to work. Then the next step will be to go ahead to our constants Kotlin file. And here I would like to have a couple of new constant values. So const val, and I'm gonna call this one dish image source local, which will be a string and that will just contain the entry local and then const val dish image source will be online. And in that case, the string will just say online. So the idea is that we can have multiple different sources where we get our image from, and it could be a local, which means from the device itself or online, it comes from online basically. Of course, you could have done this with a Boolean here saying bool true is for example, local and bool false is online. Let's say you have potentially more sources in the future then you could define them here as well. And you could easily adjust your code accordingly. Okay, so then the next step would be to go back to our add update dish activity, because now our view model is ready. And what we need to do is we need to set it up or create the entry at the point where we had this else case. Okay, so here, all entries are valid at that point. Inside of our on click method, we had all of these options. So when edit texts were clicked, but then when the button is clicked, and the else case was the case, basically at the point when everything was entered, the user has entered the type, the dish name and so forth. At that point, we can go ahead and pass our fav dish details or store it. Okay, details. And that will be of type fav dish. And now if we create a fav dish object, we will need to pass a lot of properties as you can see here. So we need to pass the image, which will be our image path. We need to pass the image source and I'm going to use constants and here for now it will be local, then the title, the type, the category, the ingredients, the cooking time in minutes, as well as the cooking directions. And here I need to make sure that I have a comma here, cooking directions, as well as the favorite dish setting. Okay, so is it a favorite dish or not? And I'm going to set that to false because at the beginning, everything should not be a favorite dish. Only once it is marked as favorite at that point, it should be then a favorite dish. Okay, so that by itself is just to set up the fav dish object, which contains all of those values, right? This type and the category and where do we get them from? Well, we get all of those. Once we click on the button, that's where we got them, right? So we get it from the edit text title, we get it from the edit text type and so forth. Okay, so we trim it, we trim the empty spaces at the beginning and the end, and then we store them in those values or variables. And we at that point can then pass them over here in our fav dish. And now we can use this fav dish in order to insert it. 
and insert it into our da database using the MFAV dish view model because the view model can now call this insert method to which we then can pass our fav dish details. Okay, so if you look at it, it's this insert method that we have inside of our fav dish view model class. And this function, as you see, it needed a dish, which was of type fav dish, and it would then use the repository in order to insert fav dish data which then is the suspend function, which is our coroutine function, which happens in the background, so to speak. And internally, it tries to use our DAO, which then uses this insert fav dish details, okay, which in the end will store the data to our SQL database. Okay, so now let's go back here. I would like to still enter a toast or write a little toast as well as have a log entry. So the toast should say something like you successfully added your favorite dish details and then a log entry. Well, insertion success is what we can write here with an E arrow so that we can see it very quickly. And then the finish statement. Now you could of course use I as an information here if you want it, either way is fine. And we finish, meaning we close the current activity, which is our add update dish activity. Okay, so if we run this, unfortunately, we will not see it in our application yet. So even though we might store the data now, we won't see it in our main activities fragments yet. And that is something that we will set up in the next video where we will look at observers because our UI will observe the data. Okay, and as it seems, I have an error somewhere. And that is a stupid letter that I accidentally entered there. Okay, so let's go over here. We go to our add dish screen. And here we can select an image. I'm just going to use my good old Homer once again. The title will be Homer Pi. And the type will be a snack, category, bakery, tasty, is the ingredients, tasty Homer maybe. And then let's go on and at the cooking time, let's say it takes an hour, directions to cook, throw in Homer. And click add dish. You successfully added your favorite dish details. All right, that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to look at observers. So see you there. Well, welcome back. In the last video, we inserted some data to our SQL database, and now it's time to retrieve that data. And what we're going to use is an observer. And in order to use an observer, we need to go to our favdish DAO. And here I'm going to create a new function that will allow me to get all dishes. Because this function here is there to insert a dish, but now let's get all the dishes. And in order to get all the dishes, we are going to use a query. And hereby, it's important that you have a basic understanding of SQL. Okay, so I'm going to add this query here. And the query is select star from five dish dishes table ordered by ID. So what that will do is it will select all elements that are inside of the table called favorite dishes table, and it will order it by its ID. And in our case, the ID is basically just going to be the order in which it was created. Okay, the dish was added to our table. And I'm going to call this function get all dishes list. And it will be of type flow list fav dish, or that's what it will return basically. So here we're going to use flow. Now the idea is that when data changes, you usually want to take some action such as displaying the updated data in the UI. And this means you have to observe the data. So when it changes, you can react. And now to observe data changes, we will use flow from the Kotlin X coroutines. So this is from Kotlin X coroutines. So if you want to use this flow type, then you need to define that keyword here in the return value of the method description and room generates all necessary code to update the flow when the data is updated. Okay, so that's the power of using flow. A flow is an async sequence of values. So flow produces values 
one at a time instead of all at once. And that can generate values from async operations like network requests, database calls, or other async code. And it supports coroutines throughout its API. So you can transform a flow using coroutines as well. Okay, so now let's use this in action. And therefore I'm going to go to my repository, fabdish repository. And here we also need to set up a new entry, which will be all dishes list. Now this is of type flow and it, it's a list of our fav dish. Now you need to import flow for this to work. So hover over flow. And here we're going to use Kotlin X coroutines flow. Okay, and this will be set directly as fav dishes DAO dot get all dishes list. Okay, so it will call this query that we have prepared here. So you can already see here at our insert, we didn't even have to define a query. It knew directly what to do because it knew that it needed to insert favdish or our favdish object type, which contains all of these values. And we even defined in which entity we wanted to store it. So in which table we wanted to store that data. So that it basically knows insert favdish into table. Okay, so we didn't need to define that ourselves. And for the query where we want to get all of the data, well, that's where we need to use SQL. But now we can just go ahead and use this function, get all dishes list in order to get all of the dishes. Okay, so all dishes list will call this fav dish method, get all dishes list. Now we can use this variable inside of our model. Okay, so inside of our Fav dish view model. So here I'm going to use life data. Okay, so life data is a very powerful tool as well. It comes with view model, so it's very useful in combination with view models. So here, as you see, we are creating a new value, a new variable of type life data, which internally uses a list of fav dish. And it will call repository all dishes list as live data, even though this is not a method, but it will use it as live data. So using live data and caching with all dishes returns has several benefits. We can put an observer on the data instead of calling for changes and only update the UI when the data actually changes. The powerful part here is that repository is completely separated from the UI through the view model. So this makes our application in general way more efficient. And that's really the idea of using this whole concept, right? It's on one hand, of course, that you have a clean way of building an architecture around it and it's easy to adjust in the future if you need to make updates to your project. And at the same time, it makes your application in general significantly more efficient. Okay, now inside of our all dishes fragment, that's the point where we want to display this thing, right? So all dishes fragment, this was the fragment that is displayed here, this home fragment. That's the point where I now want to display the data, of course. But before we display the data, we are going to first of all, just show it in our log cat. Okay, so the whole UI setup is what we're going to do later. So here we need to set up our view model so that we can use it inside of our all dish fragment. Okay, so I'm going to create a private val mfav dish view model. That's this one here, which will be of type fav dish view model. So that's a view model that we created. I'm going to use the by keyword using view models here once again, as we've done in the last video. And here I'm not going to define what kind of view models it will be, but I will use my view models factory, fav dish model factory here. So this view model factory needs to have a repository. And where do we get that repository from? Well, we need to use require activity dot application as fav dish application. And then we can use the repository from it. Okay, so this will be our favdish view model that we now can use in our application. 
So where I'm going to call it is going to be an on view created. Okay, so here I'm going to override this function on view created, which will be called once the view is fully created. And I'm just going to go ahead and use my view model. So here m fav dish view model to call all dishes list and observe it. So here we are adding an observer, which will observe the view lifecycle owner, or we need to pass the view lifecycle owner. So this is now an observer on our live data returned by the get all dishes list. And the unchanged method fires when the observer data changes and activity is in the foreground. So this basically means is if the data changes, the observer will be aware of that and it will make changes to the UI. So it will adjust the UI, so to speak. So as you see, we get a list of favorite dishes. So it will pass the dishes to us. Okay, and now we need to make sure that the dishes aren't empty. And if they aren't empty, then we're going to run a for loop item in IT, which will be our log entry. So I'm just going to, for now, use the log entry for my dish title. So what is this IT and what is this item? Well, an item is part of the IT. What is IT? Well, you can see it here in gray. It says it's a list of favorite dishes. So now every single item inside of that list of in IT is going to be a favorite dish. So now what we can do is we can log it. For example, I'm going to call this dish title and I'm going to use the item dot ID and the item title to basically display whatever we have entered. Okay, so for now, we're not going to display it in the UI itself, but we're just going to use the logcat for it. And at this point, we can run our application and see what's going to happen. So you can see here, the observer is going to take care of everything for us at this point. And now let's go ahead and actually, we have created an entry already. We don't need to create a new entry. Let's go over to our logcat and search for dish here and move to dashboard and back home because we needed to trigger this event where this on view created is called and you can see here it is in fact called for us okay so here it says dish title is one homer pie okay that was the one that we created in the last video and one is going to be the ID. So we have one entry so far inside of our dishes. Now let's try it again. Let's create a new entry. And let's use Homer once again. This one will be new meal. Okay, and the type, well, let's select something. Dinner, chicken, one, two, three as the ingredients, cooking time, something, and cooking directions will also be one to three. It doesn't really matter. What's interesting for us is that now we see we have Homer pie as well as new meal. Okay, so our entries are there. They're in the database and our home fragment is aware of it. And now we just need to adjust the home fragment so that it displays the meals. All right, so that's the idea of it. And that's what we're going to set up in the next video. So coming back to this image here, you can see we're using the view model, which contains the live data, and the UI is notified of changes using observation. So now our UI controller is in fact observing. And where is it observing? Well, it's observing right here where we added the observer. So in on view created, we are observing and we're just saying, okay, if there are any changes, please let me know. And well, in our case, just use this for loop for now. Okay. So basically that is the whole flow that we have now. So now we just need to take care of the UI controller to actually display the data and well forward on UI events.
Okay, so now we have this complete flow integrated. We have the room database with the DAO as well as the entity. We are using the repository, which is communicated with via the view model, and then it communicates to the DAO slash the room database. Okay, so that's how everything is connected and that's how we have built up the architecture. So now we can actually work with it and very easily make changes to our application. Okay, so let's go ahead and take care of the UI. See you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to take care of the UI to display the entries that we have made in our database. Well, you can see here, this is one of the entries. And now if I go ahead and create a new entry, selecting a photo, let's create a little one. So we're not going to eat food or dogs today, but just going to go over to the kitchen and just use an image here. So I'm going to call this oven. This will be my new dish and it will be other <laughs> category will also be other pasty will be the ingredients. And now we can go over to cooking time directions to cook easy peasy. Okay, and let's add that dish and you can see the UI is directly updated. We have the oven here. So that's basically the result of this video. So the first thing that we need to do is to set up our fragment all dishes because as of now, it only has this text view and that's not very helpful, right? So let's change that. And I'm just going to paste the code in here so that you can understand what's going on. I'm gonna talk over it real quick once I have it in here, okay? So what we need is a recycler view, and I'm gonna call this one RV dishes list. It will have a width of zero density pixel as well as a height of zero density pixel, and the visibility will be set to visible. Now it will take, however, the constraints to all directions of the parent. So basically it will take the complete space available inside of the parent. And then we have this text view as well, which has the ID TV, no dishes added yet, which will have also width and height of zero density pixel gravity center. The text size will be 16 SDP, it will be bold. Visibility will be set to gone, however. And as you can see here as well, it takes up the whole available space, so to speak. So the constraints are towards all the directions, top, bottom, left and right. And now, we are going to require a new string here, which will be a new label, basically saying label no dishes added yet. So let's create this real quick here. Go over to our strings, XML, and I'm going to create a new entry. Okay, and this entry will be following one label no dishes added yet, and it will say no dishes added yet with a bunch of exclamation marks, really exaggerating and bringing home that point. Okay, at that point, the error will disappear. And now we can go ahead and design every single individual item that we want to display inside of this recycler view. Because as of now, you can see it will look like a bunch of small items here. But what we want is instead to display this part here, you can see this is how I want to make an item look like so it has an image as well as a title okay just displays the title here okay let's go ahead and create a new layout for that and i'm going to call this one item underscore dish underscore layout and it can stay under constraint constraint layout for now even though we're going to override it anyways okay so what I'm going to use here is something called card view. Okay, so there is this Android X card view that allows us to create card views very easily. Okay, so this card view needs to have a couple of properties here. So a bunch of namespaces as well as a width and a height. Okay, so I'm just going to set them up here and talk over them as well. So what's going on here? I'm creating a new card view and you will see what a card view looks like. Well, basically, you know that this is basically a card view, right? It has a little bit of a shadow surrounding it. So it really pops up outside of the screen or it pops 
towards the user, which is a good look, I think. Okay, so what you see here is we're using the width of match parent, the height of wrap content, okay? So, so it should take the width of the parent and it should only wrap the content in terms of the height, as well as we have five pixels of corner radius, which basically means we have rounded card views, okay? So rounded corners here. This is five density pixels. That's what you get there, a very small rounded corner. And then card elevation, this is set to five density pixels as well, or SDP. And this is basically what creates this little shadow. So the higher this value is, the bigger the shadow will be, or the more it will look like it's coming out, popping out of the background, so to speak. And then card use compat padding is set to true. So it will use a padding that will be compatible for older Android devices, so to speak. So that's how you can make sure of that. Now, what is it that I want to have in there? Well, I'm going to put everything into a linear layout. Okay, it will make it easier for me, a vertical linear layout, and that will then contain my image as well as the title. Okay, so match parent in terms of width, wrap content in terms of height, so the same story here. Now, as I said, I want to have an image at the top, which I'm going to call IV dish image, or that will be the ID, match parent in terms of width, and the height will be 120 density pixels, so to speak. I want to have a little bit of margin. I'm gonna set that to one. And then I'm going to use this content description of image, which just says that this is going to be an image. Now you can be more precise here saying, okay, this is an image of a dish or whatever, but for now, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Now the scale type is going to be set to fit X, Y. You can use different types here. You can see fit center, fit star, and so forth. I'm gonna keep it at fit X, Y. And the tools source, so basically for our application, you can see it's just going to use this image here. Okay, so it will be our IC launcher default image as the image that we see in the designer, but this will not be visible inside of the actual application itself because it's just for tools, which means just for us as a developer visible. And underneath it, I would like to have the text view. And this text view is going to be our text view dish title, at least as the ID name, match parent, wrap content, then the margin will be 10 density pixels. It will center itself vertically. We are going to use gray for the color, hex size will be 16 and it will be bold. And now for the tools, it will say dish title, which is this text that you can see here. Okay, so that's the first setup. And now every time you create a recycler view, you of course need to also have an adapter. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new adapter here. This will be a Kotlin class, which I'm going to call Fev Dish Adapter. Now, this adapter will need a couple of details. Okay, so first of all, we need to define the fragment in which this adapter will be. So this will be of type fragment. And we need to import fragment here. Alt Enter will do the trick. And here I'm going to use Android X fragment. Okay, so then I need to also define that this will be inheriting from our recycler view. So recycler view, adapter, and here we need to pass the fevdish adapter dot view holder. Now, what is this view holder? Well, we're going to create our own view holder as we usually do. So I'm going to create a new class here, which I'm going to call view holder. And as a view, it will use item dish layout binding. So what is this item dish layout binding? It is the binding for our item dish layout. So for this one here. Okay, so for this to work, you also need to import it, of course. And here we define the individual items that are inside of that view. So that's what this view holder is going to do. It's going to hold our views, which is our IV dish image, this one here, as well as our IV dish title, which is this one here. Okay, so every single view inside of that adapter will have those two elements. And that's where we take care of that. 
Okay, so the next thing is going to be that we make sure that we have our dishes. Okay, so I'm going to create a new variable here called dishes, which will be a list of favorite dishes. And it will be for now an empty list of. Okay, we need to import fave dish for this to work. And now let's take care of this problem here. It says we need to implement adapters. Well, that's because we're inheriting from recycler view. So let's implement those three there. Okay, so now we have our view holder and we have our three implemented methods. Let's start with the easiest one, get item count. Well, it's going to be our dishes dot size. So that's what should be returned here from our get item count. So it will return this dishes list here. Now at this point, it will be an empty list, right? So this dishes list. And usually what we have done with the adapter was to pass the list directly to the adapter when we created an object of it. This time we're going to do it differently because we're using the observer, which will then notify the UI about changes. So we're going to use a slightly different approach this time. Therefore, I'm going to also create a new method here, which I'm going to call dishes list, which will need a list of favorite dishes. Then it will set the dishes here that we have, and it will notify data set changed. What that will do is it will basically notify any registered observers that the data set has changed, which is exactly what we need. So whenever we change data, we need to let our observers know that data has changed and they will then adjust accordingly. In this case, our UI will update accordingly. Okay, now let's take care of the on bind view holder. What is it that we want to do here? Well, we want to create a dish, which is going to be based on our dishes position. So whatever position that we are currently looking at for the view holder here. And I'm going to use glide in order to load the dish image. Okay, into our holder dot IV dish image. Okay, because our holder is this view holder here, which has this IV dish image. Okay, so we're going to assign the image to it. And then we also need to assign the text. So I'm going to assign the dishes title to the text view title, which is this text view here, which is in turn going to be our title, this one here. Okay. So now that we have the on bind view holder, let's also take care of this on create view holder. So I will need to set up view binding which will be our item dish layout binding, which will then need to inflate the layout inflator from fragment.context. And here we need to pass the parent as well as the attached to root set to false, for example. And then we recur can return the view holder with our binding that we have set up. Okay, I had one bracket too many. Okay, and that should then return the view holder and that will not be inside of this bracket here, but it will be here. All right, so that should be it for our view dish adapter. Now we need to take care of our all dishes fragment, which is the UI part. So first of all, in on create view, let's get rid of all of that because we're not going to use any of it. We are going to use our view binding, which will need to be set up. So let's make sure we set it up. So here, instead of our home view model, which we had set up earlier for basically set up, but now we won't need it we will need our late init var, which will be my M binding of type fragment all dishes binding. Okay, so our fragment has a binding, a view binding. Now we can use that view binding here and set it up and it will be set up in on create view. It will use our fragment all dishes binding inflate in order to First of all, use the inflator and then use the 
container view group and attach to parents is going to be set false. So that's how you generally set up the binding inside of a fragment. Okay, so you use the inflator, you pass the container, which is this container here, right? So from on create view, and then you can attach the parent, but we're going to set that to false. And then we can return mbinding.root. Okay, so this will be returned as the view of our fragment. And now once the view is fully created, as you see so far, what we did is we only used this observer in order to display the data in a log. But now what we want to do is instead we want to display it directly in the UI. Therefore, we need to use our binding RV dishes list, so our recycler view, to set its layout manager to be this time a grid layout manager. So we're not going to use a linear layout manager, but a grid layout manager. We need to pass the activity, which is require activity, and then we can define how many columns we want to have. So the span count, and I'm going to set that to two. So now I'm going to have two columns in my grid layout. And then I can set up the adapter as well. So fav dish adapter will be of type fav dish adapter. And we need to pass the context. So I'm going to use this at all dishes fragment. And it wasn't the context, but actually it was a fragment that we needed to pass. And of course, this should be an equal sign. Okay, so we're passing the fragment to our adapter so that it knows where it needs to be displayed. And now we can use binding again and binding to set up our adapter to be that fav dish adapter that we just prepared. Okay, so that's always the way how you can use adapters inside of fragments. You set up the layout manager that you want to use. You set up the adapter and then you pass the adapter to the adapter property of that recycler view. And now we're going to, inside of this method here, inside of our dishes let here, we're going to go ahead and display all of the elements into our recycler view here. Therefore, we're going to call this method that we just prepared in our fav dish adapter, which was dishes list. So this will notify the data set changed. We need to pass the list of dishes to it. So let's go ahead and take care of that. Therefore, I'm going to first of all check, is the list empty? So if it is not empty, well, in this case, I'm first of all going to take care of what should happen if it's not empty, and then what should happen if it's empty. So what is it that we want to happen if it's empty? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that my recycler view dishes list is set to visible. So visibility is set to view dot visible. And the text view, so I'm binding again, dot TV, no dishes added yet, visibility is set to view dot gone. So it will be not visible, so to speak. And of course, I need to call fav dish adapter dot dishes list and pass it to it. So what is it? Well, it is the list of favorite dishes that we get from our observer, which basically gets the data from the database and is called once there are changes and is notified about it once there are changes. And now in the case that we don't have any data to display, we will do it the other way around. So we're gonna make the recycler view invisible and we're gonna make the text view visible. So it's going to be this text view here inside of our fragment all dishes, which we can't see. It's underneath there. And it just says, well, whatever we defined this label here saying no dishes added yet. Okay, so if we have nothing to show, it will display this text view. If we have something to show, it will display the uh, list of elements. Okay, so at this point we can run the application. It was a little longer. A pretty long video. Let's see if we can in fact see the Homer pie, I believe we created. And it should display straight away. 
because it's in the database we see homer pie as well as new meal both are here and we have them both inside of our list here and in case you were wondering why we have this huge padding up here well that's because inside of our activity main xml by default we had this padding top which was there for the action bar but because we handled the action bar our own way with our styling and everything we don't need that here okay so let's get rid of that and let's rerun our application and then we will see that this huge padding will be gone and it will look a lot better so let's rerun it there we are no more padding and we have our two beautiful cards here view cards so you can see this is a view card with a little elevation and we have two columns with our Homer Simpson 120 pixel high. So that's basically the design of our application. All right, so let's go over to the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to mainly refactor our application a little bit because, well, if we look at our names here, for example, it says home, dashboard, notification, all of that is not correct. We want to have unique names so for example favorite dishes or all dishes here favorite dishes and then a like random dish or something like that that's what we want to set up eventually so therefore we need to get started by renaming a couple of things okay so now let's rename our dashboard fragment first of all so let's go over to the fragments and my dashboard fragment i'm going to refactor it so rename shift F6 will also do the trick to favorite dishes fragment. Favorite dishes fragment. Okay, that will be the new name of it. Then let's do the same thing with a notifications fragment. Okay, so let's refactor it. Shift F6 will do the trick as well. And I'm going to call this one random dish fragment. Now accordingly, we will have to change a little more and specifically in the layouts so here we have the fragment dashboard so let's go over here and rename it so i'm going to refactor it and gonna call it fragment favorite dishes and then the same goes for the fragment notifications it should be fragment random dish and now let's go over to our mobile navigation so here mobile navigation xml file and i'm going to change the name here as well so here instead of navigation home i'm going to call this one so shift f6 and rename this to navigation underscore all underscore dishes then scrolling further down the navigation dashboard it will be called navigation favorite dishes and then finally the navigation one so let's rename that as well to navigation random dish let's also update the titles a little bit so let's go over to our strings xml file and here let's change the titles up so instead of using home dashboard notification i'm going to use title all dishes title favorite dishes and title random dish and then we are going to need a couple of new vectors and you can download them from the project itself or you can use any vector that you want and in my case i'm just going to use the ones that we prepared here so one of them will be i see all dishes then the other one will be i see favorite dish and finally the i see random dish Okay, so we have those three. I'm going to paste them in here. And you can see we have this I see all dishes. This is this one. 
Then the IC favorite dish, which is this one, the heart with the little dish icon in there. And then the random dish, which is going to be this icon here. And now let's make sure that we actually use those icons. So let's go over to bottom nav menu, XML. And you can see here that the titles don't fit anymore as well as the icons. Well, the icons are still there, but I'm going to change that to this one. I see all dishes and the title was all dishes. So title all dishes. This here was favorite or title favorite dishes. And the image that I'm going to use is I see favorite dish. And then for this one, I see random dish and the title will be the random dish title or title underscore random dish. So now let's run this application and see if it's still working or if it crashed entirely. Well, as it seems, I have an error still. So here I'm accessing a label home dashboard and notification. That's great. Let's change those as well. That's in the mobile navigation XML. And here this one will be all dishes. Then this one will be favorite dishes as well as that one here will be random dish. Okay, let's run it again and see if it's going to work or if we get another error. Sometimes it just helps to run into an error to make this quicker because otherwise I would have to look through the whole application and see if it's all right. So at least the splash screen still works. All right, there we are. So all dishes, favorite and random dish. Okay, so as it seems our application is still working, but now we refactored it and it is ready for the next steps as you can see here. Thanks a lot for watching this video all the way to the end. You've been around for quite a while. It's seven and a half hours into the course already. And while the YouTube video is over at this point, it's done, the course, you have really worked yourself through a big course, really a lot of stuff going on there. And you learned a lot, hopefully along the way. And as you see, the sun is shining. I'm super happy about that. That's why I didn't even close the curtains because that's such a rare occasion in February here in Germany near Cologne. So thanks a lot for watching the video. You made it really far. And now the next natural step would be to get the full course and you can find the link in the description down below. But if you don't have the money for it, no worries, man. There will be a bunch more YouTube videos coming and you are going to learn a lot more about not just Jetpack, but Android app development in general and of course other topics. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now is a good time to do so. And again, thank you very much. And yeah, see you in the next video.